Um, Lei Le Wolf, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, good morning. Um, excuse me. I thought there was there is something there. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, um, and welcome to the GCSP and the first joint conference, Crisis 2030, between the Institute of Strategic Risk Management and the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I think we are all looking forward to a day that will not only have um, value, but my own feeling is having looked at the list of participants and the speakers will actually have significance. Um, just to get some uh, housekeeping out of the way, there are no expected incidents happening today. If there are any alarms going off, please do follow the people there. Is that correct, Ambassador? Good. Um, I just want to make sure, always check with the boss, uh, usually before you make the announcement. Um, so we're here today. Um, I think that if we look at crisis 2030, um, we have had an internal, we've had a, uh, we had the ISRM had our first Global Advisory Council Council meeting here yesterday. Um, we are a very young institute, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But one of the things that came up was when we launched this manifesto just under a year ago, crisis 2030 was a, a title that seemed to grab the imagination across the world. We got a lot of interest, and a lot of response, a lot of engagement, um, and it seemed to have value and significance to people. And, and we, we really felt we'd, we'd hit on something. And now we realize that in the last 12 months, crisis 2030 is no longer applicable. It's now. It is not what's going to be happening over the ten year, last, next 10 years. But if we look at the dialogue and the conversation and the language that is being used and the cognizance and the engagement across the world, it is today. It is now. And the challenges that many of us here in the room have been talking about for the last 20, 30 years are no longer challenges of the future or potential. They are actual that are impacting on every aspect of our lives. Um, I know that um, within the GCSP, they see themselves not only as thought leaders, but as action leaders. And I think that if we are to take action, um, then it is a community of people like ourselves that have to take some responsibility for that. Whatever we do, and if we do nothing, those incidents will, will continue. That the, the crises are not dependent on, on, on our responses. The world is moving towards crisis state. And the truth of the matter is that if we look at those crisis events, they are no longer isolated events or anomalous events or incidents that are unexpected. It is the new normal. It is, to use a German word I've discovered, Precariat. It is a life lived in a precarious state. And I think that is a new normal that the world is moving towards. Um, we have four themes that we have today that were chosen. Um, the first is on urbanization. It seems natural when you look at it that both the level of impact, how do we model impact, and the level of response is at the city level. It's not at the national level. It seems to be at the city level. That's where it's happening at. Of course, there is... The, huge massive impacts in non-urban environments. I just was in Australia two weeks ago launching the Australian chapter of the ISRM and of course they have gone through a massive draw, a drought. They go through massive um, fires which is affecting Sydney. We were in Sydney and there was no doubt I had asthma in Sydney because of the smoke in the air. But it is true that cities are um, is where the action is going to be taking place. Cities uh, on figures they give out use 70% of the global energy, they produce 85% of global emissions. Um, it is where people move to when they're in trouble. So it seems to me that if we are going to engage with these issues, it's at the city level. We then look at IT, IT and AI, artificial intelligence. We are super connected and super dependent. One of the world words that are being used um, for the last 10 years, 15 years, is resilience. Um, and we look at resilient cities, we look at resilient societies. I think that most of us are aware that actually our societies and our systems and our infrastructures are actually becoming more fragile. They, they break easy, they break big, and they're not recoverable. And the level of dependency we have on systems that are completely and utterly outside of our control, within complex ecosystems that almost nobody understands, if anybody understands, I think is a, an issue that we'll be having to deal with as well. The third theme is on standards. Um, there have been standards being developed for 30, 35, 40 years. And the truth of the matter is, it seems, looking at the world outside, they've had zero, little to zero impact. 
And I think that if we are to uh, move forward, we need to have a framework, which is an accepted framework, which is based around standards of some sort. Somebody mentioned it in our conference yesterday, that the problems is standards as they try to model the past rather than plan for the future. And I think if we are to develop standards that are accepted across the world and across our communities, which can create a framework and a structure and a foundation for a dialogue, then we have to think about a standards. As there's a standard that takes five to seven years to develop. Is that what we're looking for in the current world? And then the final part is leadership. It's leadership um, at every level. Um, President Obama um, had a phrase, cut out the stupid stuff. Cut out the stupid The first thing is cut out the stupid stuff. Um, and I think the first responsibility of leadership is do not be stupid. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, although that is a, 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 an aspirational, uh, aspirational title, um, I think we're looking at the reality, you know, do not, derp, do not burn down the Amazon. You know, do not put oil companies in charge of the Arctic. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is that there seems to be a stupidification of the world. It's becoming more and more stupid. The truth of the matter is that um, if you look over the last 20 years, um, one of, the, one of the trends through our society has been disruption. We've had disruptive economies, disruptive business, disruptive communications, disruptive whole society. It seems to me that we're moving into a stage where disruption is going to become the founding central theme. And I think that's true for governance as well. I think that we're looking to a stage where maybe the traditional state government that we've come to think of as the normal state over the last 250 years may not be working anymore. It may not be working. It may be breaking down. Um, the truth of the matter is that we are going through a disruptive state. The world is disruptive and our responses have to be broken. They have to be disruptive as well. The traditional frameworks, even the methodologies, even the metaphors, even the language. I think the language and the metaphor of risk management and crisis management, let's say from 1975 to 2005, does not work today. And therefore, as a community, we're going to have to find a way of actually describing what the hell does the world look like in 2020 to 2030, and what do the crises look like, and what do those impacts look like, and what do our responses look like. The responses will be disruptive, um, and they will be social, they will be economic, they will be cultural, but above all, they will be political. And what do I mean by political? They'll be political in the sense that the desire to get stuff done. That's politics, to get stuff done. And yet there is hope. There is hope. Um, and I have, I've become almost obsessed by Move 37 Game 2, um, which was the um, AlphaGo Go match um, bet between the computer and Lee Sedol. In 1996, uh, Gary Kasparov um, played um, a computer and beat it. No, in 1995, Gary Kasparov played a computer at chess and beat it. 1996, the computer beat Gary Kasparov, three and a half to two and a half. Um, and it was seen as, as, as a sign that computer and artificial intelligence had gone beyond humanity's capabilities it beat it at chess. Well, how they did that was they taught the computer to play chess, and it beat a chess master three and a half, two and a half, by a very fine margin. 2015, 2015, 16, um, AlphaGo, a computer, beat Lee Sedol for one in Go. And what they said was that Go was so complex it would be impossible to teach a computer to do it. It's just conceptually, there was too much going on. A computer could not do it. So what they did was they did not teach a computer to play Go. They, caught, they taught a computer to learn. They gave it a learning algorithm. And they gave it millions of, 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 of games to go through. And it learned from zero, from zero. And then it came up, and it beat Lisa Dole, nine-time world champion, 4-1. And on move 37, Game two, and I'm sure you know, so it's 19 times 19, incredibly complex thing. On move 37, game two, AlphaGo made a mistake. It did something that had absolutely no meaning within the concept of Go. And actually, the people in the headquarters actually looked at each other and said, oh, my God, something's gone wrong. 78 moves later, that was the move that became the critical pinpoint for victory. Lee Sidol said, Go has moved to a stage beyond where we can comprehend. Two years later, AlphaGo Zero beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero. The truth of the matter is, within three or four years, we'd moved from a stage where artificial intelligence would never be able to manage complexity to play Go 
to where he had gone beyond human comprehension of what Go could possibly be. What brings me hope is that the solutions that will provide the foundation for our future development within the context of the complex risk we are facing do not yet exist. They will be created. But it is people like us which will create the framework and the foundation to allow that to have not just significant, but to have significance and impact on the societies we live in. It is an absolute pleasure and an honour and a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be part of what's been happening at GCSB. Um, and I hope that today um, will have meaning and significance and impact um, f moving forwards. Um, I would like to welcome Ambassador Doucet, and I'd like to, before that, give thanks. I was here at um, the GCSP for the Global uh, Cyber Challenge earlier in the year. And Ambassador Doucet stood here and said that one of the roles of the GCSP was to act as a, as a mentoring organization for young institutes. We are in a, the ISRM is a young institute. We punch above our weight, but we're in a young institute. We have gained massively from the support that the GCSP has been given us. Um, and I'd like to give my thanks here now and publicly to Ambassador Doucet. Um, he's genuinely, the GCSP is making a contribution, not just through what they do, but through mentoring organizations like ourselves, and we are very grateful. Ambassador Doucet, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour. Welcome uh, to Geneva. Welcome for those of you who come from far away to this um, important center of global governance. This is behind me. This is all these international organizations and more than 700 NGOs dealing with all issues that we face uh, every day. It's a great privilege for us to partner with ISRM, a newly formed global uh, uh, networking and also um, uh, body organization that br will bring guidance on risk and, and crisis management and we look forward to this uh, collaboration with you. GCSP is an organization that was created uh, just uh, one or few days after a very famous summit here in Geneva between President Reagan and Chairman Gorbachev of the OSSR more than 30 years ago. And the GCSP now is a center for executive education. We have more than 80 courses a year. It's also a platform for diplomatic facilitation. And thirdly, and this is new, an incubator for newly and innovative project that we sustain. Either we help them from the start or we help them accelerate in the activities. And our relationship with ISRM is in this field. So a lot of what we do here at GCSP is dealing also with crisis management, international crises, but also emergencies and concrete crises. And before coming here, I was the head of the crisis center of the Swiss Foreign Ministry. And I had two main challenges at the time. The first one was, how do you transform an ambassador into a crisis manager overnight? Imagine your, your country's ambassador in Tokyo and at 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 a.m., you have a major earthquake. And then a few companies, usually, they slow down their operation. They secure the asset. They look for the staff. But here, as an embassy, you have usually 20 people coming to the, uh, the chancery every, every day for passport, for visa, for immigration issues. But the community of Swiss citizens in Tokyo, for example, was 2,000 people. And so instead of having 20 people, as usually in front of the chancery, you have 2,000 people at 2 o'clock in the morning. They need information. They need uh, ideas or uh, tips how to uh, leave the city, how to evacuate the country. And this is where the ambassador will transform himself or herself into a crisis manager. And the big issue is, is and was for a long time, they were talking to me and saying, we cannot prepare for a crisis because we have so many issues to deal with. We have visitors, we have ministers coming, trade delegation, cultural project, staff on holidays. How do you want me to prepare for a crisis? But when the crisis hits, then you have to perform. And to perform at your best, the best of your teams. So this was the first challenge. How do we transform an ambassador into a crisis manager? The second was, when you deal with so many, uh, in the Swiss, we are the world champion in travels. We have a population of 8 million, but every year we have 16 million travels done by the Swiss abroad. And since our standard of living is high, cost of transportation is low, people tend to travel everywhere. 
And so we have Swiss traveling to places and sometimes they get abducted. And here at the crisis center, we got videos of the hostage taker saying, if you don't do this and this, something will happen to the hostages. And you receive the videos. And around the table, you have all the ministries. You have all the intelligence agencies, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and others. And as many of you know, inter-agency or inter-ministerial meetings and, and, and crisis team is already difficult because we have so many organizations. Each organization has its own DNA or, or, or a way of deciding, a way of organizing itself, of structuring, of analyzing problems. But this was not for me the most and the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge was how do, we trans how do you transform this team? We were all Swiss, we were all well educated, we were always being, we have been through many crises before. But the novelty of the crisis was putting to test the creativity of the team. And creativity is not something that you come here and you say, be creative now. Today, let's, go, let's be creative. Creativity is nurtured by curiosity, and curiosity is a muscle. If you don't train your curiosity, then you're not going to be creative. And curiosity is going to one field to the others. And this is why we've seen this. And part of this incubator we have created at GCSB, we have created a fellowship initiative where we want to have different generation of practitioners, different cultures, different nationalities, different disciplines. And when you make this creativity happen, in when a uh, journal from a uh, European country is sitting next to a postdoc doing research on molecular biology. And the military officer and his colleagues are there to uh, maybe define a strategy to deal with uh, groupings, becoming a caliphate, and then extending to Africa, extending to Sri Lanka, extending to Iraq and Afghanistan. How do you develop a strategy? How do you analyze a problem? And the postdoc sitting next to uh, the, the gentleman or the lady, the general, is doing research on molecular biology. You have a tumor, the tumor is going to go through a metastasis effect to different parts of the body. So you have two organizations, two issues, two problems that are going to develop and metastasis all over the world from one, from Daesh or ISIS, and you have the tumor on the other side. But both of these people will stay in their own silos through their studies, through the, their professional li life. And here they can be sitting together and offer coffee saying, okay, how do you analyze the problem in medicine? How do you analyze the problem in the military? How do you develop solution? How do you test option? Do you do war gaming? How is it war gaming is it? And how can you learn from one field to the other? This is what we foster because this is only way where we can have innovation. Innovation happens at boundaries of different fields and organizations. And this is why we are so happy to partner with ISRM because we bring a lot of people around the table who will be looking at different issues and how to be better prepare uh, uh, the organization to face uh, the new challenges. This is why it's a great pleasure to be with you today and I hope Every one of us will learn from this uh, event and more events and issues and more uh, 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 um, workshops that we'll do uh, uh, in the future. So let me thank Lord Harris, who is here, Tamis, and also Dr. David uh, Robbins, and all the team at GCSP dealing with crisis management, David Orobin, and also Clementine Gaspar. This is a topic at GCSP that gets a lot of attraction. We get a lot of organization coming because uh, uh, some of them really sense that investing in preparedness is the best return on investment when you are facing with the real issues. And sometimes it's the best team building the size when you're looking through a crisis and going through and having uh, 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 dealt with different issues uh, with your team. So thank you so much for uh, coming here this morning and I uh, have the great pleasure now of giving the floor to Lord Eris. Voilà. Thank you.
the first thing I should do is to thank uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, uh, not just for his uh, words in introducing today's conference, but also uh, for the hospitality which enables us to have uh, this meeting here today, and indeed to have the General Advis uh, Advisory, the Global Advisory Council meeting yesterday. So, Crisis 2030. The most overused ancient Chinese curse, certainly the only one that I know, is may you live in interesting times. And I'm not just talking here about British politics. <laughs> Earlier this year, the UK Ministry of Defence published a report that warned that, and I quote, the world is becoming ever more complex and volatile. The only certainty about the future is its inherent uncertainty. The complex interaction of these trends is potentially game-changing and demands a new approach that places strategic adaptability at its core. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. So what trends should we expect over the next 10, 20 years? Climate change, of course but also substantial changes in demography, further globalization coupled with greater global inequality, and taken and, uh, in, the, in the context of greater and intense competition for natural resources. And taken together, these changes create a series of pressure cooker-like political tensions whose outlet is likely to be terrorist violence and serious security concerns. And this is a problem for every country represented here in this room. No one expected the destruction of the Minoan Empire as a result of volcanic eruption in 1450 BC. Nor in the mid 1300s AD were there many people expecting the impact on European civilization of the Black Death. Likewise, there were not that many voices 20 years ago who were, being, who were being heard predicting the events of 11th of September 2001. Similarly, the speed of the banking crisis 11 years ago and the onset of a recession that left no country or sector unaffected was pre predicted far more with the benefit of hindsight than in advance. And most people in 2015 or even in the spring of 2016, would not have forecast in the UK the Brexit referendum result or the election in the US of Donald Trump as president. Now, it is, of course, a truism that generals always prepare to fight the last war rather than the one that's actually coming. Sir David Omand, who is the former UK security coordinator, recast it in a slightly different way. He said, what we prepare for, we deter. So what we actually experience by the way of events is, alas, what we have not prepared for. So in the spirit of deterrence, what can we expect and what should we prepare for? There is now overwhelming scientific consensus that the Earth's climate is warming. This will mean uh, future weather events that are more extreme than even today's. Floods, droughts, storms, heat waves, and heavy rainfall will become more intense and more frequent. This will impact on agriculture with poorer yields and greater variability from one year to the next. The urban heat island effect will lead to greater temperature rises in cities. This will exac exac exacerbate urban pollution with all the health consequences uh, with, uh, that that leads to. With 60% of what will be a much larger world population living in urban areas by 2035, this will lead to greater pressure to develop land, air, land in areas prone to environmental hazards, such as flooding and landslides. What is certain is that around the world, there will be a loss of habitable land as coastal areas disappear and as other areas become deserts. Traditional agriculture patterns will change dramatically. Tropical diseases will move north, and there will, as a result, be substantial migration and population movements, all of which are likely to produce political tensions and instability. 
Much of the global population growth will, of course, take place in the regions with the greatest problems. And while the global economy may well continue to grow, the growth will be uneven. And the combination of a rising population and economic growth will probably, despite all the efforts being made in respect of the climate, lead to a 50% growth in energy demand. And 80% of that demand will come from fossil fuels where the reserves are located in politically unstable areas or will have to be sourced in increasingly challenging environments, such as the polar regions or in the deep ocean. This is likely to mean that nation states will make the necessary political and military moves to secure or safeguard resources. And of course, the control of resources will give political leverage to those with that control, as Russia has demonstrated in respect of Belarus and Georgia, amongst others. A particular aspect of this will be access to minerals, and in particular, rare earth elements, which are necessary for some technologies. Iridium is likely to run out within the next four years. Tantalum, um, and uh, within 20 years, and it is not known how long supplies of rhodium, gallium, or hafnium will last. The countries that have control of those stocks will have a stranglehold on technology, technology that is used throughout the world. And that perhaps explains China's huge investment in parts of Africa. At the same time as we're seeing this, there is the growing internationalization of markets for goods, services, and labor. However, this will lead to local markets and economies being increasingly exposed to destabilizing fluctuations of the global economy. The net effect of all of this is that while average material conditions may improve, the gap between rich and poor will widen. However, as communications improve, the aspirations of the less advantaged will be raised at the same time as the disparities will become more obvious to them. This inevitably will create a greater sense of injustice leading to heightened tensions. And this will be further exacerbated by demographic trends with an increasingly aging population in developed nations, but with an increasingly youthful population in much of the developing world who will be facing poorer employment prospects and unfulfilled expe expectations. We will therefore face the prospect of concentrations of disaffected, frustrated urban youth in decaying urban centers, and that is a recipe for the growth in violent extremism. And rapid commu uh, global communication will be a two-edged sword. It will enable people to recognize that inequality. And as the quality of formal news sources decline, they are being replaced by unofficial information sources, and those are not necessarily benign influences. The speed of communication and the impact of migration and personal mobility will mean that what is happening in one part of the world will be played out amongst the diaspora and, and via virtual communities in every other continent. In my city, London, there are more than 300 languages spoken at home by the children in the city's schools. Conflicts taking place half a world away may be, indeed are, being visited on the streets immediately outside those schools. And all of this will bring into sharp relief the inherent conflict between secularism and commercialism on one side and rigid belief systems on the other. And that conflict will help the radicalizers and the gap between aspiration and reality um, or, or between rich and poor will provide the pool of disaffected to be radicalized. And this will be happening at a time of geopolitical change. As US preeminence gives way to a multipolar world with China and India, perhaps also, I don't know, Brazil or Indonesia, emerging as major economic powers, with Russia using hybrid means to maximize its influence, and at the same time, there will be increasingly powerful non-state actors engaging in illicit trade and international crime, and there will be more ungoverned spaces. 
I hope I've said enough to indicate that we'll be living in a riskier society. One in which there will be greater political extremism and conflict and where radicalizers can flourish with a volatile and disaffected population in whose minds their ideas can take root. This will be a riskier society as state and city authority break down in many places and where international crime and terrorism can flourish and be nurtured in such lawless areas. At the same time, society itself, even in the most developed and apparently stable nations, will become more vulnerable through its increasing reliance on ever more complex and interconnected systems. Most critical systems are now internet-based, and many have been built up over time with new systems overlaid on top of legacy systems in a way that in some cases is almost now impossible to disentangle and beyond the experience of many of those responsible for running and maintaining them. This creates its own risks, even before you consider the possibility of external threats. However, our, over our reliance on electronic rich systems and networks, the very DNA of our infrastructure presents a real vulnerability. And some of this will be beyond our control. Acute solar flares trigger electromagnetic pulses powerful enough to disable most of our systems, certainly those that are inadequately shielded. And that's happened before, the telegraph system in 1859 or the Hydro-Quebec grid in March 1989. At another level, offensive cyberspace capabilities are already being used to penetrate and attack our networks. As civilian and military environments become increasingly dependent on integrated networks and with space-based assets exclusively relying on the electromagnetic spectrum to receive or transmit data, the impact of cyber attacks is likely to range from the inconvenience causing to the catastrophic. So, we're living in an increasingly complex and dangerous world. And the lesson for all of us, and the reason for today, the overriding lesson, is that we are probably not investing sufficiently in our security and our systems of risk management. Above all, we must be prepared to expect the unexpected. I rather like the taxonomy, which says we have to be ready not only for the black swans, previously unobserved, high impact, hard to predict, rare events, but also the black jellyfishes, things we think we know about and understand, but which turn out to be more complex and uncertain, sometimes with a long tail and a nasty sting at the end. And then there are the black elephants, challenges visible to everyone, but which no one wants to deal with. As you'll gather, I'm not a natural optimist. Uh, I appreciate I may have got steadily more apocalyptic during my remarks, but we've got to get beyond the stage of simply admiring these problems. Making every organization more resilient and more strategic in the way it manages risk and the threats faced makes it more possible to address these potential global crises and certainly to manage the consequences. And that is why today's conference is so important and why I'm particularly pleased to be here as president of the Institute of Strategic Risk Management, bringing together practitioners from all over the globe, providing a critical mass of expertise of those thinking about these issues, taking on responsibility for managing increasingly complex risks, building organizational resilience, and ensuring that business continuity, emergency response, and crisis management is taken forward systematically. We all have our part to play in managing these strategic risks and our part in making our own organizations more resilient, our communities resilient, and ultimately ensuring humanity itself is resilient against the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Aha, they don't have a flat surface here. I think there's some design issues around GCS. Good. Um, Ambassador Duzusi and, and Lord Toby Harris, thank you very, very much for, for the introductions there and the comments. Um, we'll now move into the main body of, thank you, the main body 
of the situation. Um, on your program, depending which version you've seen, you'll see that um, uh, the first session about urbanization, I'll be part of that. Um, and then we also have on the program, Mr. Abdullah al Subil from the direct, Deputy Director of the Arab Urban Development Institute. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Subil is not able to be with us and we are very grateful to Anu uh, Kerishanoglu who has stood in at the last minute. And thank you very, very much for that, who is a senior urban advisor um, at the IFRS, IFRC. And we're looking forward to hearing your comments. Um, it seems to me that um, if you look at um, the language used over the last 15 years, um, there has been a real movement um, in the use of language and you can see actual trends come out and if you do word searches. So the first one was crisis. Crisis was a word of the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, and then the next word was resilience. Resilient societies, resilient cities, resilience organizations, etc., etc. Um, if you do a word search now on the, same sort of goo on the same sort of algorithms, the word that comes up is unprecedented. Everything is unprecedented. And if you look over the last four or five weeks, there have been unprecedented heat waves in India, unprecedented droughts in Australia, unprecedented infrastructural failures in South America, unprecedented fires in California. And as Lord Harris said, we're now moving to a stage which is going beyond. Um, the models we have don't, don't work. The nature of crisis, it is unprecedented. The truth of the matter is, from a technical perspective, a crisis should always be something which you've not seen before. Because if you've seen before, you have a model. It may not be a perfect model, but you have a way of engaging with it. You have a way of rationalizing it, understanding it. And by its very nature, a crisis goes beyond, it transcends that. It's not rational, for academics, it moves into Rittle and Webber's idea of a wicked problem, a non-rational problem. We had a major um, infrastructure failure in the UK um, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, three months ago, um, uh, uh, power failure. <coughs> um, power system went down across large parts of the United Kingdom. Two small parts of the system both failed at the same time, each one of which should not have been significant, and actually, even in, in combination, should not have been significant. And yet, as they say in French, quel surprise, what a surprise, um, the backup systems did not work as planned. And the crisis manager came up and said, we were prepared, but unfortunately the crisis was both unexpected and sudden. That's what a crisis looks like, my friends. That's it, it is sudden and unexpected. And yet, it seems to me that every time we see crisis failures, it is not because of, as Toby mentioned, sort of the black swan or the black jellyfish, but it's what uh, I think Michelle Wooker in her book called The Grey Rhino. It's something that is big, large, incredibly obvious, and very aggressive. And you're standing in the road, and it's coming towards you, and you're pretending it is not there. It's very simple for us, very easy for us to see crisis management in terms of the apocalyptic. And yet the truth of the matter is <clears throat> that most crises are stupidity. It is the inability of organizations to do that which they should be doing. So what I'd like to do is just to have a brief look um, over some of the issues around um, crisis management within an urban and a hyper-urban perspective. And this is a, a conference which, um, if I, I can get this right, yeah, up there, uh, should be there, it's on white on white. Top right-hand corner, this was last week, it was in Paris. Uh, welcome to HSBC, Citizens of the Future 2019 Smarter Connections, in Paris, 7th of November, exactly one week ago. Um, the new mega regions, these are plenary panel sessions, decarbonizing the city. Cities, trade and logistics, demographics and global urbanization, digital transformation, new industries, leading the future cities. That is an incredibly exciting program. And I think that that has real value. The problem is, what nobody mentioned was one year ago in Paris, it looked like that. And it seems to completely and utterly ignore the fact that in the 21st century, over the next 10, 20 years of our lives, Cities underwater is going to be the new normal. That is not an anomalous situation. That is how cities are going to survive. In the UK, we have 17 tier one hospitals in London. London is slightly below the waterline, so if the Thames overflows, it's going to be flooding into sort of Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus. We have 17 tier one hospitals, each of which has an emergency backup generating system. 
Where are they kept? Any ideas? In the basement. So everybody would say, don't worry, my friends, we have a plan. I don't know if you know, but on LinkedIn a couple of years ago, they had a competition about what is the most dangerous words in crisis management. It's okay, we have a plan. I know what I'm doing. Um, the, the winner was, um, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Um, so <laughs> so um, the idea that I'm from the government, I'm here, to, you know, the government's going to come and help you in a crisis, that's a bad way to go. So it seems to me that the reality is that if we do not, if we see... Um, planning for cities, urbanization in the 21st century in terms of really nice, pretty pictures and not in terms of that. We're missing a trick. This was something I was involved with. This is a specialist um, edition. It was, I was invited to be on the editorial committee. Um, infrastructure, risk and resilience, managing complex and concerted in developing cities. When they got in touch with me, they said, are you interested? I said, absolutely. This is absolutely what I do. I would love to be involved. Um, I think they mentioned biscuits and coffee at some stage, which probably helped. Um, and then they sent me this slide, and I said, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm out. I, can't, I cannot be involved in this. Um, I just, I have a moral problem with this. Um, anybody know what the moral problem is? Anybody see anything there? That, my friends, is not what a developing city looks like. And if you're sitting in, in London or Geneva or Tokyo or New York, and you're thinking about the problems of developing cities, and that's your image you have in your mind, then you have a paradigm error, because that's what a modern city, a developing city looks like. And those are the issues. And if the programs and plans you have in place do not work there, then they do not work. And so we seem to have a schizophrenia. We seem to have this, this almost dysmorphia about discussing urbanization in the 21st century over the next 20 years and the reality that we are operating in. Smart cities. It's, it's, you know, we have this smart city thing. Hyper-connected, hyper hyper-computer. Smart cities are bloody stupid. I mean, seriously, cities are stupid. Why? Because they do not perform their function. What is the function of a city? You basically get up in the morning, have your breakfast, you travel in some way to where your place of work, you then mix with other people, do your work, you then have a drink in the evening if you're in London, and then you go home. There is no city in the world, as far as I know, which allows you to do that effectively at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. They just don't. They don't fulfill their function. And what we're seeing is I think cities actually getting to the level of where they function as cities. We've seen in, in Delhi, for example... Um, we've seen sort of pollution doing it. We've certainly seen traffic situations. I mean, that is, happens to be in Dakar on top right and Lagos bottom, bottom right, but I mean, it could be any, any developing city in the modern world. Um, so we have a problem of urbanization, hyper-urbanization. That's a city. city. Um, this was in 2013, the 15 megacities of the world. Uh, mega city, 10 million people or more. Um, all of them except one have a common fact, which I'm sure you're aware of. What is that common fact or anybody? Oh, I was, I was doing a big build-up there. Maybe. <laughs> um, okay, sorry? They're all in the southern heavens. They're all in the southern heavens. So, so emerging south, there's one other thing. What's the common factor between all of them? We're talking about climate change. That's a clue. They're all coastal. They're all on the coast. Okay, so they're all on the coast, except for Delhi, which is in the middle of India. Um, if we look at four to 2030, um, hyper-urbanization, uh, hyper-conobization, sort of these big cities which just never, ever end, all on the coast, all on the coast. And therefore, these are the cities of the future. Top left, um, Philippines, Manila. Top right, New York. Bottom left, Paris. Bottom right, Mumbai. Um, these are not anomalous situations. This is how the world looks today. There is no city that can claim this will not happen next year. None. And there is no city that's ready for it. Um, what happens is... Um, I've just... Clementine, this is just frozen for some reason. Clementine, help. <laughs> Technology, hey. Dude, she, and she's not here. And she's not here, you see? My God, crisis. Okay, keep talking. Um, <laughs> uh, guys, technology will always, always, always let you down, usually just as the boss is about to walk into the room, so we learn a lesson from that. Clementine, can we, can we defreeze this in some way? Okay, no pressure at all. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Did I, did I turn it? I didn't turn it off. Did I? No, it's not turned off. Is the battery? You see? She should be a consultant. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I've, it's okay, guys. I've fixed it. It's okay. It's under control. Uh, um, uh, no, she assisted me, and I fixed it. <laughs> Hold on. We'll have to have a chat after. We'll have to, we'll have, to have a chat to, just, to just discuss this. Okay, fine. Um, uh, uh, anybody know where this is? Texas, well done, Texas. I, so, uh, sorry? 
<laughs> guys, I'm trying to give you a hand here, guys. Um, uh, Texas 2017, okay, so much for animation. Um, uh, I, I've got absolutely no doubt, absolutely no doubt at all. If you said to those guys one week beforehand, the Texas, the flood, I'm sure they have a flood plan. And if you said to those city managers one week before this happened, do you have a plan? They said, not only do we have a plan, but bring it on because we are ready. And then that happens. Sorry, and then that happens. Oh, sorry. Good. Both hands, both hands, my God. Uh, complexity. Um, so both happen. So what happens is um, this happens. And then we have the phrase, which is always the phrase that comes in front of a crisis. And it says, I didn't think it would be like this. Because what we have is, when we conceptualize it, we are seeing in terms of rational problems. We see ourselves making decisions and making moves and doing stuff and sort of ha have that's not how a crisis works. If, it's, if, that, if that's how it works, it's a major incident, not a crisis. And as somebody who's had the pleasure and the privilege to do this all over the world with major, major organizations, we've worked with 17 countries in the last four years with major organizations. One of the significant um, systemic problems they have is their classification of crisis. And what they think of a crisis is what I call a major incident. And it is big and it's messy, but it's rational. It's not this. And when this happens, people get surprised. Um, this is Brisbane, 2011. I mean, again, we had a plan, not how it worked out. That's a problem, though. The problem is the intact, impact and consequences. That's an impact. That's not a consequence. That's an impact. The consequence is the destruction of the, of the infrastructure around you. And from my perspective, as somebody who helps organizations deal with planning to, to respond to it, if your infrastructure is in place, it shouldn't be a crisis. If your communication infrastructure, information exchange infrastructure, road and rail infrastructure, you can then put a plan in place. But you look at that bridge or you look at that railway, if your plan is based on movement, it's going to fail. And the truth is, if anywhere in your crisis management plan says, and we are going to move, the likelihood that's going to go, that's going to go wrong. That's going to fail, because that's what happens within a crisis. Um, and yet, um, we have complex situations. So that was just one little small part of it. There's so many aspects we take, some of which um, Ambassador Doucet spoke about, some of which Toby Harris spoke about. They all come, come together within cities and urban environments. So you have something like Lagos, you have flooding, you have a breakdown of society, you have uh, uh, the, the unmanaged slums, you then have... Um, uh, uh, viruses, you have cholera, you have diseases, you have transport, etc., etc. Um, and yet, what we do know, if there's one thing that we know, is that we cannot manage these, we cannot engage with these on our own. It is about collaboration, it is about information exchange, it is about networking, it is about group responses. Um, and Ebola underlines the urgent need for a new way of responding to global epidemics. This was in 2014. I think that message has been made and that message has been understood and that message has been taken on board. Oh, no, I don't. I think I'm wrong. Weakened international cooperation damages collective will to tackle global risks, 2019. So actually what we are seeing at the time of the greatest risk, when, as Toby Harris said, then nobody would deny it, the frameworks and the structures which we have thought would give us the global frameworks to, to, to discuss this and to develop, develop solutions are actually breaking down. Are not only breaking down, are being broken down. And so suddenly we have to start asking, well, where does the solution come from? Um, into the Darkness, this is a UK point, which both Toby Harris, um, was, I think, chaired maybe. Um, I was involved in on the periphery. But this was basically mapping um, what does the UK look like with what's called a dark sky, dark start, a black sky, black start, total infrastructure failure. The truth of the matter is, nobody knows. Anybody who tells you that I know how this works, they do not. Stanley McChrystal, who was head of special forces in Afghanistan for many years and was a great thinker, um, used to say anybody who came to Washington and thought they had an answer had to leave the room because they clearly have no idea what the situation's about. And if you think you have a solution to this or understand this or can model it, or you don't, you can't, nobody knows. We've never lost a major city. We've come close. Durban because of, uh, sorry, Cape Town because of water um, and Tokyo um, because of uh, the potential cloud after Fukushima in 2011. But we've never lost a major city. We don't know what it looks like to lose a major city. It's gonna happen, it has to happen. If you look at the environment we're operating, losing a major city is something that's gonna happen, in my opinion, some stage, not too distant future. South America cut, cut, power cut. Argentina investigates unprecedented outages. Again, the word unprecedented. What does that mean? Nobody, it means nobody knows what it means. Unprecedented means we do not know what this means. It's new, it's gone beyond what we even have an understanding of. 
Um, and that's before we started talking about malicious actors. Um, the United Nations, uh, the United States National Security Agency has openly admitted that they have Chinese and Russian bugs in every aspect of their national infrastructure and defense systems, any of which can close down the system. I don't know what national infrastructure means or national security means when anybody can close it down. But we have another issue because we have hyper-connected cyber systems. We have military systems. We have autonomous military systems. We have computer systems for university. Let's say we go to university and we put in the question into their supercomputer, which is hyper-connected on the global network. How do we solve global warming? How do we solve climate change? What answer is it going to come out with? Anybody know what the answer is? It's a very simple answer. What's the answer going to be? Get rid of people. Get rid of people, then you will solve it in 20 years. Great. So that's the solution it comes up with. Why don't we just poison every water system in the world? Does it for me? That is a solution to your problem. Problem, solution, and we do it. Now, these systems are working in ways that we don't understand. There's a very famous story about Google created a... a a management system for their warehouses, and they created this, and the system started talking to itself in its own language. They developed a language to express stuff which no human understood, and therefore they had to turn it off. There's stuff happening. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's saying it's not that it cannot happen. And if we're going to start con conceptualizing what the questions are, never mind the, the answer, but what the questions are, these are the questions we need to ask. This is what New York looks like, uh, 2006, I believe. 2000, um, 2003, it says up there. Uh, read your own slides, David. Um, it says 2003. Um, this is what New York looked like. They had a, a complete and utter blackout. Um, and the reason was three things happened. A, there was a power surge across some wires. B, those wires hit some branches which had not been cut back. So if somebody had cut the branches, it would not have happened. But they hit branches. We set off an alarm in the control station in Ohio and a 25 cent bulb did not go off and therefore they did not know what was happening and then you have New York goes down and when New York goes down that's what it looks like now you may have a plan my friends but it doesn't work when that happens that's what a city looks like we have to learn from the reality of situations around us near misses is God's way of giving us an opportunity to learn that's what a city looks like they said to Napoleon, what skill do you want, what, skill, what quality do you want your generals to have? I want my generals to be lucky. I know they're good because they're my generals, but the quality I want is to be lucky. They're lucky. Imagine that picture in November or in February, minus four and raining. So the nature of the threat. I think we have to go back to my opening comments. We have to rethink the nature of the question. Mark Carney um, uh, from the Bank of England, financial sector, Mark Carney tells global banks they cannot ignore climate change dangers. Financial sector warned it risks its losses from extreme weather and its stake in polluting firms. I.e., guys, you've got to change. What he is saying is this is evolutionary. It might even be revolutionary. We have to change what we're doing. It seems to me that that is 20th century thinking. It is not 21st century. 21st century thinking is the World Economic Forum report this year our world currently stands on the brink of a mass political, technological, and social shift which will transform our existence in ways we cannot yet possibly know. To go back to what Toby Harris was saying about the report from the UK, we, we do not know. We cannot conceptualize what the future threats will be. And therefore, that doesn't mean we can't prepare it for it, but we have to have a metaphor and a language that reflects that reality. That is not evolutionary, it is not revolutionary, it is mutational. It is saying the threat environment is mutating. And what happens in mutating, you have a species jump. It says this, there's no continuity. This does not extend into that, it's something new. And it seems to me, and I think many of us will believe, that in order to have an understanding of the mutational nature of the threats and risk environment we're operating, we do need to have a new language and new metaphor to come up with that. Um, very briefly, um, London Resilience was some sort of cave. I'm um, laughing. Toby Harris was involved in I was involved on in the periphery. London Resilience was a fantastic program. Um, it says, London City in, in the crisis, how do we deal with it? You know, what do we need to know? How do we put in place these things? I want to bring up just one slide, which I, I felt was, was really significant about that. Well, two slides. First of all, this one is the, the overarching aims and objectives. As anybody knows, um, if in doubt, Go back to your principles. Go back to your basics. Bas basics doesn't mean simple. Basic means fundamental, foundational. So go back to your basics. Basic is what's your purpose? Helping London to be prepared. Your first stage is risk assessment. What can go wrong? Assessing risk to London's resilience. 
Second stage is, what do we do about it? Risk control, building resilience through prevention and mitigation. And the third is contingency planning. What do we do if something happens? Working together to prepare, respond, and recover. And so you can take that standard three-stage risk management process and put it into something as complex as City of London. It was a fantastic program, generally fantastic program. This was the sort of stuff it came up with. This is mapping um, complex dependencies um, and, and, co and, and uh, cascading consequences. And you take something like electricity and you say, how does it impact on telecoms, emergency services, transport, environment, over, for example, 12 hours, 72 hours in a week. And then you take 150 of these and you start mapping them, which takes about three years. Um, and then what you do is you start seeing where these connectivities are. And this was a way that um, they actually started to develop an understanding of how a complex ecosystem such as London works, which, had never, in my opinion, had never been done before. A fantastic program, um, and it's certainly something worth linking to. There's a lot of stuff on it um, in open access. Robert Mugar, many of you know me, Robert Mugar, he's a, he's a writer and a thinker, um, conceptualist around major city management. Um, what he said, he brought a six-stage process. If we're going to deal with this, cities, okay, that's a problem. Don't bring me a problem, my friend. Bring me a solution. If you don't have a solution, then you've just added to my problems. What's the solution? Um, and Robert Mugar talks about a six-stage program. Cities need a plan and a strategy. It doesn't just happen. It has to be managed. It has to be organized. It has to be sustained. Um, it has to be brought into. It has to be cohesive. It has to be inclusive. It has to be integrated. All of these words. Um, cities need to be self-governing. They need to have ownership of the problems, ownership of the resources at the city level. Um, and this is a major problem around the world, and it's, a, it's one of the serious barriers to that, is that how do cities um, create their own ecosphere with not only just how they operate, but how they create their own futures and manage their own futures and plan for their own futures. And there are two cities in terms of case studies um, which have done this brilliantly are, are considered academic studies. One is, of course, Singapore. The other is Medellin in Colombia. I've just, I was there last year. Um, and Medellin have turned themselves from cartel central and one of the most... Um, dysfunctional cities in the world to a case study for organizational management, um, sustained management, um, and inclusivity. Um, and if there's a lot of work out there, and if you are looking at some ways that you can actually practically create change within cities, Medellin is a fantastic case study. Green, green, green. It's got to be green. You can't, you can't talk green and not do green. Um, you've got to do green. Um, and that's in every aspect of it. Um, I'm just going over this, but manage the growth of the urban sprawl. One of the problems we have with cities is they just spread out and they spread out and they spread out, and you have two different cities, Osaka and Tokyo, for example, sort of, you know, we see the east coast of America, becoming a major, massive, hyper-urban sprawl. Um, that means it's unmanaged, and that means you have all sorts of problems there. So if you are managing cities, you have to somehow limit the growth out, and you have to see it growing up. Steal ideas. There's a huge amount of good work out there. There's a massive amount of goodwill, of good intention and goodwill being done on the local level. You do not have to invent from zero. You do not have to start with a blank piece of paper. Go out. You don't have to steal. People will give them to you. you know, the next slide is, is looking at city uh, uh, collaborative bodies. Um, and the next thing is start now. It's, you know, this is not something that has a five-year plan to develop the idea. The idea is we have to start now. To go back, looking around, there's a good few ex-hippies in this room, I believe. I know you're hiding it, but you are. Um, think, lo think global, act local. You know, it's a global issue, but you take responsibility for your neighborhood. You know, be a good neighbor. It starts in the neighborhood. Um, so think global, act local is where it's really, really coming back to. We always knew that hippies would come back at some stage. Always believed it. Um, these are, these are um, major uh, collaborative organizations for city management, all of which are sharing, all of which are open, all of which believe in, 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 in sharing information. If anybody's interested, they are all looking forward to, 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 to talking to you. The one on the bottom left, Arab Urban Development Institute, we are very proud um, that we have a, 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 an arrangement with them, an agreement with them. We're working with Hoda, who's going to be here later, from New York University, Abu Dhabi, um, and the Arab Urban Development Institute to create a, a, a symposium in Abu Dhabi next year as part of the World Urban Forum. One of the things that's happening, and I'll come on to the ISRM in a minute, is that the ISRM, although it's a very young organization, um, we only sort of were a year old, um, we have created, for some reason, a genuine global network. Um, and that network has started to create some genuinely significant collaborative relationships there. Um, these are the relationships within the ISRM. These are organizations that we have close and collaborative, active relationships with, action-oriented relationships with. Um, and now they're beginning to start wor uh, working with each other. Um, and as you can see, that's a significant geographical spread. 
Um, we are very, very happy to introduce people. They're very happy to be introduced people. I think everybody here is, believes in open sharing of information. So if that's something of interest, feel free to talk to us. Um, I'm going to introduce some of the Government Advisory Council members at the end of the presentation. Um, just very quickly, that is the ISRM at the moment. Red is our Global Advisory Councils. We're very proud of our Global Advisory Council. We think there's a fantastic group of people making a genuine contribution. Um, and the Greens are our chapters where we have active chapters across the world. Um, if you are involved anywhere, feel free to get in touch with us. We, we like people talking to us and we love talking to other people. Um, one thing, we have a program. One of the things that the ISRM has, which not many other people do, is we actually have an academic, a structured academic program associated with us. We have a level five award, which is UK government regulated, which is on the UK academic framework. It has academic accreditation. Um, we then have a level, which is a three-day program or a five-day program, depending on how you run it. We run, we run that all over the world. That's what I run. I go all over the world running these programs. We have a level six program, which is a one-year um, uh, academic research program, distance learning around complex risk and crisis management. And we have a level seven program, which is a master's level um, dissertation, all of which is academically approved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I think that we as a community have the responsibility for is this. The, the, uh, the, the mission statement of the ISRM, as I believe the GCSP does, the mission statement says that it is our aim to create a space where the academics, the practitioners, and the policy makers can come together in a shared space. The problem is what the, ac what the practitioners say to the academics is, my friends, you've never been in the river at three o'clock in the morning when the waters is coming down, so you know, you, great, you know stuff, but you don't understand stuff, which is a reasonable point. What the academics say to the practitioners is, my friend, I absolutely trust that you will make that decision at three o'clock in the morning, and I trust you will make the right decision. The problem is, you can't tell me why you made it. And if you're not there at three o'clock in the morning, your skills are not there, because what is missing, and this is the step where I think that we actually can make an impact is, what is missing is the methodology. How do you go from concept and aspiration to delivery and impact? And I think that one of the things that the ISRM has done, and it's provable because of the work we're doing around the world, is we've created a methodology which is accessible and understood by people working within major cities, within major government agencies, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we do. Um, if I could just ask, we had yesterday, as, again, hosted by GCSP, the Global Advisory Council. Can I just ask the people in the Global Advisory Council in the room to stand up? Okay. Um, and they were, we, which song were you going to, no, we weren't going to do a song, we agreed we weren't going to do a song, okay, <laughs> okay, guys, they're all, they've all got the ISRM badge on, if you want to talk to them afterwards, that's fine, thank you very much, okay, so that is my piece up, does anybody, what we'll do is, um, we'll bring you in now, and then we'll have, we've got plenty of time at the end, I hope, for questions, and we can go around the room um, and ask some questions, um, but now, for now, I know, I know, the floor is, the floor is yours, thank you very much, and that's, if you need that, bring it here, Thank you, this one? Thank you very much. Wow. Are you scared enough? Or should I continue? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, all the previous speakers. Uh, laid the ground for me, for my speech perfectly. So I don't have to repeat all the risks that when you look into future, the risks and challenges. Uh, but maybe focus on uh, the most important thing, which is people. That's what our business is about, right? Uh, I'm from uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, based in Geneva. And I work as an urban advisor. As you probably know, that International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent, is, um, is the biggest humanitarian network. We have national societies in 191 countries. And we also have International Committee of Red Cross uh, in, in the moment. So, uh, yeah, urbanization. So, interestingly, as a federation, we also just completed our uh, strategy 2030. And we try to look into future. And we also diagnose many of the uh, challenges, risks that, that's already mentioned. And we try to uh, understand what does it mean for us? and for, for an organization who is rooted in the communities. And these are big, big challenges. But in the end, we need to focus on who is most affected, who is the most vulnerable, who is 
left behind. And but not we don't see the communities and people, uh, which is true. They are uh, there are a huge number of people, very very vulnerable, but also they are the key to the solutions, and they have to be part of these solutions. So it's uh, already mentioned that uh, urbanization is accelerating. Urbanization is, of course, nothing new, right? In the human human civilization has been urbanizing since the beginning of the time. But what is happening right now is it is so, it's like urbanization on steroid. It is so fast. It is happening such an accelerated rate that is overwhelming uh, the cities, the countries. And uh, since the fact that 90% of the projected uh, 2.3 billion people to be added to the city populations, 90% of this will be in developing countries and in medium and small sized cities. Yes, there will be more mega cities, but the biggest growth will be in the medium and small sized cities. And we know that these cities don't have the resources that these mega cities have. They are so much weaker in, in every term, in terms of organizational capacity, in terms of preparedness, in terms of resources. Yet they are the ones who are going to face this uh, huge influx of, of people. So I would like to... Oh, here it is, right. So I would like to focus, uh, I'm gonna skip uh, the the challenges and everything, but focus on uh, four things that why urban resilience matters to IFRC. So we are known as a community-based, or we are a community-based organization, right? Nation, Red Cross, Red Crescent. And conventionally, when people talk about urban, urban development, urbanization, in many people's minds, it comes to mind, my, their mind is, oh, it's not our business, right? It's about development. What is it to do with us? So that's why we are now really focusing on that question. What does it mean for us? And why should we have focus on understanding the urbanization and reaching out to most vulnerable people in urban areas? As mentioned before, uh, this rapid, and I want to uh, focus on, emphasize that, it's rapid and unplanned urbanization that is happening particularly in developing countries, of course, exposing a growing number of people, uh, increasing number of people exposed to disaster risks and effects of climate change. So as you can imagine, um, people, newcomers to the cities or migrants, uh, displaced populations, they tend to settle in the most hazardous areas. They are in the outskirts of uh, cities, they are in in the informal settlements where there's no basic services. They are excluded from access to any services that is offered by cities. And they often lack uh, rights to have any rights that is enjoyed by the rest of the legal uh, residents of cities. And this is really increasing the, increasing the risk, of course, and vulnerabilities of these people. And this number is really growing. One more thing that it, uh, I mentioned that 90% of the population growth in urban areas will be in developing countries, but it will be also mostly in Africa and uh, South Asia. So that is important. Africa will be a very urbanized and young continent in 20, 30 years. IMF ex, uh, ex, uh, predicts that the number of people in the sub-Saharan Africa joining the workforce, meaning young people, will be more than the rest of the world combined in that demographics. This is a huge number, but also what, what do we do with this huge number of young people moving into cities? They could also be considered as a great resource and opportunity, of course, but we need to understand, uh, understand these challenges from the demographic uh, perspective as well. So we, I think it's already mentioned that this urban sprawl, the growing urban areas, increasing, of course, the risk. I'll just want to give an example that, uh, for example, in urban areas, it, the flooding risk is expected to increase by five times be, just because of this urban growth. And similarly, earthquake risks because of just built up, increasing built up environment. And the climate change effect is already mentioned. 
heat waves is already mentioned. It's one of the silent killers, and it's one of the topics that, as Federation, we are going to focus on, because heat waves is a huge silent killer, but also it's very easy to prevent, in a way, by, you know, by community-based uh, in initiatives. And we uh, recently published a, a guide for cities, heat wave preparedness guide for cities. You can search for it, and if you are interested, look at it. So, um, in addition to disaster risks and impacts of climate change, we also see this cri protracted crisis, violence are more and more becoming uh, an important issue in cities. Like we, in Lebanon, in Beirut, uh, Beirut as a city has seen a huge number of Syrian refugees, right? And Syrian, uh, Lebanese Red Cross is providing a lot of services for these uh, for these refugees and immigrants, um, and a lot of displaced people as well. And this happens to be like last years and years. It's not just one time. It's from being a crisis, it is becoming like a part of the everyday life. And the cities have to prepare for that with the communities uh, community based initiatives, as well, of course. And I'll give some more examples later about that. But and urban violence, conflict already mentioned. But what I find interesting is that in our, uh, many, our, many of our assessments in urban areas, we found that people care most about the everyday struggle. Uh, it's very hard for us as a disaster-oriented organization to even bring the disaster risk something future because the everyday struggles are so big, like just the stress of finding a job, even going to a job. In Jakarta, I, I met someone who commutes four hours one way to work. That's eight hours of commute, which is huge. So the everyday struggle, finding someone to care about your children because everybody works, they have to work. Uh, health, pollution, all kinds of everyday struggles is for them, rank stop. So that is a huge uh, information for us. And also a struggle, like how do you bring even future risks to the attention of these people? It's really a big question. But we have to also understand that these are, these are affecting people's resilience uh, quite a lot. Another big issue is fires in slum areas, which is a huge risk as well. I want to talk a little bit about this existing structural and systemic challenges in, in cities. So we, we all know that cities are very complex systems and all these systems are in independencies. And disasters and crises uh, kind of act like a magnifying class when that happens. They just amplify the existing inequalities. Cr uh, cr during crises or disaster times, you actually see them really magnified, which, but that doesn't mean that they just happen. It, it just means that these already exist in the system. It's inherent to, to cities, informality of cities especially. Like in Africa, in uh, Uganda, for example, I give an example, Kampala, 80% uh, of the workforce is informal. What does that mean for us? These people, that means these people don't have access to many of the protective systems. They're not part of any emergency response system. They don't have insurance. They don't have any backup plan. This is 80% of the workforce. So that's huge. These inequalities uh, are, of course, get even worse during disaster and, and crisis times. But we, uh, what we need to understand is that uh, these, this kind of, uh, unless we actually focus on solving structural and systemic challenges, they will only get worse uh, during that kind of uh, difficult times. It's already, I think you, David mentioned that uh, resilience is an interesting word, like we use it a lot. For us, resilience, the word resilience is, is a term bringing together the development and humanitarian words, right? I mean, as I mentioned, uh, it tends to be very different. Oh, we are humanitarians, we deal with certain things, or we are developments, we look into future. We, but as humanitarians, I mean, as, as a federation, of course, we respond to disasters. Uh, it, it happens in cities always, we respond. But what is happening right now is that we realize that 
when we start working, responding a disaster or working in cities, there is no way we can avoid be interacting with the development issues, conventionally considered development, like understanding the infrastructure, understanding how the city works. We have to. But I think similarly for the development agencies, they also seems like understanding that um, just not in, uh, investing in infrastructure is not enough. There, there has to be some participation, inclusivity in, in this kind of urban development. And I'm sure you all are uh, aware of sustainable development goals and probably have seen that inclusivity is a key word. Even the uh, develop, sustainable development goal 11 is about sustainable and inclusive cities, which means a lot to me, which means that without really including people, uh, promoting participatory approaches in urban development, you end up finding solutions that probably won't work or will work for only certain people. World Bank estimates that to re reach to sustainable development goals, just in urban infrastructure, the required investment is $4.5 trillion in the, by 2035. But how, do you, what, how does this investment, if it happens, uh, will be spent? Where does it go? For which group of people benefiting? Are these vulnerable people are benefiting? Or who is left behind? Who will be left behind? These are big questions. And this is where we are really trying to promote participatory city planning, for example. We are talking to city planners. That is not known. I'm a city planner myself by education. Traditionally, it's not, you know, like this changing, though they're becoming more and more participatory city planning practices, including people in this kind of decisions. Because every decision a mayor makes, a municipality makes, has a huge impact. Where does the road go? Where are you going to spend this money to providing public transport service? Or maybe investing in a you know already nicer neighborhood. Where how are you going to solve the city's infrastructure problem? Who is going to benefit? These are huge questions. And usually, without the participatory methodology, without including communities, community representatives, uh, they end up uh, not really solving the problems at a big scale. And sometimes even creating more problems and increasing the inequality. What is interesting is that um, despite all of that, despite we, we, we are getting more and more approached by development organizations. That's why I'm saying that they are starting to recognize that. And we, similarly, we are also recognizing that we have to understand and work with development organizations. And what is another interesting thing is that uh, both sides, or maybe I should talk from our side, from our network, we usually struggle to understand the context. It's huge, right? It's complex, it's huge. We struggle to understand, grasp the whole context. But that doesn't mean that the, the data or information is not there. It is there. There's so much information about cities. The cities collect information, um, all these household surveys. There are a lot of information, but it's not accessible. Or people working at the community level don't even are not aware of this information or don't even think about going to there. And they don't, these two levels are not connected and they're not talking to each other. That's a huge, huge uh, problem. Because, you know, when you look at the city at a very big level, you might see some pockets of vulnerability and risks, but you don't really understand what does it mean for people living there or the solutions that could come up from the bottom up. That's, and same, same for us. If we don't understand why this certain community is having this problem with, without understanding the city context, linking it to the bigger systems, that also uh, very much make it very difficult to come up with a sustainable or, and, and meaningful solution. So these two systems have to work together. And I will talk a little bit about what exactly we are doing to make that happen in the second part. So, okay, I'm gonna move. These are, in summary, why we think we should make a deliberate effort as a community-based organization network to understand cities, city risks and urbanization and the impacts better. So what does, um, so how do we see our value added? What, what could be our role? This is, um, of course, in addition to what we are already doing. Uh, 
in terms of city resilience. So what we are doing right now is maybe rethinking our, our role, our function. Um, we are known for service delivery, right? As I mentioned, we have many branches in cities and they deliver service. So we are very comfortable and used to direct service delivery, like contact with people, which is great. And not that we are not gonna, of course, stop that. We will continue to that. But we are now uh, piloting a new approach. And we pilot this in two cities in Indonesia, in uh, Vanuatu and now in Myanmar, which is um, assuming uh, a convening role which is a local Red Cross branch. I'll give an example in Semarang. The Semarang uh, local Red Cross branch, uh, together with the local government, started a city resilience coalition. And they, they bring together all the diverse stakeholders in a loose way, not like they are signing anything, but just inviting these creating a dialogue, creating a space where all the stakeholders can talk about the, the cities, the, their issues, what to focus on. And this happened to be a very uh, different way of working in cities. And that's how we see uh, more and more where Red Cross can play a great role. Because Red Cross, Red Cross and National Societies are auxiliaries to their national governments. But we, they're not very much, you know, uh, they're not used to really looking, at, uh, working at city level, but because of the, all these challenges. But this way, uh, working with, partnering with local governments and convening stakeholders, creating a dialogue and coming up with so solutions together seems to be uh, really working in, in, in the artists. And uh, you can... I can share the link. We have done a learning study and all of that. We develop new tools, helping other organizations as well. So that, uh, that is one way of maybe uh, for other organizations as well, looking at it. And any of, the, any of your organizations are, can join this kind of coalitions, of course. So uh, leading community-driven, sustainable, scalable solutions. I think you mentioned that think global, think global, look, act local. Yes, definitely. But we also want to add to that, think local as well. I mean, really understanding the local context is, is, is really, really important. And this, this solution has to come from bottom up, uh, not from some other places. There are a lot learned from other cities, absolutely. But People have to come up with their own solutions if, if this, anything is going to work in cities. And cities are very resourceful places. It's, uh, you know, we shouldn't think of them as vulnerable in the sense that they are lacking resources. They are very resourceful people. They are, I mean, slum populations. They are probably the most resilient uh, people on earth. They survive in these extremely difficult conditions, not survive but they are very driven people. <laughs> they, despite all the challenges, they always try to survive in these conditions. So really using these, um, these resources and building on these resources and community-driven solutions is really critical. One other thing is that it, anything that comes up in cities has to be replicable. If you come up with a solution, and if it is not copied by others, it's probably not the right solution, right? That's one of the nice things about cities. If you do something in a neighborhood, if it is working, it will be copied. That's the only way to reach out to, otherwise to like millions of people. Unless you come up with this kind of uh, viral solutions, uh, it's not going to work that, you know, somebody, even if, if it, it is at the city level or community level, Nobody is going to do it alone. Nobody is going to be able to reach out to 10 million people. So we have to come up with these replicable solutions. That means, again, these solutions have to be designed locally and with the, with the participation of all the stakeholders. So another area that we think we will uh, add value is, is the strength, and inclusion, equity, social capital. I think in many of the studies, uh, the, when you look at the city resilience index that is done by Arup and some other organizations as well, um, social capital, 
cohesion is always mentioned as one of the key elements of resilience. Without that, it's not gonna come together. It's the glue for urban resilience. And this is where uh, I think Red Cross, Red Crescent, or other uh, community-based organizations can play a huge role. I'll give an example. Um, I'm from Turkey, I know that in Turkey, but also I was recently in Lebanon, Beirut, I saw it there, and we are both Turkey and Lebanese countries receiving huge number of uh, refugees from Syria, right? And what I saw is that uh, both Turkish Red Crescent and Lebanese Red Cross, whatever they do, they do, they create these community service centers, anything they do, they do it for local people and for the refugees. They don't separate. So they just really, their priorities bring together these two, uh, maybe not known to each other, new groups uh, together. But this is really creating this social cohesion uh, is, is really, really important. And also we would like to promote the equity. I don't wanna go into too much on that, but equity and inclusiveness is, is really important topics in urban, urban resilience. And of course, advocating for increased, how much time I have? I'm, I have a little bit. <laughs> um, of course, uh, uh, we may not be an organization who's uh, you know, in investing in, in urban infrastructure, but advocating for, uh, for making these city infrastructure, disaster resilience, climate smart, is really important. As I mentioned, trillions, every year already billions of dollars is spent in urban infrastructure. Huge amounts of money. But like, how do you, what kind of infrastructure is being created? Is it climate smart? Is it inc incorporating disaster risk, future risks or not? Is it, is it equitable? Who these infrastructure are created? These are huge uh, topics and by advocating for inclusiveness, by advocating for uh, disaster risk reduction and equity, we think that we could make a huge role in the creating the safer and resilient cities of the future. So maybe I'm gonna give like very few examples of, for example, for like different nation societies are doing. In Nairobi, uh, Kenyan Red Cross has uh, reach out to slum populations, the biggest slum in one of the biggest slums in the world, Makuru. And as I mentioned, the com local community decided their biggest risk is fire. So they are working with the communities, creating a completely new system with completely new smoke detectors, which are designed for slum population because the home that smoke detectors won't work in slums, as you can easily imagine, because in very small spaces they are cooking. They are, but uh, Lumkani, a company from South Africa, we partner with them and they developed a specific um, smoke detectors that will work in slum areas, which can differentiate cooking or fire, everything. And it's very, very cheap, very affordable. And the systems they designed is Red Cross is organizing the community, organizing, creating these fire rescue teams, fire response teams in the slums, because by the time the fire department knows about the fire, it's already gone. I mean, they cannot even come. Fire trucks cannot even go into slum areas, as you all know. So they come up with a completely different system, with water towers, local people responding, and every uh, detector is connected to people's mobile phones, so they know immediately, they know which where it started, and they can come. So it's a completely uh, new system, designed for uh, slum areas. So that is that kind of solutions we are after. And this is, can be easily replicated. It's very cheap. It's completely locally driven. And it, working with the local um, formal fire departments, but a very different system. France, uh, France has... Uh, experienced huge heat waves. So they are distributing water, they are checking on elderly, they are advocating for creating cooler spaces in cities, working with local governments and municipalities. In Japan, one more example, strengthening social wet network of elderly women. That's one of the uh, areas that there's so many isolated 
lonely, maybe living alone, elderly people uh, who, who are in need of care. And during that kind of heat waves, they are often the most vulnerable. Uh, in Manila, for example, uh, in again, in informal settlement areas, uh, new ways of uh, water sanitation systems, like our traditional, what we call wash system, it won't work in, in cities, but we come up with completely new uh, systems that will work in these areas. Uh, these are some of the publications uh, that we published regarding the urban disaster response resilience, and you can all reach them at the preparecenter.org. Thank you very much. I think the, the message that comes through, and which we're all aware, is it's locally owned, um, it's local action, and yet there is also a role for the facilitating agencies that are, they're basically enabling, they're enabling agencies, but as soon as they try and take ownership or, or, or sort of in order to impose, then you get kicked back. I think that that's a lesson which we all learn. Um, it's very easy. Um, I know there's some paratroopers in the room. I'm an ex-paratrooper. The problem between the paratroopers and the Air Force is, in the Air Force, from 40,000 feet, Every problem looks like it's got an easy solution. You get on the ground and it's a lot messier than you think it was. When we're sitting in our management, city, in management offices in cities all over the world, we think we have solutions for messy problems. And then when you get down onto the ground, they're not as simple as you think they, as you think they are. Um, and, so, and so there's that sort of ongoing understanding of it. And one of the problems, things that we say is that every crisis at the end of the day is local, it's immediate, and it's personal. It's where do the kids sleep tonight? Where do I get water? Where do I, how do I feed the baby? What do I get nappies from? Um, how do I stay safe? Um, and we can stay in our, in our offices and we can see a three-week program, but when you're on the ground, it's cold, and you're under two feet of water, the next three hours are life or death. Um, and I think we have that sort of dichotomy, that push and pull between our responsibility to have overarching responses and that the reality is human lives and there's real human suffering. Um, I think um, one of the things that I, I meant to say and I didn't say in my opening remarks is that we have a fantastic range of speakers, but we have an equally fantastic range of participants here. You know, there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience here. So I think um, if we can just take a few minutes, um, not uh, questions and answers is what it's called, but if we can maybe facilitate a dialogue, I'd very much like to see if we can just see a dialogue going in the room for a bit, for a few minutes. Does anybody have anything to say? So either a question to I know myself, um, but does anybody have anything to say? I'm sure you do. Does anybody have any, can bring a perspective to it or an insight from your own experiences? No, 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 one at a time, one at a time, guys, please. please, please, please. <laughs> Sorry, do you want to just introduce yourself and Sorry, yeah, have a mic? Can I sing? Uh, hello, my name is Mark Knight. Um, i am just stopped being a fellow on the seventh floor here at GCSP. I'm a consultant in security and human rights based here in Geneva. So my question is this. There seems to be a, a, a gap between the two speakers and I'm wondering how we can fill it or how conceptually it gets filled as we go along. One is in the in the environments that the, the Red Cross described, those individuals are living the crisis that the first presenter suggested would be the result of an impact. So the, the actual crisis of in a city, in a, in, a, in a developed city, is normal life for the majority of urban dwellers in, you know, it globally. So in this environment, how do we, what is the framework, what is the purpose or the, what is the framework or the, the terminology that brings those two together whereby, you know, city planning, city development and crisis preparedness, you know, start to operate within the same, I'm going to use a horrible expression, but lived experience in the same world, basically. So that's it, it's a sort of like general idea. Good question, well, I can and actually based very grounded in reality, I know, would you like to, would you like to say something? This was one of the points I uh, tried to make. Maybe I can go deeper a little bit. Exactly, that is, is a problem. And this huge gap, 
I would maybe offer from our perspective this community, urban community resilience, that's at least we are trying to put out. Uh, could be the, if we are looking for a term, could be the bridging term because it cannot possibly happen without infrastructure, without actually cities making those investments. It's not going to happen. Yes, it's one part we can contribute, this cohesion, bringing together communities, but if the roads are not there, if the flood prevention systems are not, you know, there's only so much you can do. So the community resilience requires this kind of city investments, city level thinking, future thinking, and hopefully this will bring together both sides. Uh, that's our real, real hope. That's why actually we are here today. Uh, from, from my perspective, Mike, um, I think, as I know has actually said, um, I think one of, some of the trends which are coming out in academic work and in, in social modeling is, one is um, hyper-localization, in that you, know, you are going to be, to a certain extent, isolated and cut off. You've got to have ownership of the, of the, of the uh, resources on the ground, the ability to stuff. Um, and the other, of course, is social capital. You know, if the society itself is disparate, if there's an inequality in there, I mean, if people don't feel that they're engaged with it, then of course, what's going to happen is they're going to feel isolated, and they don't feel they don't feel part of the community around them, or they're not part of the community around them. I think there's from from a higher level, there's a responsibility to see reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. Um, and I think that we have to bring in solutions that do work on the ground. I mean, just simple things. I mean, something as simple as back, um, wind up radios. Um, um, you know, water purification systems in the ground. I think one personally, I think absolutely something which we, which hasn't been mentioned here, um, and which I, I'm, I'm more and more thinking about as a magic solution is 3D printing. You know, what happens if you can if you can sort of put print water filters? You know, and you can push through water filters. You can push through medical stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that's been completely and utterly unexplored, and I think that could actually bring a a genuine game changing thing to it. Um, besides, besides that, um, I think the responsibility to deal with reality as it is, and to be truthful to ourselves, and to and and to make, and to have you know actually do something that makes an impact. I think that's it. Please, is anybody else around the, around the room? Um, if not, uh, sorry, sir. Thank you, David. Hi, um, I'm Amjad Salim. I work with Ainur at the International Federation for Across Recrescent. I manage the inclusion. Protection Engagement Unit uh, there, so very much the, the concept of inclusion is, is with what, what we're doing. And I just wanted to pick up on, on the previous question, and maybe not a question, but, but a statement. I think that there's a lot of conversation around responding when crisis happens, right? And, and how do we link up with local communities when, when there's a crisis? Um, and, but I think that what we're seeing now is that there's a lot of narrative around, around localization. There's a lot of narrative around around governments engaging with, with, with local communities, but everything seems to be happening in silos. And this conversation about localization is, rep is replicated in the humanitarian world about localization there, it's replicated somewhere else. I think that there needs to be greater perspective around how do we bridge that gap. And, I, and what I like about this room is that there's a number of players in this room that have access to th those different stakeholders, right? And I think that greater awareness needs to to happen to actually bring that. I mean, the Red Cross, of course, we have a network. We can we can convene. We can we have links to the to the local communities. Um, but I think that you know we can provide access into that space. But I think that there has to be that, that that realization and bridging that gap. I think for me is is key because as uh, Lord Harris said in his opening remarks, right, very somber, but. All the crises are interlinked, right? So if you have a, if you if you have a climate change crisis, it leads to displacement, it leads to migration, it leads to X, Y, and Z. So, if if the crisis and the cause of the crisis are all interlinked, then the solution has to be interlinked, right? And one thing that I'm very conscious when we talk about city planning and all of these things is we always talk about infrastructure, we always talk about security, we never talk about the human or the people, and I think we need to go back to that. And so perhaps this is a conversation we need to have during the day as well. Thank you. I, so, I certainly hope we, so we do have the conversation during the day and over coffee. And um, I think one of the things, um, as, 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 sorry, I didn't get your name, sorry. I'm young. Um, one of the things, for example, in America, um, FEMA, you look at Federal Emergency Management Agency, which of course is still living off the, um, the significant failures around Hurricane Katrina in 2005. 
But um, one of the things that FEMA have openly said now is that it's not their re not responsibility to deal with crisis. It's their responsibility to help communities deal with crisis. So they're not coming in and imposing a solution as they try to do in Hurricane Katrina, but they are trying to support the communities on the ground who, as Ina said, have absolutely, you know, they have the resources, they have the knowledge, they have the capability, they are resourceful, they are used, they're, cri they're as crisis ready as anybody. So I, cert I certainly think that, that coming down and again, the themes that are coming through to have ownership, local ownership, to have engagement, to be supported um, both from above in terms of resource um, and, and, and management to a certain extent, but also multi-jurisdictionally, transboundary in terms of communities around you. I think that's exactly that, those network building. Um, and certainly if you look from an academic perspective, there's a huge amount. Um, it's called, um, I've just, uh, I've just uh, as I said, I said don't say that because I've forgotten what it is, multi-organisation. Um, it's about multi-organisational networks. Um, in, in EMONs, emergent multi-organisational networks, and the truth of the word, uh, the truth of the matter is, whatever your crisis management plan says is going to happen, you work with the people around you, and it's your ability to create that. To use a word which I'm sure you've all been waiting for, interoperability, but you know to create that interoperability based on dealing with the reality on the ground and the reality of the environment. That is actually the critical issue in creating a response. It's something. Um, actually, we, as organ representing different organizations, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and accept that our rich impact is is limited compared to self-organizing communities. We due, due to unbelievably increasing connectivity, people are self-organizing. They're not waiting for us. I mean, it's it's a challenge for us, but for every organization, we might like to think that we will plan and you know, tell people and it will happen. No, it's not going to happen that way. Especially in a disaster time, what we find is that before we even start our assessments, people are already organized and Facebook groups, it's already happening. People emerging these informal networks are way, way more effective and immediately there, already there, there. But also, uh, maybe I don't know how many times more uh, in in the in the taking a role in the response or even other things, so we have to accept that that reality and prepare for it. That people always self-organize, but it's so much easier now, and we shouldn't think of it as a challenge. We should be just prepared that we have. What's our role? Maybe our role is you know like providing some evidence base, some thinking, but really understand and let the community self-organize and. Make it easier for them. That should be our role. I absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. But I also think we have a responsibility to, to bring the skills that we do have to support that. And you look at failures like Haiti, for example, or Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, in, in the hurricanes, where the local community was absolutely wiped out. And there was an incredible amount of desire from international agencies to respond government levels. But they didn't have the capability. They didn't have the actual logistical capability to deliver solutions on the ground and, and, and that was a I, I think that is a, a responsibility that, that one has within that you know we have to do what we can do within the environments and it's not going to be nicely on a Tuesday afternoon when we're sitting in a conference room but it's on the ground you know when the floodwaters are coming in anything else around the room last chance going once going twice I would like to thank I know, a fantastic presentation. I'd like to thank um, everybody here. Um, we are doing well. We're just a couple of minutes ahead of time. There is, I believe, coffee's outside. I hope this coffee's outside. Um, if we could be back at quarter past, please. Um, and please do talk to each other, network, um, and have a good time. So see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Real pleasure. That was lovely. Well done. Thank, thank you. you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I think you can hear me. No? Is it okay? It's okay? Uh, the yeah. Okay, I have to put it like this. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Huda Al Khazemi. Uh, I'm assistant professor in New York University, Abu Dhabi. I'm as well the director for Center for Cybersecurity in NYU AD. And today I'm going to be chairing the session, exciting session on AI and cybersecurity. So we have one hour and a half to bring you up to date and up to speed and a very controversial kind of conversation around AI and cybersecurity. So I'll just go first before I go into my bit of introducing the session and introducing the collaborators of the session. And then I'll go into in details into the session uh, formatting. Okay. Uh, so, I, besides running a center of research, an R&D of research on cyber security, I'm also uh, a serial <laughs> entrepreneur when it comes to starting R&Ds in my country and around the world, especially in MENA region, because I believe, and our community, because I'm also the president of Emirates Digital Association for Women, which is a non-for-profit organization that has been established under Ministry of Social Affairs in UAE, uh, to empower building opportunities for children, women, and the rest of the community, because uh, we don't believe in exclusivity. So based on the effort that we do here, we leverage the resources that we have in building equal, you know, equal communities across the, the globe, but precisely for the MIA region, Middle East and Africa, uh, in order to empower the communities that we see over there through building uh, R&Ds um, for social impact. Uh, across the spectrum, okay? That being said, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues here, uh, Dr. John Mark Rekali and Dr. Rafiq Shabouni. Um, they're both going to be with me in the session. Uh, so I'll start with John Mark uh, Rekali. John Mark Rekali is the head of Global Risk and Resilience at Geneva Center for Security Policy in Geneva. Uh, he's also a research fellow at King's London and a non-resident fellow in modern warfare and security trends uh, and security at Trends Research and, adv uh, ad and Advisory in Abu Dhabi. I think uh, Jamark will bring a lot on uh, weapon automation maybe. I'm putting pressure on you over there. Um, uh, he is a senior advisor for the AI initiative uh, for the future societies. Uh, at the Future Society at Harvard Kennedy School and an expert on autonomous weapon systems for the United Nations. In the framework of the governmental group of experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems, he's also a member of IEEE initiatives on ethics for, of autonomous in, uh, and intelligent systems and the co-chair of the NATO Partnership for Peace Consortium and Emerging Security Challenges Working Group. Prior to these appointments, Dr. Rickley was an assistant professor at the Department of Defense Studies of, King London's, uh, of, King, of King's College London and at the Joint Command and Staff College in Doha. He was also an assistant professor at the Institute for International and Civil Security at Khalifa University, back home in UAE, Abu Dhabi, and received his PhD uh, and Master in Philosophy in International Relation from Oxford University, UK, where he was a Barrow Scholar at Lincoln College. Welcome, Dr. John Mark. We're looking forward for your input in the session. And Dr. Rafiq Shabouni, uh, who is a cybersecurity and cryptography expert. Um, uh, he is an advisor and consultant in cryptography and cybersecurity. After obtaining his PhD in cryptography and information security at Ecole Polytechnique Federal Lausanne, de Lausanne in the Security and Cryptography Laboratory, he joined uh, the private bank uh, Pictet and Sai, sorry if I mispronounced that, in 2017, where he developed uh, and strengthened their cybersecurity defense posture. He lectured at uh, the University of Tartu and taught at APFL. During his PhD, he collaborated with the University of Tartu and was appointed as, the program, as a program committee member for the 19th Nordic Conference uh, on Secure IT Systems. He has been reviewer for several conferences in cryptology uh, and contributed to two 
patents, and his public uh, um, and his publications were oriented towards enhancing privacy protection. I also did cryptology and cryptanalysis, so we share that on common, Dr. Um, uh, Rafiq. Uh, but I do more into cryptanalysis and breaking systems rather than <laughs> building and enhancing privacy, and we will improve that <laughs> into the next session. Yes. So that's the focus for of my research group as well. We do research on avionic security uh, and uh, on um, autonomous car security and space security. Uh, we have to keep a diverse kind of uh, flavor, interdisciplinary flavor to what we do in cybersecurity. So I hope today when you leave this room, you will be enlightened on what cybersecurity and AI could do to our communities or what are, uh, are they actually doing to our current uh, status of affairs, but also I hope that you don't view cyber as the dark <laughs> hole uh, contributing to massive disasters or crisis around the world, because that's actually not the, uh, uh, you know, not the, uh, not the predominant factor that we want to portray over here. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the landscape uh, of uh, cybersecurity for 2019. And I'm going to also revisit and recap on a few of the AI initiatives that surfaced in the past few years and what is our intake as a community on it. Uh, so what is cybersecurity? If I want to run this small video and I ask you what, what is cybersecurity, I'm not sure if we have cybersecurity uh, in the room. Can you please, uh, you know, if, oh, we have a few of you here. But to the general public, how can we know what is cybersecurity? Thank you, Clementine. Can I put them on, like, oh, on full screen? It's finally finished. I'm ready to send you the world's first payment of Bitcoin. We're about to make history's first peer-to-peer -peer cashless transaction without a trusted third party. So I thought when I would Google what cybersecurity on YouTube, I would get like some kind of a dark image of something, someone attacking something. But that's not true. My life will be forever changed. If they find out who I am, they'll destroy me, my reputation, and my family. But I know it's worth the risk. Think of the human progress we'll make. The time has come to set the world free. Pretty dramatic, but I just want you to realize it's about cryptocurrencies, huh? It's not about, you know, inducing attacks on the world. Thank you so much, Clementine. Going back to the original presentation, crypto is not anymore the weaponizing of the digital kind of assets that exist in the world. It's also the fact uh, it's, it's an empowering feature that exists right now in financial industries, right? Because the video <laughs> previously was a portrait of, uh, of the person who initiated, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies. And now we have blockchains and blockchains are going to be used in smart cities to improve resilience. And we don't know what will happen since we are uh, doing our best in interconnecting all of these technologies together. Uh, did we do our job in just making sure that they're defense the right way? Okay, that's my job. Think. If we looked at the uh, the uh, what did we what do we know about investments in terms of uh, on cybersecurity? The investments in the field of cybersecurity are increasing definitely to over four billion dollars uh, an investment in 2016. But there is a huge anticipation that these investments will go in trillion of dollars in the next in in 2020. Um, and when there was a question around 2017, where would you place cyber risks? It landed as number three in the top five most risks to be addressed globally. Uh, but the North America have enlisted that as number one. And cleverly right now, I'm sure if we run on the same poll, we will get answers that says it is still number one because how big are we expected this to go? We know that by 2020, we're expecting to have over 50 billion devices in the world. And if we divided that by the cities, by the number of cities that we have and the number uh, of countries that we have in the world, that's over 11 million devices over the city, over uh, per city in the world. Um, so, and that's a lot. That's a lot of digitalization. 
are we ready in terms of cybersecurity, um, you know, status quo and technological development to address all of this? Um, we know that there is also venture capitalist investment model that exists for cybersecurity and it's growing. Um, we have significant rise of incidents. Uh, it's not only commercial incidents or uh, state-driven incidents or individualistic incidents. You could to see here that the victims, I don't know if this works, but the victims are in, in green and the offenders are in and blue, and it comes to a global kind of a game between countries and who are actually taking the front seat into uh, inducing, you know, damages over other countries in the world. And these these are incidents that have been reported and damages that has been reported um, uh, uh, per capital cost over different sectors. We see that they are mostly infrastructure. So we need to be really paying attention here. And healthcare took a hit in one of the most, I don't know if you remember the ransomware that took over Europe and took over most of the systems just because of a single patching system that happened out of a legacy system that Microsoft developed. And we cannot place a blame on technology. We cannot place a blame on just Microsoft. We should place a blame as well on the companies and the corporates that just took this as uh, for granted. We really need to have, what, thank you so much for bringing the fact that when we build solution, it should not be from the top down. It should be also from the circuit of information closer to the problem. Who are they? They are the people who are building and using these systems. So you need to at least have a minimalistic view of your own cybersecurity R&D that could react to this and help you in the future. Financial sector is also suffering in there. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but you could see that if we looked at the attack categories by region, we have, we have several uh, countries here which are suffering, but globally, ransomwares and crypto, crypto miners, uh, you know, are taking uh, the, the lead. So AI came into the equation in the World Economic Forum. I mean, it existed way before in the 70s. We know that. But it came into the forefront when it took a global kind of a reference and acknowledgement that we should f w work towards inducing industrial 4.0 kind of strategies and work towards having AI and work toward having countries. This is my previous statistics around uh, the number of devices by countries. Um, and this is what we would anticipate for countries. This is Finland in 2020 And thanks to the Department of uh, Innovation in Finland for releasing this video of Clementine could help us in viewing what would a city look like if we added an AI element to it in 2027, which is not far away from today. It's eight years down the road.
most of these technologies, they exist today. Autonomous ports, UAE, we have the uh, Shekzai port, it's, it's almost fully autonomous. Um, uh, I don't know about the healthcare part, but the line between future and reality is really blurry here. And uh, we really need to make sure that if technology is leaping 50 years into the future, cybersecurity, Bell, needs to leap as well 100 years into the future to address the possible risks that would exist here. It's a big thing. I think you've got the point out of this. Um, in eight years, you should all be in Finland. Because this is how it would look like, yeah. So that's the reality. Uh, the reality, and I mean, we all should give a homage to um, this character. I don't know if you know him. He's John McCarthy. He is one of the first uh, professors who uh, believed in game theory, and then he made a, a summer school that brought all of the people who does similar things around uh, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, game theory, and he called that uh, AI. Let's just call it a new name because we don't want one field to dominate this. Uh, so they called it AI in the 70s. Um, and it's a field that's heavily interdisciplinary. You could see it in robotics, you could see it in, in many other fields. Um, and it would it is definitely affecting our life today. Uh, and inducing, uh, pushing nations to go through building strategies on AI. We're building, we have the technologies and we're building the strategies, but are we doing our due diligence and making sure we are working holistically together on one table into addressing all of these issues? Because sometimes strategies are being built in disconnection of whatever the reality is. And I'm gonna give you a case study around this as well. Um, I'm sure you all knew, that. so this is one of the, I mean, I would say AI-induced kind of incidents, Cambridge Analytica, when they uh, collected user information out of Facebook and profiled users based on this, and then um, what did they do as well? Yes, they uh, used this poll, they did not, but so third party used with this poll to affect political biases, and, uh, this is again is something that exists in Europe at the moment and imposes over the world. It's again it's GDPR laws because we have in GDPR laws something that's c called the right not to be analyzed. So Facebook should not analyze you because you have something that says the right not to be analyzed, the right to be erased, the right to be great. I'm so happy with the GDPR law, but it's a great effort for, uh, from professionals and lawyers. But we don't have the technology supporting that. When you build a GDPR law, a law that's so powerful and making sure technology is ethical when it's being used, you need to also bring in the technology providers or innovators so they could build a proper bridge between these kind of regulations and the what exists in reality at the moment. I'm sure you know all of this. I'm sure you're all waiting for 2020. We have companies competing to release their first model of autonomous cars. It's not BMW anymore on the map, and it's not anymore Audi. We have Tesla, we have Google, we have Apple competing for their own autonomous cars. And if you ask the user um, in 2014 if they want to have, if they trust their privacy on car-related con card connectivity, you would have people in Germany trusting that. They trust that their information would be private, but China, no. They're not, they're a bit uh, skeptical about this. And uh, they, uh, Germany, they have a trust level, but at the same time, they have, they realize that they could get hacked. Okay, you see that there are 59% of them thinking that the, their information could be hacked if it's on a car. And we do have different models of autonomous cars at the moment. Some of our cars would have an autopilot when you park them. So, and the total driverless car is what we're aiming for. And as I said, that's a, that's a race that exists between different car, uh, you know, car manufacturers or non-car technology manufacturer, because it's amazing when you see, um, you know, I think Intel is gonna benefit out of all of these people because they will put their, uh, you know, um, chip industry everywhere on there, on the map. The investment is, is strikingly getting bigger and bigger for this domain, but uh, and this is a, 
This is a, an iconic picture. Do you know the people in the picture? So this is the previous Intel uh, CEO with the previous BMW CEO agreeing together in 2000, I think, 14 in San Francisco that they will bring the first model into the market uh, by 2020. There will be a, p a pilot and then going further from there. This is why, did you notice something happening last year? We had a race, right, between Tesla and other companies to bring in the first model and they pushed for the model, trial versions or non-trial versions actually. Uh, and we had incidents, incidents where human f people lost lives because of this. Um, and I would say it is a field that provides, uh, uh, can I run the second video please, Clement, uh, the third video, Clementine? It's a field where we, w it's a bit of graphic, so I apologize for it in advance, but it's a field where we have opportunities and challenges. Um, this is an Uber driver, and this is a report from The Guardian where this incident happened in uh, 2018, March 2018. Yes, please go ahead. So the driver put the car on autopilot. And that happened. Unfortunately, the lady did not survive. Thank you so much, Clementine, can we go? And that's the, the view of the driver. You, you can continue, just for them to see the view of the driver. They did not realize what's happening. They didn't have a reaction time. She actually did not have a reaction time. So the issue on the table at the moment, we have to build, uh, the gentleman in the back said something about responsible ethical technologies. And we do have to make sure that the people who are building these technologies are not racing blindly into pushing it on the market. And that's what happened in Dubai last year uh, the Road Telecommunication Authority in Dubai announced a, a world challenge for autonomous cars because they thought they wanted to do a test bed in the city of Dubai for autonomous cars. So said, okay, inventors of the world, whoever you are, research group in universities, professional people in the world, come into Dubai, let's see what you have. And I was part of the jury, so I was pleasantly surprised, actually not pleasantly surprised, I was extremely upset, that most of them did not address cybersecurity. And if they did, it was a single liner that I would not dare call a cybersecurity. So I walked into the room of the person who was just heading the uh, evaluation of this. I was like, you should fail all of these people because they have safety in mind, but they don't have cybersecurity in mind. And you cannot do that. You cannot say, yes, I would you know, consider passenger safety and I would do this on mixed traffic and I will do all of this, but I'm not considering cybersecurity. I'm not considering that. I was like, because I can prove to you that we could definitely do attacks on this. This kind of a car did not detect a passenger. And what I did while I was talking to him, and I was like, I would hope to see a category emphasized on all of these people who are participating in this challenge and they were lead manufacturers of autonomous cars as well in that challenge. It's like, I want cybersecurity to be emphasized. And I walked outside of the room and said, if he's not gonna do it, I'm gonna do a pilot study to prove to him that it's doable. So I had like a group of students, luckily because I have a center for cybersecurity and we have people who are enthusiastic about trying things. So we started with the problem, can we actually fool the system. Can we actually, um, this is another fatal crash by Tesla, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save you from the miseries in there. So <laughs> we looked at the internal car system, we looked how connected it is, what kind of technological, uh, electrical kind of units do we have? Can we tamper with this? The answer was yes, we built a threat model, we can tamper with most of these models. And what we, what we did choose is something related to the AI. We said like, this system will rely on capturing images and then classifying these images and detecting the problem in these images. And then we said, okay, out of this, we have 100% uh, kind of knowledge that we could maybe try with a machine learning algorithm. And that's what we did. We built an adversarial learning example where through this example, the car, perceived a certain image. So we tried to induce uh, faults in these images. I would call them progressive incremental faults uh, in certain pixels of these images until a stop sign was perceived as a go sign by the car. 
and it went and twerked. But we tried this on simulations like Carla and other simulations that exist in the market, and we went back to the community to, to the, and we publicized most of it. We're publishing a paper about it currently. Um, but we also went back to RTA in Dubai and told them, what did you do for your global challenge? I said, cybersecurity now is like mandatory requirement in here. And by them placing it, lucky enough, other, it took a resonance around the world because people in, in the UK and people in the USA and people in other parts of the world who are aspiring to build similar test beds, they're considering at the moment having cybersecurity as a mandatory element to be considered on these issues. So when we build cybersecurity uh, system, we look for resilience. And resilience to us is about the fact that you have to include people in. You have to not just consider the data, but consider measurable models and build the policies and build all kind of a possibility for stakeholders to be together. And the people means the ethical components, technologies we want to have. Smart cities does not mean an abundance of technologies and, or a technology dump. It means smart, resilient city to all of us. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Now I will leave the floor uh, to John Mark to start his conversation. Please, John Mark. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to GCSP. Uh, my name is Jean-Marc Rickley. I'm a head of global risk and resilience here. And um, what I will talk in the next 20 minutes is about how intelligence can be used in uh, misuse and used in a malicious way. So uh, as a caveat for the beginning, this technology will provide enormous benefits for societies, no doubt. The problem is that uh, very often, a technology that is developed for specific purposes could be repurposed. So uh, in the next 20 minutes, what I would like to do is to look at where we are now and what, where we might go uh, in the future. And the point here is that the development that we are witnessing these days are uh, all have an exponential, exponential uh, curve in terms of development. And so I would like to give you a few examples. So if you look at data generation. For artificial intelligence to work, you need two things. You need the engine and you need the fuel. The fuel are data and the engine is computing power. So in terms of data uh, generation, this was what we produced in one minute um, in 2017, especially pay attention to the number of uh, internet data consumed uh, every minute, which is about uh, 2.6 million in 2017. Now, as uh, Hoda already showed, more and more we are connecting devices um, to uh, different server, to the, to the internet. It is foreseen that by 2030 we'll be at 50 billion. Some figures are even 10 times more, 500 billion connected devices by 2030. And that creates a lot of uh, data. As you can see here, now in 2019, in terms of data uh, uh, used every minute, we moved from 2.6 million to 4.4 million uh, gigabyte in a span of two years. So here what you can see is that we are generating an awful lot of uh, data. And this data, um, information could be drawn upon. So we are creating more and more data. We also are uh, building up computing power. And this graph is probably three days old. Uh, it's been published by uh, a, a think tank in the United States, and it shows you two things. First, um, this is not working, but I'll show you. This, you have two lines. You have the first line here, and bear in mind this is a log logarithmic scale. So you have this line here that shows you, that represents the growth of computing power that is the so-called Moore slow, which tells you that it doubles every 18 months. And you have a second line starting in 2012, which goes much steeper. And here, basically, this is improvement of computing power through uh, algorithmic uh, development. And what we can see here is that the doubling power in this second curve is three months and a half, which means that the more slow since 2012 to 2018 improved by a factor of 12. In six years, CPUs were 12 times more powerful. But in the same period, with development of 
algorithm, this uh, uh, the, the growth in terms of computing power was multiplied by a factor of 300,000. So the point here I want you to make, and uh, can just uh, switch to this, is that these algorithms are stupid because they are trained for a spe specific task. But if you are pitted against an algorithm that has been trained for a very spe specific task, then you will hard have a very hard time. The human record in solving... Solving in three, two, four one. Oh that was yeah. an algorithm of frequent flight for human being. Yeah, can we turn to... So, what I want you to show here is that this algorithm can only solve Rubik's Cube. It cannot do anything else. But he does it very efficiently. And so, if it ends up that your task, your job, is in competition with a machine, your chances to win over the machine are uh, very slim. So, and we can see that in a lot of different uh, uh, factors and uh, area. For instance, you know, the CAPTCHA that is there to actually identify you as human being, if you look at error rate of uh, <laughs> human beings versus uh, those by a machine learning uh, algorithm, you can see that's not a very effective way to guarantee that it's a human that is trying to penetrate your uh, website. A similar um, experience were con was conducted uh, where you had a bunch of lawyers that had to review non-disclosure agreements and look for mistakes. And the speediest lawyer did it in 51 minutes, and the average success rate of human beings were 85%. When algorithm, an algorithm that was trained for to do that did it, success rate 94% in 26 seconds. Which means that it's not just blue-collar worker with, who are at risk. It's basically also white-collar worker and all of us. So, what we're witnessing now is that we are slowly translating our physical life into a digital life. Each time you are generating data, you transfer, you translate your physical behavior into a digital behavior. And so, in the digital world, we are witnessing this exponential growth. So, in terms of AI, for instance, you might remember when Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue in 1997, you have a measure of state-space complexity, and so the game of chess had a measure of complexity of 10 to the power of 47. AlphaGo, a few years ago, a Chinese board game, had a level of complexity of 10 to the power of 170. StarCraft II, a game where you have to raise up your own armed forces, ally with other uh, players to destroy and conquer the world, up to 100 players, had a level of 10 to the power of 1685. And if you look at that, these, have, these games have all been defeated by machine. And the latest one being StarCraft II, earlier in January, January this year. So what we can see is that the level of complexity increases, but the time to solve these issues decreases. And this is characteristic of... Oh yeah, and this is... <laughs> sorry about that. And this is characteristic of um, uh, the, uh, an exponential growth. For a very long time you see nothing, and suddenly you have what we call an explosion. So, what is the problem with that for all of you, and not just for the military or people in security, is that if you face with something that has an exponential growth, we are biologically wired to think in, in a linear way, and government uh, um, bureaucratic uh, policy and uh, makes us basically very difficult to actually think in exponential terms. And so, if you evolve in a linear way, but you have facing an exponential growth, the more time passes, the more irrelevant your organization or you are becoming. And I'll just give you an example of this concept of exponentiality. This video uh, here, you can just press on, uh, uh, yeah. This video was the first deep fake video that was uploaded on the net in December 2017. Right, it's not working, okay. That's all right. All right, doesn't matter. So what you see here uh, uh, on this video, you can see that you have an actress. This is a scene from a porn movie. And this actress will turn her head, and you can see some hesitation when she turns her head. So basically what happened, someone merged the face of Gaudi Godat, the Israeli uh, actress, to a porn movie. 
And so, at the time, December 2017, experts were asking AI, how long would it take for this technology to democratize? And they said between one to two years. A month and a half later, this video uh, came, uh, came up as well. Is this one working? Again, this is a deepfake video taken from a porn movie. Again, and this is Jessica Alba. And this time, you can see no uh, hesitation when she turns her head. But worse than that, those who developed this video also created the application where anyone could use to merge any digital support. And so this technology was invented in 2014. The first commercial application was end of 2017. This is called a uh, generative adversarial network. What is common between all these people is that they do not exist. They have all been generated by an algorithm that has been fed with pictures of celebrities. This is what they came up with. So this technology, 2014, this is where we were. And this is where we are, we were last year. So a study was published in September about the state of deepfake. And we'll have a public discussion on 27th of November with the author of this, um, this report here at uh, GCSB, so I invite you to come. So this study shows that there are now more than 14,000 deepfake videos online. 96% of the victims of this video are women. And they have been seeing this video more than 130 million times already. So as soon as you have such a technology that is created, you have the ecosystem that is created, where you have website, where you can find information, you can basically send your pictures that you want to merge with something, or even better, you can customize for $25 the deepfake video you want. And so these are already some implications in terms of security. These are two examples taken earlier this year where there's been this article where the Chinese government could actually use this deepfake to modified uh, satellite pictures that will not affect great powers, but international organization, NGOs that relies on open source uh, satellite picture could actually be affected by that. And this quite worrisome uh, experiment conducted by researcher in Tel Aviv that hack a medical imagery center and use deepfakes to modify the content of the image of MRI by adding tumor, removing tumor and then they were presenting to radiologists, and 100% of the radiologists were fooled by this. And since then, uh, uh, deepfake have been used to mimic also the voice. You may have seen in the newspaper a few months ago, a German company was full, uh, where an employee of the company received a phone call by the CEO asking him to wire $300,000 uh, to uh, euros to a specific uh, bank account. And basically, what you had here is someone is a, was a uh, inter, um, uh, voice uh, that was developed by a, a, uh, an artificial an algorithm that was reproducing the, uh, the voice, the tone of um, the, the, uh, the CEO of the company. So here this is a problem that is structural, is that people tend to uh, believe what they already believe in, psychological biases, which means that truth has a structural advantage over uh, lies over, over truth, up to uh, six times faster and uh, spread 100 times uh, more in terms of the reach. Obviously, we are more and more uh, falling into the trap of AI being used for social control purposes. China is the most ahead in the field by uh, developing a technology that uh, is not only analyzing what you're doing online, but also your offline behavior through CCTV cameras, facial recognition. And this has implication because you can be identified very easily. You don't have to go to China to do that. I was in two countries for the last months and a half, or two months, where i never been before. I was in Sri Lanka and in Ukraine, and people took pictures of me and uploaded them on Facebook. And less than 10 minutes after they uploaded the picture on Facebook, Facebook had picked up my face and sent me notification. You probably show up on this picture or on this picture. And in both cases, they were right. So for Facebook, my face, has no secret. Now, if Facebook would turn one day uh, as, I don't know, a, uh, or someone would steal the algorithm, the data of Facebook, and uh, turn into a authoritarian uh, regime, I might be in trouble. You, know, you, you as well, probably. So, 
Will it improve? Not really, because again, we are generating more and more data. Amazon has uh, launched last year its first microwave powered by Alexa, so you can talk to your microwave. As soon as they did that, that was the most sold microwave on the website. And so they created the microwave 2.0 earlier in September this year, where they released a new version, but also with new uh, products. And so what we are creating here is we are creating an empire of data, and it is create issues. You might uh, have seen this map, this hot map of Strava, which is a fitness tracker application that will uh, tell you where Strava users are using this application. Less than 24 hours after this map was published in January 2018, I scroll some Twitter accounts and basically this is what you can find. You could find that some people uh, identify this building, which is the Pentagon. You can see that there are some tunnels going underneath. This is the French secret military base in Madama in Niger. This is a, ten, uh, a tunnel in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan. This is a CIA outpost in Mogadishu. This is the guard patterns of Turkish soldier in Membij in Syria. And this is even better, an Italian pilot who uh, we know already who he is, which unit he belongs to and where he is. So in terms of the digital footprint that we leave behind, this information is key. And that empowers individuals. And we can already see some very clear implication. Snowden stole two million documents to the US government, but you go down the road here and at the Rue de Lausanne, and this guy uh, stole, stole 150,000 uh, uh, files of HSBC customer that went then sold to the French authorities and contributed to France putting pressure on Switzerland to scrap banking secrecy. Behind that, you have one individual that stole the data. We talked about that at Versailles AI. I don't want to go into that. In terms of cyber, also, what you have to understand is once the genius is out, it's out. There's no way you can bring it back. You cannot stop the proliferation of code. And this is one of the, few, uh, the first uh, 3D printed gun that was uh, done, this was in 2011. And since then, people have actually uh, developed other uh, components of uh, weapons. This is the first 3D printed gun by a, ma a gun manufacturer. This gun was 3D printed by the German uh, far-right extremist that launched grenades and shot at uh, the synagogues in Halle a month and a half ago. So he did not use this gun, but he had freedom printed guns in his house and he brought one with him. Now, in terms of how things could develop, well, the issue, what you could do with AI, you can basically bring together units that will behave as a whole very differently than, the, than units. This is called uh, swarming. And we start to see clear implication of swarms, not the least the Islamic State, for instance, use uh, this technique in uh, Mosul, Battle of Mosul, up to 30 soldier, Iraqi soldiers were lost their life a week during the Battle of Mosul. They were attacked by drones that have been weaponized by ISIS, and these drones had been bought on the market. And since then, we've seen other examples, the latest being the attack against Saudi Aramco by 21 drones and cruise missiles that led instantaneously a drop of 5% in, uh, in a, uh, the, the stock of um, um, oil being uh, produced. So, um, I don't know if I have time to show this thing. Uh, uh, probably, um, yes, can you, is this working? Okay, so th this video is uh, called uh, Slaughterbrot, and the idea here is just to show you, it's a, it's a fictional video. But here what you can see is you have a, uh, a micro drone that is being launched and basically is equipped with two grams or three grams of explosive and that will basically kill people by exploding uh, the charge to the front head. This is fictional. That was created by an advocacy group to ban killer robots. But this experiment shows and all the technologies that is shown there, you already have the technologies out there. Uh, Armour Swiss, the Swiss DARPA company, did the experiment. Two grams of shared explosive on any scale is lethal 100% of uh, the time. And this is what you start to have uh, commercially available in terms of drones. The latest, one of the latest in 2019 is Russia uh, equipping AK-47 with wings. 
they sell that as anti-drone uh, weapon, but obviously you can probably repurpose quite easily this thing. And uh, a company in China will sell you 10 drones that are being trained in Swarm, each equipped with a different weapon. This is our deal. I let uh, Rafik talk more about the cyber domain, but the point here is that we are giving more and more power to individuals, and with the assistance, the help of um, um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we are multiplying potential power of people, which makes that technology these days has become a surrogate. Has become a surrogate not only for armed forces or traditional countries, but also for non-state actors. And increasingly, technology could be used to do arm by as a, um, as a surrogate. I will conclude by uh, mentioning this. This is not just artificial intelligence that is disruptive. This is five technology. This is synthetic biology, quantum computing, nanotechnology, and neurosciences. And what we, st what we start to see is a convergence between these different technology, not the least between neuroscience and AI, where more and more we see the concept of human machine teaming. This person is quadriplegic. She cannot move any part of her body. They put sensor on her skull, and after half an hour of training, she could fly just with her thoughts, an F-35, which is the latest fighter aircraft developed by the United States. And so research has been conducted in trying to pair the human brain with the machine. You might have seen that Facebook bought in last September Control Lab, a neuroscience company that does exactly that. The idea of uh, Zuckerberg is uh, to pair your brain directly with the website. So to conclude, again, these technology all have fantastic potential. The problem is that some of them are really easy to uh, repurpose. And what we see is that unlike physical activities where proliferation is being slowed down by the fact that there are transaction costs, once it's in the digital domain, these transaction costs are almost uh, eliminated and things proliferate both across states but also to non-state actors and individuals. So what is very important? Foresight is very important. In all of your organization, you'll need more and more foresight. So a good, good thing here at the GCSP, Emily uh, is uh, the, the head of foresight here. Uh, you will need that kind of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, skills because you need to be able to process possible future. Because at the speed at which technology develop, when it has exploded, it's too late. You already need to think ahead what uh, will uh, happen. And so it's not just about foresight, but then it's also about crisis management. You have to put into your uh, companies processes that are able to deal with that. And so we need to shift our mindset, and Hoda uh, said it before, from a defense perspective to resilient perspective. You will be attacked. The problem is how fast can you recover? And therefore, you need to first understand <coughs> What are the central gravities of your organization? And then once they are identified, create processes to harden this center of gravity, but also to make them redundant so that if anything happens, you are not being caught of guard. Thank you for that. Rafik. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you all. So now in this part of the uh, session, we'll explore a bit what happens regarding the cybersecurity domain. We will look a bit in towards the dependency that we now have, the implications that AI um, has brought into the space, as mentioned a bit with uh, Jean-Marc, and we will see what are the new paradigms in the cyber security domain? Because now with all these new technologies, things have changed and we'll see how. We'll also uh, look a bit into the quantum uh, field and what are we to expect for the future? And also the new dependencies introduced by distributed ledger technologies that Hoda mentioned a bit uh, before. So these will be the gloomy part, and at the end we will try to bring a bit of hope on how to address these issues.
because it's good to present bad things, it's better to present what we can do about them. This is how we can be resilient for 2030. Cyber dependency. Science without conscience is the soul's perdition. <clears throat> if we are bringing new technologies in our everyday life and we are being more and more dependent towards it, these needs always to be thought on how it could be refabricated, repurposed. Is it safe or not? If I give a knife to a small kid, I need to make sure that he's not going to do bad things with it. It's the same with any type of technology. And we are more and more using cyber technologies due to the ease of use without really thinking, without stepping back on what could go wrong. If we look at the new payment systems, now we can simply go to a store in China without taking any card, without doing anything, taking the good, look at the camera and walk out and the payment is done. <coughs> this is super user friendly. This is great. With my phone, I can go in Switzerland to a shop, swap it to the terminal and pay directly. This is nice. What could go wrong here? If I'm in the train with my phone and somebody pass with the appropriate device, he can completely siphon my card. Okay, you'll tell me that's a limit of 40 francs, but this is a limit per terminal. I can reiterate that. So now we really need to think that with all the new IoT devices, as Jean-Marc said, with the fitness devices, you can track military-based uh, locations. Uh, with mobile applications, you can siphon your contacts. You can siphon your messages, secret messages, confidential messages. Going more deeper with electronic identities and healthcare, now we're going to touch on the identity of citizens. If you take the example of Estonia, they are one of the countries that are the most advanced in e-identity and e-gov solutions. They have e-identities built in their citizens' ID since 10 to 15 years ago. The problem rose a couple of years ago when the cryptography that was inside their chip was badly set. So the private keys could be um, guessed from their public keys. And it's a policy, it it's a right in Estonia that all the public keys of their citizens is publicly available because their identities, electronic identities, can be used to sign contracts, to vote, to pay, to have their healthcare folder inside and to go to pharmacy to retrieve the drugs they need. When you are able to find the private keys of your citizens, you can do drastic damages. You can connect to their e-banking, take their money, prescribe them the wrong prescription. If the pharmacist doesn't check and blindly give away the drugs, that can be a problem. With all the interconnection to the networks, we have seen with the case of WannaCry how this impacted the healthcare in UK. We are more and more dependent on communications and not just the citizens, also our critical infrastructures, whether it's police enforcement, uh, military enforcement, name it. Uh, when your traffic lights is coordinated and linked to internet, then things can go sour pretty badly. So when we think technology, cyber technology, we always need to have this cyber security thought in our head because when things go wrong, it's quite bad. So what about AI? 
We have seen all these bad things happen already in the cyberspace. AI is going to introduce an exponential growth to these attacks. Here we see a picture of the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge in 2016, where DARPA invited participants to produce systems that will attack systems. It's no longer humans behind the attacks, now it's machines. And in 2018, IBM developed what is called Deep Locker, <coughs> which is an attacking system automated, augmented by artificial intelligence to hide itself, gain foothold into networks, achieve persistence, that means that even security um, softwares won't be able to detect it and find it, and wait silently. Wait for what? Wait for the right victim. Once the right victim has been identified by a fingerprint, by facial recognition, by voice recognition, then the attack starts. So this is not science fiction. This is in production last year. It has been foreseen already 10 years ago with a small comics from Japan. I'll, if you can pass the video. And you'll see that already 10 years ago, they anticipated that cyber technology, when it's pushed in our eight daily life without conscious on repercussion of cyber threats, can be a drastic, uh, can have a drastic turn off event. <laughs> Oz is up and running again. The inconvenience continues for at least 2 million users across Japan whose online accounts have been rendered unusable. The Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications is advising against Oz use on, until the source on. of this problem has been found and dealt with. It's because we... It's because we haven't beaten Love Machine yet. Exactly. Love Machine? Like the song or what? It's an account-stealing AI. <laughs> That's one mean-looking avatar. No question, that one's a bad apple. This thing caused all that trouble today. The news shows aren't mentioning him. It's only a matter of time, Sensei. The online world is huge, and people who have seen him are starting to band together. If we can work as a team and pool our info, we should be able to beat him. <laughs> That's very kumbaya, but it's not going to work. Oh, yeah? How do you know? Fair question. Well, because... Love Machine was programmed by me. <gasps> you created Love Machine? Yeah. I developed an AI, tailor-made for hacking. Ah! did was very simple. I infused a program with a desire to learn. It has a major Jones for knowledge. Then the military brass dropped in and offered to buy it for some serious coin, provided I let them give it a test run. I never figured they'd use Oz as their petri dish. The results are pretty damn amazing. It's operating on encoded instinct, gathering information and user privileges around the globe. Love machines as strong as a million man army now. See, that's why you can't defeat him. Do you know how many... <laughs> oh, yeah, you can go back to the slide. So Oz in this uh, science fiction 10 years ago was a system, online system, that would regroup all activities of your daily life, including healthcare, where there was coordination between patients and their doctors to monitor the healthcare of the patients and to tell to the doctor if they need to intervene or not. And if there was an alert, to call ambulances. Police forces to go and secure locations. Um, <coughs> fire, um, 
um, yeah, fire brigade to go to location where they needed to uh, intervene. Communications, e-banking, all your daily activities was in this virtual uh, reality. Um, that was science fiction 10 years ago. It is now reality now with DeepLocker. That was thought to be programmed by a human. It was programmed by a human last year, by humans. In the future, it will be programs that will do it. Now more and more we are developing algorithms to develop other algorithms. So science without conscience is the last of is the soul's perdition. When we are dealing with artificial intelligence, there's a real need for ethics to be introduced in them. And nowadays, this is something that we are completely lacking. Small notes on deep fakes, uh, additional notes. Um, now that we can fake and reproduce the voice and facial uh, visuals of people, we can full authentication systems. If you are basing your authentication systems on your voice or only on your face, well, too bad. It's no longer an authentication method. And this typically for private banks is a major threat because, or banks in general, when they have the obligation to call back their clients to make sure that they indeed are the one who um, created a transaction, with faking their voice, how can they be sure? They no longer can use that method and they will have to think of another method in order to secure their callbacks. So we will see more and more fraud cases within the banking financial institution nowadays. So what is the new shift of parting here? Before, when we were creating cybersecurity, cyber defenses, we were taking the assumption that the attackers were outside of our walls. We would create walls, firewalls, to protect our networks, to avoid them to attack us. Nowadays, this is completely outdated. We go with the assumption that the attacker is already inside our network. And this is even more true with the emergence of AI um, augmented attacks. <coughs> and the problem that cyber security is facing is that they, in terms of protection, always need to protect against all attacks all the time. In a cyber attack, they only need to succeed once. If they fail 99% of the time, that's no problem. If they have only one successful attack, that's enough for them. <coughs> we have seen AI augmented attacks with DeepLocker, which is really, really sophisticated. But it's not necessarily the case that we need to go up to that extent of sophistication to succeed in an attack. Sometimes it's a lot easier to have an insider, whether it's malicious insider or curious or even accidental, it will enable, enable the success of an attack. Also, in parallel of AI augmented attack, now the new trend is to go through third party providers in order to succeed in an attack. It's a lot easier to go through a weaker third party that is providing solutions to our target instead of trying to go directly to the target, which is highly secure. And we have seen that case with the NotPetya uh, ransomware, where a um, company that is producing um, accountability software has been hacked, and the update of the software has been shipped to all its customers. So when we are trying to deal with all these types of attack, we, in terms of cyber defenders, <coughs> study attackers in terms of their kill chain. So it, it's, this is the process where they go through in order to develop an attack. 
nine, eight years ago, we had a very simplistic view. Two years ago, we had to change this view to include more sophisticated attack. So we are here. I think that in the couple coming years, this will need also to change to include new AI augmented capabilities in terms of gaining persistence and exploiting persistence. So in terms of cyber defense, in terms of cyber defender, now, not in 2030, we are already late and we are already uh, losing the game. Looking at the future, what is up for us? Quantum. Quantum supremacy is the potential ability that quantum computers will surpass the, our classical computers. Um, in order to achieve that, they use what we call specific qubits. It's the technology behind quantum computing. <coughs> and this technology will be able to completely break uh, the public key cryptography. So when you hear about public and private keys, this will be completely broken with quantum computers. So it's a major threat because public key cryptography is used constantly in our daily life, in our payment systems, in our voting systems, in our um, communication security, in our critical infrastructure, etc. The first, state sol the first solid state quantum computer, quantum processor, was released in 2009, was achieved in 2009. And nowadays we are around 72 cub stable qubits. So this will give you the, tr the trend on how things are going. In order to break our current public key cryptography, which is, so let's say 1024, nowadays it's a bit more, you need something of the order of 2,050 qubits. That means that nowadays we are still safe. For how long? Probably not in 2030. I doubt it personally. This is my personal view. Uh, but it's something that we need to keep in mind that at some point the, it will be a reality. So when we are producing data now if this data needs to be secured in the long future, we need to have this threat model in mind. The new cyber dependency, distributed ledger technologies. So you probably, you certainly must know it by the cryptocurrencies, right? Uh, Bitcoin, everybody has heard about Bitcoin. Um, so these are technology that is strongly tied to cryptography. Um, and actually not, well, there is public key cryptography, but it's actually implemented in a way that it's hidden. So it's typically bitcoins are roughly secured against quantum computers, uh, which is a bit ironic. Um, so DLTs manage the birth of unregulated currencies where there is a total absence of international regulations that allows the possibility to hide, to remain private, to remain anonymous, which is a good thing as a first thought. And when you really think about the implications, it means fiscal evasion, money laundering, money embargo circumventions. So if you take the case of North Korea, they are able to circumvent their uh, monetary embargo through Zcash or through Monero. And nowadays, the real problem is the lack of awareness of the public. This is why DLTs hasn't been really expanded. Um, the one thing that I ask you to keep in mind when thinking about cryptocurrencies is the issue with the knowledge of the private key. If you know the private key of someone, that means the underlying assets are yours to take, whether it's cryptocurrencies or identities. If identities or healthcare information is put in a DLT, 
and you manage to get to know the private key, that means you can do whatever with the underlying asset. If it's cryptocurrencies, okay, you win some money, great. Money is replaceable. If it's an identity, an identity is not replaceable. And the person can completely lose control of its entire life due to an identity theft. And there is no backwards. So this needs to be carefully thought when institution wants to push identities inside DLT technologies. It also brings the potential to replace national currencies that are in perdition uh, or that they want more um, diverse solution. Um, Tunisia is actually introducing the e-dinar, which is completely in the DLT uh, field. Mm. Okay. So what's next? What can we do with all this bad news, right? We need to prepare. We need to be cyber resilient. Okay, we don't see. Yeah, there's a problem. So you have to imagine here a temple with three pillars. <laughs> So in order to build the foundation of cyber resilience, you need three pillars. The first one is to manage identity, identity access management, for instance. In order to secure your space, you need to know who are the participants, whether they are machine, individuals, um, where they are, what are their rights, what are their duties. Once you know who, you need to know what. You need to introduce the, the management of the life cycle of the data, of the services that you are offering. Where do you store the data? For how long? For what use? Once you have these both pillars comes the zero trust model, where in this new type of architect IT architecture model, you'll be able to um, go with the assumption that your network is completely exposed. That implies micro-segmentation, <coughs> contextualization of the devices to know where the devices are, which devices is it, is it a simple IoT with absolutely no certificates, and it's someone with a, 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 a jumper running with a, its IoT in a basement, in a military basement. Or if it's, an, if it's a highly secured compu computer with certificate and uh, multi-factor authentication, depending on these devices, you won't grant the same access. So the zero, zero trust model allows you to bring forth uh, these new type of resilience. Regarding quantum cryptography, we are, well, the research, uh, the academia research is already working on post-quantum cryptography and there are already algorithms and alternatives to uh, existing classical algorithms. Currently, they are le less efficient than the present ones because they are not adapted to our classical computers. So alternatives are already uh, being developed. Um, <coughs> We also gain resilience by contingency plans. So it's always a good idea to think what could go wrong and how can we handle them, um, how we can handle breaches. And there's also a real need for the community to push forward international regulations, whether it's on AI or on DLT. Some nation states have introduced their national regulations. For instance, in Switzerland, in Switzerland, we have a national regulations on uh, cryptos. And now we need to see the same uh, regulations on the international level. Last but not least, ah, we don't see it. We need international standards for risks and, um, and like, yeah, for, for mitigating risk and controls. And there are a lot of different tools that we can use um, to enforce cyber resilience. Thank you for hearing me. And if you have questions, we'll address them in the panel.
John Mark and uh, Vic, if you'll join me in the panel. I think you've heard from all of us amazing and stimulating briefs so far around uh, cyber and AI. I think we managed to terrify you a little bit. We're very sorry for this. I think maybe for the next 15 minutes, you would help us lighten up the mood a bit. <laughs> so I'd like to open the floor for all of you so we could hear from you. Can you please start by introducing yourself, where are you from, and then leading with the question. Hour, hour and a half. Um, uh, I'd like to make a couple of points. The first is I'd just like to question the, uh, the assumption that AI, this technological complex complexification, will continue. Um, and I say this in the first sense that Complexify that complexification lives within a global ecosystem of supply chains, of financial systems, of economies of scale, of social peace, and their integration. So the more and more complex things are, the more and more their dependencies are outside merely the pure AI bits. Um, as we've already been introduced this morning, um, we're living in a world that's highly correlated, highly synchronized, and hitting multiple stressors that can interact through it. It's a very vulnerable system to a growth of stressors and their interactions. That will mostly, most likely shatter that sort of technological complexity uh, that one assumes is there to research, uh, finance, and deploy all of this sort of thing. So I'm just putting a question mark over the assumption of its continuation, certainly by 2030. It lives in the same technological or systems universe that the rest of society does. And uh, the second thing I'd like to sort of point out is uh, that uh, one of the things I saw I was in earlier in the year in uh, Sweden to see their contingency planning. They're amongst the best in the world. And uh, I came to the extraordinary, I've never seen it before, I was going into shops and they wouldn't accept my money. Um, and they wanted everything electronic, which caused me all manner of you know, problems anyway. Uh, the point is, when everything goes onto the electronic system, money or what, what um, and there is a systemic failure of some sort, which is becoming more likely for the reasons we've talked about, there is no fallback. There is no physical cash. You can end up amplifying a crisis, or if a crisis goes on, it sort of ha undermines your ability to get some sort of trading system going again. In other words, that sort of putting dependency takes away diversity and fallback and resilience, and uh, it becomes a risk. The final point uh, is, again, a broader question. Um, I don't know if people here or catastrophists know The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter. And in that book, eloquently lays out uh, how societies add complexity to solve problems. They have returns, things they bring, and they have costs. This ev evolution in complexity here, it has costs, obviously some in energy and materials that are acquired that are a feature of complexification. Um, but others in, we've seen it, the systemic the risks to critical infrastructure, which are huge potential costs, and um, what it's doing to our ability to operate and cooperate as a society, huge costs. What do we get in return? I'm very grateful that that woman can move an F-16 or whatever she can do, or that there's some more efficiencies in driving. But it seems to me a classic case of humans becoming bewitched by their shiny new toys. But in fact, the benefit is small and the risks are enormous. And I don't expect us to stop, but I do, yeah, I, I expect it will fail when other systems fail. Um, and yeah, so I'll leave it at those three points. Thank you. I'll address the first question. <laughs> um, so what about AI? We will see a continuous development and a continuous arm race on that. Um, my answer is yes, sadly. 
it's becoming a geopolitical strategical uh, uh, plan. If you hear about the President Putin, he clearly said that a, the ones who will have the most advanced AI technology will be the rulers of tomorrow. So when you have the President of Russia that is openly saying that we are in an arm race on AI, sorry, it's, there is no turning back. It's, it will be exactly like the nuclear uh, powers. Um, we will see it stabilized only after major disasters and when the superpowers will say, okay, we have played a bit with the devil, we need to calm down a bit. And sadly, this is something that we'll need to prepare for. And cyber resilience is the countermeasure for that. Yeah, for, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I was expecting you to give us a more optimistic perspective, but actually, your view is actually <laughs> even gloomier than ours. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and the limitation, uh, I agree with you. Um, is it sustainable? Probably not under uh, current condition. The, the graph I show you about uh, computing power, uh, we've managed to, to reach this, uh, this increase uh, lately. Uh, we, when we say we, it's just a few companies only because they have the power to have data centers that are enormous and they, have a, uh, they could actually pair CPUs uh, together. The other limitation is physical also in terms of energy generation, energy storages, because energy storages, we don't see the same growth pattern as in this technology. But if you look at the, the Moore's law, the Moore's law has been announced that uh, constantly in history and humans have developed ways to move beyond the physical limit. In terms of CPUs, the limitation is obviously about the number of transistors you can put uh, on a chip, which is five uh, nanomillimeters. We are about seven or eight mi nanomillimeters now. Right, but uh, some people are already uh, looking at you know developing new technology in terms of genetics or uh, or, or in genes. So you know there is no limitation to uh, uh, human ingenuity. The question, the second part of your question, which has to do more with um, fallback plan. the fallback plan and why are we going that way? I agree with you that if you look long term. And the argument you put forward is also an argument that was put forward by a philosopher called Ulrich Beck, who wrote The Risk Society. And in his book, basically what he highlighted was that postmodern societies are characterized by dependency on technology that creates their own vulnerabilities. But in order to uh, fix these vulnerabilities, we are creating new technologies that will create new vulnerabilities. So it's a race, if you want, a constant race to, um, uh, to potential problems. But what you have to understand, in this even though we are all aware that potentially this technology could have detrimental uh, effect on us. There is an asymmetry between your short-term interest and long-term loss. And your short-term benefit is very big. The fact that every day I do Google searches is providing me with instant return, instant information. But I know by doing that, I do two things. I improve Google's algorithm and I give information about me that can be used in different ways by Google. So because of this asymmetry and because these technology and these companies have built in a system, for instance, the way you refresh your feeds on Facebook and other social media, have you already <coughs> uh, thought about why you, you do this movement? You do this movement because this guy wanted to know what is, which movement is addictive and they went to Las Vegas. And basically they look at slot machine. And when you're in a slot machine, you do this. And so the, 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 the movement that you do on Facebook, other and your application is exactly the one, because it's addictive. So basically, the, there are embedded system that makes you stay on this thing. So if we cannot address the problem of short-term benefits towards long-term loss, we doom. And we can see that already in global warming. All of us know that with current uh, development in the way we consume energy, we'll not be able to, uh, to survive. But your short-term interest in taking your car is much higher than uh, the fact that in 100 uh, years, we might all die because of global warming. Thank you so much. That was very enlightening. What was your third question? Sorry.
I think what we need to do, sorry, I'll just add to the remarks of my colleagues here. What we need to do is we really need to we need to redefine the model that we use to build technologies. Because right now we're building technologies in silos. A chip manufacturer is def deciding to just go up into the nanometers that we should do in chip manufacturing. And then we have post-quantum computing and out of sudden, we are not catching up on our cybersecurity or cryptographic kind of algorithm, so we have to catch up with it. Otherwise, whatever we develop is obsolete. We need to really sit on the same table and we build technology. We need to build responsible technologies, not to just build accessible technologies that address the short-term need of a user and bombard these short-term needs to cities that we're building because we need to, for example, digitalize a whole city and convert it to a paperless city. But what is the fallback scenario? If anything happened wrong, we need, still need to have a resilience and just maintaining the old approaches maybe somehow. And we also need to build standards differently. And cybersecurity does not work. We discussed it yesterday in our session. It does not work that you have to wait three years to build a cybersecurity standard while the attack will take seconds. That's, that's ac absolutely not resilient. That's the uh, reverse definition of resiliency. So building standards should also change because you need to address what's happening actually on the ground, but as well make sure that you address a long-term kind of value of your ecosystem. Sorry, you had a question. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is, I don't know if it will lighten the mood or give yeah. some hope, <laughs> but I would like to share a note. Um, so we have this Global Disaster Preparedness Center hosted by American Red Cross based in Washington, DC, who has a research mandate. So very recently, uh, Global Disaster Preparedness Center partnered with University of Washington, and we got an award from National Science Foundation of US to look exactly that, how the technologies can be made ethical. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, so the previous research showed that very interesting results show that not the, the current apps and technologies uh, that we use, but the very, very fundamental technologies developed years, years ago are developed in a very close systems, mostly by military, as you all know. They're very close systems and uh, they are completely amoral, not immoral, immoral or moral, but amoral. So based on that research, now uh, we just started a three-year research into uh, partnering with Silicon Valley, all these technology companies, some of them are very interested, by the way, not all of them are evil, <laughs> but so you're very interested in the subject. So I don't know what the results will be, but I'm happy to connect with you, the researchers, because I see that several of you mentioned this lack of ethical concerns and all of these subjects. Happy to connect you with the researchers. Thank you. I'll just give a positive thought <laughs> for to reassure the audience. Um, yes, in the cyber defense arm game, we are developing attack systems based on AI. The reason why we're doing it in cyber defense is also to develop the countermeasure, the cyber defense countermeasure for that. And when you talk to Mark Stöcklin, who developed Deep Locker, that was exactly his intent. He wanted to study attacks uh, with augmented AI in order to elaborate the countermeasures for that. If you take the uh, 8,200 from Mossad, it's exactly what they are doing as well. Their business model is, we are, they are a cyber um, um, army, and once they graduate from their cyber army, the de solution that they develop to secure their system, they sell it. So, at the end, the population will also benefit from this cyber uh, arm race because it will produce uh, cyber defenses to protect them that will have a cost, of course. So it's a cat and mouse game, always. And would you like to add something? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, go ahead, you first. Right, uh, well, on that point, um, it is indeed a cat and mouse game. The key question, though, for uh, for security and uh, in terms of the structural impact of this technology is, which I 
which side will have a marginal advantage? Is it defensive or the offensive? And it looks like in the cyber domain, the marginal advantage is towards the offensive, and that's not good news. On your point, I hope they did not spend too much time on uh, the findings about immorality, because assigning morality to a machine is, sorry to say, a stupid question. A machine cannot be, mor can, 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 cannot be a moral, even a, an algorithm. Uh, it has not embedded values. And we should also be very careful in the way we anthropomorphize machines, okay? Um, for now, these are basically algorithms that have no consciousness. Some people are working on that, but we might be uh, very uh, uh, far away. That same, the issue of ethics is very important. But the problem we're facing now is that because these issues of embedding ethical principle in algorithm is key for development of this technology, you have a proliferation of ethical initiatives. And the World Economic Forum uh, is about to publish a, uh, a study where they identify more than 200 initiatives worldwide that suggest propose ethical standards. Overall, you have more than 90 different ethical standards, because behind that, the idea is those principles that will prevail will push a certain worldview. And behind that, there are some power politics going on. So this issue of ethics is very important. But that say, uh, you have a lot of researchers doing research on these issues, in term, especially uh, ph philosopher, ethicists. Uh, but discussion is indeed key, but it's very linked with power politics. Thank you, Jean-Marc. I think it's also crucial when we have this kind of ethical discourse going on is to bring the technologists on the table because they have the responsibility to actualize these ethical concepts by building algorithms that are ethical. It should be unethical for people to just, you know, analyze people at large without their consent, without their actual consent and providing this. And when I say consent, you cannot push a Facebook user to give you consent by offering service. So it should not be a blackmail war of saying, you will get access to a service if you consented on giving us your private data that we could analyze later on. So we should really have this kind of a global shift on how we develop technologies. It shouldn't be the same exact way we use to develop technologies. Um, and uh, when you mention the fact that resiliency is the key here, it's not who is doing offense and who is doing defense, but the fact that how can you be um, uh, having this kind of cyber immunity? If you were attacked, you can crash, but you can also recover as fast as possible to a state st status that would give you enough stability to operate and to minimize the damages. And, and, and to do this, we need as well to rewrite the way we write our algorithms. And I don't think it would be beneficial to do it through only selling solutions. Because selling solutions, I know the economists around the table, they know. When you sell solutions, you address only the niche markets. But you need to address the mass here, because we have a critical mass kind of problem uh, with cybersecurity. And for this, we need, I've discussed this as well yesterday in our symposium, you need a lot of open source initiatives. Open source initiatives that would push researchers around the globe to focus on a problem, focus on building privacy. Privacy solutions that are doable, on social media, for example, or focus on doing solutions that relates to uh, payment systems that are more resilient and just get the globe on doing it and provide a bit of open source of it. Of course, some companies need to make profits, so that's, that's beside the point. But I think we should not just focus on the fact that profit, we are a profit-driven world and uh, we run behind the profit. What got us into this crisis is this. The majority of us, they run behind the profit and the quality or what, the value of what we are bringing on the table is diminishing. Okay. Just, just on this. Sorry. Okay. Just on this. Um, if the major systems that are developed out there, especially in the West, are driven by uh, companies, you have a commercial interest in it. And so suddenly the commercial interest clashes is not the same as the public good. You know, and you embed this commercial interest in this system. This is where the problem lies. Yeah. 
I understand 100%, but I think for a global, because this is a global crisis, and to address it the right way, it means we need to bring companies with commercial interest to do public good. And most of them, they do right now public good. So let's focus on doing public good through this kind of a venue where we bring them into a common dialogue. I think if they focus 10% or 20% of their time, they could make a beautiful impact. Please. Thank you all for this amazing presentation. My name is Rim Gunaim. I'm the executive director for the Rotarian Action Group for Peace Visiting from Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm originally Palestinian. And when you look at the issue of um, cyber te technology and AI, um, I would like to give an example to really introduce you all to think with me. There is this company called AnyVision. is supported by Microsoft. Microsoft says, it's a principled company, and they would not use their facial recognition technologies um, in unprincipled ways. It's good to notice that Palestinians are a population that doesn't have uh, really their freedom or democratic rights. And so to just um, complement what uh, Dr. Huda referred to, how we develop technologies is really key not just what is the outcome of those and how we develop those uh, logarithms. So really this any vision company in, in Israel is doing, um, is creating surveillance system on an entire population um, that doesn't have uh, human rights. So my, this problem that is challenging makes me think of how can we raise the standards for the companies that get to participate? Why kind of international standards that we can provide so such behavior is not accepted because this is a violation of human rights when we're not far away from the United Nations. Um, so that is just my question. Is there anything being done around this? How can we think about this? Um, to think about powers, people who are oppressed and, um, and development of technology and how this philosophical thinking about it. What's your name again? Sorry. Reem. Reem. Thank you so much for the question. Maybe I can start by just, I think, I admit, I think we started the conversation by saying um, our discipline in terms of building an ethical or maybe much more responsible cyber technologies is way behind because we were stuck in our own cubicles for a long time in addressing cybersecurity in a very classical approaches. Um, right now we're facing serious issues like what you've just described and issues on, on a global level that would push all of us here around the room to think of having a global consortium and a global standards for cybersecurity. We don't have right now one global standard that could go for cybersecurity on a global uh, level addressing these risks that is adhered uh, in most of the countries around the world. We don't have that. We have like a bit of information security standards, yes. Uh, but they don't address serious issues of developing ethical technologies, unfortunately. I hope that we could go out of this room and advocate for these things and try to build it, try to build research groups around it, and try to impact a difference um, around these. And I will just, do you have any inputs on this? Yeah, just yeah. you have, just the, the problem that you are, you are highlighting is an issue, but you have to differentiate two things. You have to differentiate problems that stem from biases in the algorithm. And there is an example these days with uh, the Apple credit card, you know, that differentiates between women and men. And uh, here basically you have embedded bias in the way uh, these algorithms are being trained on data sets. And uh, that is an issue that needs to, uh, to be solved. Then the second issue is when a company is selling a product to conduct a specific activity. And here, the kind of issues, the, the policy that you have to take are very different if this company is a specific country or if this movement is led by a spearheaded by a state, you know. And, um, and so you, ha you have to differentiate that because the way you will address this will be very different. It could be national law, it could be international law. And, um, and so um, the, uh, we cannot answer this question in, in two minutes. You really have to look at... Um, the, the whole uh, ecosystem. It's also a very good call for international regulations. So, yeah. 
Um, I think we are out of time, so I'll invite you for lunch and we'll gladly take and discuss with you your next question over uh, some food. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. If we could uh, just make ourselves comfortable, please. Ellen, thank you very much. You come to order. Okay, thank you. All right, chaps, please take seats. Thank you very much. Sorry, begin again. Thank you. All right, thank you. If you don't behave, you'll get detention. All right. Good afternoon. So, so this is now the highlight of the day. Um, we've we've had the we've had the sort of challenges this morning and sort of thought about some of the things that could go wrong. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so now we're going to to try and share some some potential solutions to the challenges. Um, and and we're very lucky to have uh, Miss Eugenie Monley, who's the chief risk officer for for commercial insurance at Zurich. Uh, Eugenie has been CRO at them with since 2017, is that correct? Yeah, thank you. And, and, and you was at PwC where you worked with the, the uh, insurance banking and mining clients and then you moved to Zurich in 2004 and you've got a very impressive CV. You have, it's, it's a very, very impressive CV, uh, very, very senior roles in, in the corporate sector and um, I can't believe that. <laughs> really? 1997, you qualified. You, oh, I'm sure that's a typo. That can't be that long ago. So in 1997, oh, yeah, geez, that's, that's probably more. That's probably more correct. Um, you received a qualification from the ICA in Australia, and she got her merit for for obtaining a result in the top five percent nationally in the corporate finance module. I'm I'm also from the Big Four. I know how tough those exams are. So actually, to come out in the top five, that's a very very impressive result. So so well done, Eugenie. Uh, thank you for joining us. And then we have my friend, Mr. Stefan Tangen. Um, Stefan is joining us from the Swedish Civil Contingency Advisory Board. Um, now, now, Stefan's been working in the world of standards uh, for, for 13 years. Again, another typo, much too young. And he's worked through, through a number of panels and uh, various committees. Uh, Stefan will talk to us about ISO 223, which was the, the precursor to, to ISO 292. And He's also in charge of the communications and information sharing group of, of the, the 292 committee. Um, and he's got his PhD in production engineering, but he's very shy. He never says that he's a PhD. He's one of those guys that earns it, keeps quiet about it. But uh, he's a great guy, known him for 10 years, a lovely, lovely man. So, um, me, Kev Breer, I'm, I'm now in the, the dark world of consulting. I look after cyber resilience and crisis management. So our colleagues this morning explained all of the things that could go wrong. When those risks crystallize, I and my colleagues come along with a dustpan and brush and try and tidy up the chaos and keep the organizations going again, which, which has its highs and lows, if I'm honest. Um, and then before that, I was actually working in industry uh, in, the, in the financial sector. And then before that, I was a police officer and I spent the last five years in counter-terrorism. And then before that, I was in serious and organised crime. I should clarify perhaps that I was investigating it because that could never, that could never take that as a given. But, I, but bizarrely, I, I was an undercover officer and, and, and I was a, a, a spook, for want of a better term. And although I was a bit slimmer, I was still a six foot two gorilla. And if I'm brutally honest, anyone that didn't, spot me following them, really deserve to go to jail for sheer stupidity, <laughs> let alone anything that they'd actually been doing that was naughty. So that's by the by. So without further ado, let's crack on. So, so Eugenie, are you ready? So the way this is going to work, Eugenie's going to set the context and the challenges. Stefan's going to give the, the framework and the overview. And I've got the best bit I'm going to tell you about ISO 22361, which is the new standard on crisis management. So Eugenie, if I may hand over to you, please. I should pass the back. Well, I will say, after that introduction, firstly, expectations weren't raised at all, were they? Uh, secondly, if I might add, 
I think you probably all have worked out my age. <laughs> but that's okay. I guess it's public information. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Good on you, Kev. Anyway. Anyway, look, this morning was, I thought, fascinating. And I'm going to try and actually make some links to some things that other people said this morning. Um, but what I would also say is... Um, yeah, kind of depressing. Now, and unfortunately, this particular presentation doesn't necessarily get better in that, uh, from that perspective. Uh, but before you think I'm a glass half empty person, which I, I can be sometimes, when I'm doing these kinds of topics, actually I become glass half full. I really believe that we can sort out these problems, just, just maybe not tomorrow. Um, anyway. So, you've heard the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report referred to a few times today. I think David referred to it and a couple of others, actually. Um, we, Zurich, are a strategic partner to the report, so we help produce it. I'm on the steering committee for that. Um, so, that's why I'm here. That's why, that's why I got the job. Anyway, this is the after-lunch session, so I'm going to try and make it a little bit lively. Um, first things first, I was in New York for the 2003 blackout staying at a hotel, and that involves quite some stories, um, and really fascinating on the back end of how some of the hotels responded, how people responded in that particular event. But anyway, I'm going to, to move on from that and actually get into the presentation. So, this is kind of hard to see given the colours. We need to do a better job with that. Um, but this is part of the global risks landscape. Uh, that you heard referred to earlier. So this is in, from the Global Risks Report 2019. This is the top right quadrant. So what does that mean? The highest frequency, highest severity risks. So a survey of over a thousand business leaders, NGOs and others essentially populate the answers to this survey. So this is the paradigm that we're working with. Yep, this is what we're talking about when we talk about the global risks landscape. When you look at it, what you notice is there's a lot of green. Those are the environmental risks. Then you see a couple of blue risks, the technological ones. So we've talked about some of those, cyber attacks and data fraud and theft. Uh, you see the odd geopolitical one being weapons of mass destruction. Um, you see some economic risks in there uh, and some societal risks in there. Now, part of the reason why I'm, I'm pointing out all five categories is when we get on to the discussion about uh, frameworks, I do feel that maybe taking a somewhat of a categorization approach might be handy. But <laughs> I'll let the guys address that later. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is this is from a global risks report, which, as I mentioned, is formed by the views of multiple natures of stakeholders, shall we say. If you were to look at the regional risks for doing business report 2019, which is formed just by the views of business leaders, a lot more of them, over 13,000, but just business leaders, actually the top risk is fiscal crises. And actually economic risks dominate the top 10 a little bit. Um, and actually environmental risks globally really don't appear. So just imagine that dichotomy that we're talking about now. So this is what the world cares about. And what, and what business leaders care about is something else altogether. So the question is, why? Is that a short-term versus long-term view? Probably there's an element of that. My belief as well is that there is an element of experience in there. What I often find with our customers, so I work for an insurer, so a lot of our customers are the ones experiencing uh, these crises that we talk about. Um, and what I often find is we have a hard time making them realise there is an issue or a risk to be addressed until they've experienced it. So I'll give you an example. We have a customer who they, they said to us earlier this year, Eugenia, we built our building to code. We're in an earthquake zone. We built it to code. And then we had this extreme rain, extreme wind event, and the roof blew off the building and the building flooded. Eugenie, but we don't understand, we built it to code. And I'm like, yes, but code has been based on historical data of the events of that region. It no longer represents the view of today or, worse still, the view of tomorrow. Basically, building to code isn't enough in most places. You have to actually build it to code plus. And it's really interesting. So now they're interested in having us help them 
with the projections of what the flooding might look like in the coming years, but only because they've experienced the event. So I do feel there's an element of that going on with businesses as well. The other comment that I would make is if you were to look at this landscape by region, it would also vary greatly. So North America and Europe, when you look at the business leader survey, cyber attacks is number one for both. But Latin America and the Caribbean, it's the failure of national governance, and I think we've seen examples as to why. For South Asia, however, um, it's water crises, and for the Middle East and North Africa, it's energy price shock. So why am I saying that? Well, imagine what we're about to talk about is global standards. These are the primary concerns of all the different regions. They, they, they're so far apart from each other. So to a certain extent, when we're talking about global standards, un unfortunately, there needs to be a little bit of flexibility to allow for those regional differences. So actually, before I move on, um, so I will say, coming back to the question of, you know, do we have frameworks? As an insurer, we often will respond to natural catastrophes. Essentially, when it hits our customers, we then have to respond. So we do have a crisis management policy, but mostly actually for use for our customers. Um, and so we do, we have one global policy. However, there is a key sentence in that global policy and it recognises that it must be in accordance with local laws and regulations. Yep. So I'd argue some of those frameworks do exist today, but I wouldn't argue they're enough. I think they do require enhancement, and that example of the roof building uh, blowing off the building is for me one reason why. They, they tend to be based on historical data and not forward-looking enough. So I would add projections and scenarios, including extreme scenarios, in the risk identification and assessment process. So, and one other example I'm just going to touch on before I move on. Um, when I say frameworks are in place, for me there's a fascinating example in Spain. You know, there's a water tribunal in Spain, in Valencia. And certainly in Australia, where I come from, land of drought, um, there's certainly water arbitration processes. So now imagine you're facing water crises, which is number one risk for South Asia, remember? Um, we have frameworks we could leverage. Do they apply today across border? No. Will they need some enhancement and some work? Yes. But are there starting points out there? Yes. So, speaking of extreme scenarios, remember I said extreme scenarios are probably one of the tools we need to add to a risk management landscape? This is what we're talking about. This is also from the Global Risks Report, right? And um, so I'm going to just go down the middle against the grain. So this is a scenario where we're saying there's climate change affecting the ability to grow food. We've got population growth. The two combined place pressure on the food system. Oh, and by the way, that happens to be in a world where we've got geopolitically motivated strains. Yeah. So an extreme scenario is that you could see one country attack another country's crop. And that would literally be so that that country could not for, uh, feed themselves. So the consequences might be retaliation, back, yeah. Rationing might be needed. In the event of rationing, could we see then hoarding or theft by individuals? Yes, once we see that, are we headed down the path of social disruption? Yes. So to mitigate this, you might see countries okay, decide to, shall we say, seek a greater self-reliance for their food sources. Um, you might see them develop more resilient crop variants. You might see them plant the crops in different locations, maybe not near borders. So it's an example of an extreme scenario and then the thinking of the layers that you go through to identify all the risks. Um, and as you can see there, we've got quantum We've got open secrets, which refers to quantum computing, which, which people talked about earlier today, um, and weather wars, which I'm, I'm going to leave for the time being. Um, what I would say is, for me, interestingly enough, one of the more interesting extreme scenarios could relate to gene editing, yeah? where an imbalance of regulation across the globe leads to 
a superpower or a super race, if you like. So basically, if the globe did not sign up to a uh, consistent set of views or regulations, you could end up with a superpower or a super race due to gene editing. So you ha I do think, as we consider frameworks, we need to look at whether we can use some of the existing infrastructure, existing tools, so things like the UN, um, on topics like this. Otherwise, we're potentially destined for the topics to develop a little bit more like the Cold War nuclear arms race. And this is one such of those topics. We already heard quantum computing is another one of those topics. And AI, yep. So, now, the other thing that we talked about a little bit earlier today was people were mentioning the need to map the risks and to go down the layers of the interconnected risks. This is the perception of how all those risks that I showed you on the first slide, how they're interconnected. It's a perception of how they're interconnected. We're not saying we've actually mapped it, yeah? But what's important here is, yes, you can pay attention to your risk, you can pay attention to directly connected risks, but the reality is you need to go further. You, know, you need to think of it as six degrees of separation and in multiple directions. So the future of risk management, oh, thank you. Yep, the future of risk management is being able to see that bigger picture. Um, <clears throat> and actually, interestingly enough, David mentioned uh, Brisbane, 2011. Um, and that was a fascinating one because essentially what came out, uh, doing a post-event review of that, what came out of that was the infrastructure, so the walls that had been built, the buildings that had been built, the bridges that had been built, actually changed the waterfall. So ever, all the insurers and, shall we say, governments were using landfall maps for the flooding risk. But the actual physical infrastructure that had been built changed the flood maps. And so they had to remap Brisbane after the event. Same thing happened with bushfire zones in Victoria after the 2008 Black Saturday bushfires. So the reason I mention it is because often those activities occur after the event, and I'm thinking maybe what we need to do is bring them forward somewhat, make them, shall we say, more regular. Um, and why? Because economically, prevention remains better economically than recovery. One dollar spent through our flood alliance, we can say one dollar spent on prevention saves you five dollars in recovery. And the problem is in the world today, around 87% of all funding is actually recovery related and not um, pre-event related. So we need to change that dynamic and make our money work for us a little bit better. And it's that prevention aspect is one of the things as an insurer, of course, we're there on the recovery phase. We pay the, we pay the check, right? Um, but we're conscious that we need to do more on the prevention phase. And so actually at the moment, we, we spend a lot of time um, building services for our customers because we understand that that will be more critical going forward. So speaking of business resilience, I'm not going to go through this whole, also I don't have the time. Um, I want to pick up a couple of things. We talk about our uh, traditional risk management techniques aren't enough. I would argue, actually in some respects, we need to go back to the future, if you like. Redundancy is just one of those. So redundancy was when we used to hold excess stock because we couldn't have, we didn't have just-in-time supply chains. Guess what? We're back in a world where probably we need that. We need that redundancy in the system. It costs us money, but it's probably worth it. So ironically, we're probably going back to the future. <coughs> the other items on here I really wanted to pull out were multiple scales. So this is looking at your risk on, say, a local level, regional level, country level, global level. It can also be looking at your risk. What is it today? What is it five years out? What is it ten years out? And the reason why I mention that is if you were to think about something like cyber, that's exactly the kind of risk that would look quite different today versus five years out versus ten years out. Um, and so you really would want to develop your risk management strategies to address all three time periods. Uh, last but not least, and I'm echoing some of the others here, um, is social cohesion. 
Uh, so this is when we're talking about companies, which I naturally do because I'm in the corporate world. Um, when we talk about social cohesion, this is how embedded is your company with the local community? Yep, and vice versa. The more embedded you are, the more likely you are to look after each other when a crisis hits, adding resilience to both the community, but also, selfishly, uh, from the corporate world, the company. So, I'm going to move on to probably my favourite piece of all. I'm a big believer, there's a reason I'm picking out this slide, and this also comes out of Michelle um, Rooker's book, Grey Rhinos, yeah? I'm a, but I'm a big believer in this particular topic, which is that bias pro potentially prevents us from recognising some risks um, and dealing with some risks while reacting to others. So this comes back to uh, Lord Toby Harris's point around the black elephants that we don't address. Why is that happening? And I believe that there's a behavioural element to that, um, which is why I always pick out this, this piece. So, what are we saying here? Well, there is in implicit bias. So, three key, ty three key types, as you see on there. The first one is um, too little weight, so anchoring and confirmation bias. So, the first person who presents is the one you all think the idea is right. Yep. The person who speaks up last, you kind of you've already done your thinking and you dismiss the idea. The second one is availability bias. And this is what I believe is at play when you look at that executive opinion survey um, result. People rely on examples and evidence that come immediately to mind. So that could be training, it could be cultural experiences, it could just be cultural, uh, it could also be prior experience. And that's what I think is happening to a certain degree. I think the other thing that happens is in this data-driven world, we sit there and say, if we don't have data, we don't believe it can happen. Um, and I actually think it's a bit of a red herring. The data sometimes can be a bit of a red herring. Uh, and I think we need to be especially careful with that. And now come back to um, one of our earlier colleagues who sort of said, oh, and we're all linear thinkers, right? Now imagine we're relying on data and applying linear thinking. We're totally missing the, the boat. Um, and then last but not least is hyperbolic discounting which is short-term goals, prioritising short-term goals or short-term risks over long-term risks. Hence why the multiple scales were something I pulled out earlier. Now I'm going to finish with a story, if I've got the time. I'm looking at Kev for a yes or no there. Brief story. Brief story, okay. So, last financial crisis. I get a phone call from my brother who, at the time, please don't throw things at me, was an investment banker. And he says to me, Eugenie, get your money out of the banks in Switzerland. They're really unsafe. You know, and I'm like, I can't believe you guys. You guys caused this financial crisis and now you want me to trigger a run on the blank. banks. Click, I hang up the phone. I get off the phone and I think, oh my God, what the hell was wrong with you, Eugenie? He's actually kind of right from a self-protection mechanism point of view. He's right. I should, I should take the money out of the bank. Um, if I might say so, it caused me to go down the hallway. At that time, I was covering Asia Pacific, Latin America, um, Middle East and Africa. So, fairly diverse group. So, I walk down the, the hallway, but I'm sitting in Switzerland. Walk down the hallway and I say to my Swiss colleague, what do you do? And he says, it's very important at this t point in time, you keep spending. You may be moderated a bit, but keep spending. You've got to keep the economy going. And no, you don't move your money. Maybe you spread it a bit, but you don't, you don't take it out. Keep going down the hallway and Argentinian colleague, oh, we've seen this before. No, Eugenie, you've got to get your money out, you spend it on physical goods and then you've got something to trade because your money can be worthless overnight. Keep walking down the hallway and I get to the British colleague and he says more or less what my brother said. Now, why I found that really interesting example is afterwards I looked at the stats. This is years later, looked at the stats. Sure enough, the Swiss moved their money between banks in Switzerland, but he didn't really leave the country. Um, it basically just got, the risk got spread, yeah? We did see queues at the banks in the UK. I remember that on TV, have the people remember that? So there was a cultural dimension, if I might say so, to the reaction of the crisis. So I make the comment because while we have bias going on in terms of our planning and risk identification and, and planning for mitigation, we also have, if you like, 
behavioural reactions informing how the crisis develops. So that's something I would add to the framework. With that, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's always interesting. I've heard that uh, almost every single speaker here has mentioned the word standards. And every time I go to a conference, this is always the case. But uh, there are also a lot of opinions about standards. So every time when I sit in the audience and waiting for my spot, I can feel that some people in the audience really hate the standards. <laughs> Others think they are God's gift to mankind and really, you know, uh, uh, will praise them. So I'm always a little bit scary when, when, I, when I come up. Will I get the shit or will I get the praise? You know, that, that's, that's always. Uh, I will talk a little bit about what standards can do uh, when it comes to security and resilience. Uh, I have two things that I will go through. First, I will give you a crash course on standardization. Normally, that, that course, when I give, when I have give it, is, is, is a full day. I will do it in, try to do it in five minutes. And then I will also go through a little bit about the standardization activities related to crisis and the existing standards and, and, and things that are going on, especially in, in the committee that I'm involved in, which is called ISO TC 292 Security and Resilience. I can also a little bit sign of a warning here. In, in the standards world, we like numbers and we also like uh, acronyms. But it's actually it's a very good way of keeping track of things, and that's why we have all of those. But usually the numbers doesn't mean anything. It's just things of, of, of it's, it's, it's an easy reference. Uh, and I, as, as Kevin said, I come from the Swedish Civil Continuous Agency now. I, I'm, previously, I've been working also for the uh, Swedish uh, uh, standardization body. So I've been involved in standardization for, for uh, I think it's more than 13 years now in various of committees related to, to, to risk and, and uh, security and resilience. I will start off with the basics. What is a standard? What are the first thing you think about when, when, when I mention that word, a standard? What's a standard to you? Uh, it's, it's a categorization. It's something that helps you to uh, reach a minimum level of quality in whatever it is that you're doing, like quality. OK, what is a standard to you? Yeah, I think you both are right. Uh, first, uh, uh, I can say that here up on the, on the screen here, we can see my definition of a standard. And I, I, I usually explain it like this. Uh, first, which is very important, is it's, it's a voluntary agreement. Standards are not mandatory to follow, they are voluntary. And they, re they are developed in some kind of agreement. Uh, usually, we, we use the word standards in different ways. And we say, if something is, has been harmonized, we say, this, has, this is a standard. But in my world, the standards are more like the documents that has been developed by, by various of organizations, such as ISO, in, into some kind of voluntary agreement. And they cover almost everything, but they usually describe, well, how something can be designed or how something can be done. That's, that's usually, and that covers everything from test method to uh, quality criteria and so on. Usually, it, it started with this, screws and bolts. You know, that, that way back, uh, we needed to standardize those and so on. And slowly, it has progressed. Uh, also, one interesting thing is that uh, when, standards, when standards exist and everything is working, you don't think about it. If you just look around in this room, you have lots of things that, that is being designed through standards and so on. Things in this room wouldn't work if it wasn't for standards. And that you all take for granted. But when things doesn't work, that's when you, you get upset. Why isn't there a standard for this? Here you have on, on the right side, you have the, you know, we all have that when we travel, two holes in the wall. That is one thing that has actually been standardized quite a lot, but from a national point of view. And when you travel, you, you really see that, uh, uh, well, it hasn't been standardized enough. But actually, there, there is a global standard for that. But the problem is that uh, it's difficult to implement it because we have built ourselves into an infrastructure where everybody is, has houses and, and buildings with two holes in the wall and just replacing that in, with a new product according to the new standard, it's impossible. We did it for, for cell phones. 
that you remember, you know, those were, were designed so you have different, different uh, uh, charters and so on. But, but that, that was back in the day and we, we solved it because cell phones, you, you, you have one for two years and then you replace it. Uh, just remember, I, just ISO, and that is only one organization, has developed more than 20,000 standards. That, that's a lot. Uh, I think they, they, they publish about 1,000 standards every year, so it's growing and growing and, and, and so on. So it covers everything. And I would say that some of these standards are excellent, uh, really good, they're used all over the world, but there are also examples of standards that are really terrible and not being used. <coughs> but the good thing with it is that it is voluntary. So if we develop things that are not so good, you can simply ignore it. Uh, also, I mean, Standards and innovation, how does that go, go hand in hand? Any suggestions? Well, he, he, he is doing like this. <laughs> Why? <laughs> to some ex uh, sometimes, yes, if we are doing standards on the wrong thing, but at the same time, let's say, for example, electrical cars. We, now we need to start using electrical cars, but how can you charge them if we haven't had standardized uh, uh, charging uh, uh, stations and, and so on? So sometimes there is, you have to standardize the right things. And there is also this thing with, with uh, timing. If you start standardizing something too early, it might be a blocker. But if it's too late, it will become that those electrical plugs again, you know. So it, the timing needs to be right. And then we have legislation also. What's the, you know, these are voluntary, but what is the relation with legislation and regulations? Well, uh, many times they, they also work hand in hand. Uh, uh, regulation, if you want to force something into place, that's the right tool for it. Uh, but if you want to go the voluntary work, uh, uh, road, then, then it's, it's more about uh, standards. Uh, how are these developed? Well, we, ha we have various of different committees. Just in ISO, there are more than 200 committees dealing with things. And it's, it's kind of like the, we have sliced the cake. There is one, one group dealing with screws and bolts, and there's one group dealing with, with electricity and, and so on. Uh, we are working with various of methods. One of the things that is really important for us is consensus. Uh, a lot of people participate and there is a standard if everybody agrees that this is a good thing. And that is a difficult tool to work with actually uh, because you know, how can we get everybody to agree on something? Okay, it doesn't mean that everybody has a veto around the table, but o overall, that's the tool, consensus. It's an open, open and transparent process. Everybody can take part of it through going through their national standards body. You, you, you can become a member of it and help out. It's also voluntary. So the people that show up to, to the work, those are the ones that decides actually what the standard contains. And if they can get consensus, we, we get the standard. Uh, last but not least, it's, it's a market-driven process. And when it comes to, to that, it's, it's, somebody needs to pay for it. That's why Standard costs money, and sometimes it also costs money to participate. Uh, just uh, a short example of what can go wrong uh, if, if the wrong people participate, because it's usually, uh, if we get stakeholders representing all, all of the uh, important players, it's not a problem. Here, cargo security, one of the things I, I started to work with uh, in the beginning of my career. Uh, that is safe rules according to Swedish law. Two straps on, the, on, on that. And then there was this initiative to do a, a, a standard on, in European standard on cargo security, calculating how many straps do you need to, to have a safe cargo on the truck. Germany, transit country with a lot of lashing producers, those were the only ones that participated in, 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 this, in this standard. What do you think happened? <laughs> that was the standard. Uh, that became law in, 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 in Germany also. So suddenly, it's, 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 <laughs> it, it, it's a place where, well, you need to participate, defend your rights, and, and so on. And, and it took me five years to get rid of that. And, and in the end, we, we ended up with two and a half strap that that was kind of like, the, it was a calculation method. But and, and anyway, so it, not all standards are, are perfectly. 
Uh, here is just the benefits that I can see from standards when it comes to, to, to my agency. We, we follow standards. If there is a technical plan, do it like this, we follow it. But also, as, as, as uh, we use them in, in our legislation as well, we refer to standards. Uh, half of our regulations that we are responsible includes reference to standards. And of course, you can influence by, by participating in standardization process and, and so on. Let's move on to, to, to the work that we are involved in. And that's, we started to do this in, I think it was in 2005 that we, that we started with security uh, and deal with standards in, in this field. Uh, and, and actually, there was one major incident that led to this. You remember this one? Kursk. After Kursk happened, that was the submarine that sank, a Russian submarine. And after that, the Russians actually went to ICE and said that we need new standardization process when it comes to security and resilience. And then we created a committee, which in the beginning was called TC223. And in a few years ago, it was expanded into a completely new company where, where they merge uh, a lot of security committees in, in, in ISO to one, because they see that all, all of these things belong together. So here's the committee. Uh, it's being led by, by, by Sweden. We have the secretariat, and my boss is actually the chairperson. We do standardization in the field of security to enhance the safety and resilience of the society. That's, that's the scope, so it covers quite a lot. A lot of countries participate in this. Uh, and we, so far, we have 35 published standards and 21 ongoing projects in different kinds of, of, of way. Uh, important also here is global relevance. So when we're talking about consensus, to get some countries to, to play with others is not that easy always. We have some big players, US, they always want to decide. Kevin, UK also want to decide, and somebody from Australia, you also always want to decide. And we need to make sure that you're trying to agree on things together. That, that's what we're all about. Uh, we have an organization, as you can see here, it's, it's a shared burden with various working groups uh, uh, being run by different countries. The last one on, on, on the right, that is uh, the newest one, working group nine, which is led by Kevin. Here is the big map. Uh, uh, I won't go through all of the 35 standards that, that we, we have developed so far, but just some of the areas. Terminology, very important. How, how, what do we mean by crisis? What do we mean by disaster and so on? We need a common language. That's why we have standards on terminology. It's difficult to agree on terminology, but that's one thing. ISO is also very famous for de developing management system standards. Uh, we all heard about 9001. It's certifiable and so on, and we have other standards that we are responsible. The, the, the green ones here are, are from, from my committee, is the business continuity standard, that, that is we are responsible for that, and also the 28,000 series on, on supply chain security. Uh, but we also develop a lot of guidance documents. Uh, how many of you have heard about ISO 31000? A few of you, risk management. Uh, one of ISO's most best-selling standard, uh, typical guidance document. But we also have a lot of other, other issues here. We're talking about how to conduct exercises. There is a guidance standard for that. Uh, mass evacuation, urban resilience, that we do in co collaboration with the UN, uh, and so on. So we have a map of a lot of different standards here. I won't go into them because then I will rush my time. But just, just some conclusions here. You know, what, when is standardization an opportunity? Well, first, uh, we have to remember that we are working for consensus. It takes time to, to, to develop a standard. And that's because you're trying to get consensus among hundreds of countries. You, you don't do that overnight. So sometimes, if consens consensus is not the process to follow, perhaps you should go another road. Sometimes it's innovation, sometimes it's legislation, and so on. And these, these things live hand in hand. Also very important is that key players need to be willing to come to the, pay, to the, to the table and, and, and uh, make compromises and so on. If you don't have the key players involved, it will usually become a document which is published, but no one will use it. So key players are, are, are really important in the work. And also, I mean, it's, it's a voluntary solution. If you want to force, go the legislation route. This voluntary solution, so you need to develop something that the market want to accept. 
then it, it, it's the standardization role is, 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 is good. And of course, time is, cannot be the critical factor. If you want to full, you have to respect the standardization process. It takes time and you have to standardize the right things, but you won't do it overnight. If you need to do it overnight, you need to do it some, something different. So what should you do? What was my recommendation to you? Well, first of all, uh, you should be aware of, of existing standardization activities and, and ask yourself, can this affect you and your business? Uh, let's take the example in the beginning with the lashings. We asked Swedish stakeholders, do you want to participate in this? No, we are happy with the Swedish rules. We don't want to participate in this. That was the answer. So no Swedes participated in it. But in Germany, they said, oh, we really want to participate in this because we are transit countries. We have problems with traffic and, and, and so on. And we have a lot of lashing producers. So we really want to do this. So what happens, the lashing producers got to say exactly what they wanted. And the Swedish stakeholders, well, got nothing to say for it. But once it was published and Germany made it into law, then suddenly they really wanted to participate to, to, to change it. Well, and, and of course, you know, what is wrong and what is right for you? I mean, I cannot tell you the benefits for you. That, that's up for you. Uh, I know that my governmental agency, we're, we're a huge uh, standardization actor. We, we participate in a lot of different committees, and we are also taking the responsibility for one of ISO's largest committees. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, last but least, if you, if you have one thing that you, you, you uh, will affect your business, involve yourself in it. In your country, there are probably a mirror committee run by the national uh, standardization uh, organization in your country. It's BSI in, in UK, it's DIN in, Den in, in Germany, and, and so on. And through that, you can participate and, and influence, and you decide what, what, what will be in the standard in, in the end. Uh, if you want to know more about ISO and the, 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 the work that we do in the ISO TC, 292, there is a couple of web pages there that you can look on. Uh, all our projects and so on are in, in the ISO committee are easily presented there and there are examples of, of benefits and, and so on. So it's, it's quite an extensive web page that you can find more information. Thank you very much. So, what we're going to do now, <coughs> Stefan's already referred to, to ISO 22361, and I'm going to give you a sort of a, a quick five minute run through of, of that document and, and what's going to be in it, and then we'll take some time for some questions at the end to, to our speakers as they've uh, made themselves available. So, okay, very, very quick, brief history of how we got to ISO 22361. First of all, the, the British Standard on Business Continuity 2599 was published way back in 2006. If I'm honest, there was a bit of a kerfuffle in the committee about the term incident and crisis, and no one could actually decide which was the correct term that, that should be used. And so in the spirit of consensus, it was decided to, to drop the term crisis, use the term incident, sorry, I'll get it right in a moment, and and they decided that actually they'll, they'll go around with that. And there was a little footnote in the margin saying you may wish to call this a crisis if you wish to. Lots of love, the drafting panel. Now, what then happened after that was we, we sort of thought about it and sort of thought, well, actually, this is, there's a lot of stuff here that needs to be addressed and needs to be thought about. And so what we did, we, we took the, that material and put it into to PAS 200, that was published in 2011. And, and that document was actually sponsored by the British government. They gave us money to help produce it, which is very kind of them, but also very rare. But, but they, that was the, that's what they saw as the value of the document. They thought it was something that really needed to be, to be got out there. Obviously, we'd, we'd had a number of major incidents in the United Kingdom, and um, the government felt that it was an important document to publish. That document contained a lot of the government 
and blue light view of how to manage a crisis. And so if you had ever been in COBRA or anything like that, you'd have been completely comfortable with the contents in that document because it was there. And it ran to something like 60 odd pages of guidance. It was very, very uh, heavy document. However, it was well received in industry. And so we then moved to, to PAS 11200, brought in more industry voices into the process. That was published in 2014. Um, we'd reduced it from down to, down to about 20 pages by that point. And, and it was, again, well received and industry liked it. And the definition of a, a crisis in that document was a, an abnormal and exceptional event that created um, uh, a reputational challenge or uh, an existential challenge or actually produced uh, uh, a, a challenge upon the actual capacity of the organisation to, to respond. That in then led to to send TS17091, which then had the European view of the world, brought in a larger group, more views, and then that in turn has led to ISO 22361, which is where we are today. So, so the point was made this morning about six years. It's actually taken us a bit longer than six years to get to where we are today. So, so the evolution of that has been quite a long evolution. But each time, that evolution has led to improvement and, and refined thinking. And so I'm very optimistic about the future. So some of the things Stefan's already spoken about, it's applicable to all organisations. Be aware of the ISO definition of an organisation. Because in ISO eyes, an organisation can be a single person, a sole trader. Obviously, if you are a sole trader and you try and implement a standard on crisis management on yourself, that's really not going to end well, if I'm brutally honest. And so one has to be a little bit um, sort of self-reflective when one thinks about these things. But that doesn't mean that the principles and tenets are not applicable. One can still work through them, but just some of the actual structure pieces that are in there would, would not be applicable. Um, it's aimed at the strategic level or C-suite of an organisation. It purely covers crisis management. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, the slides will be shared with you afterwards and, and you'll show you all the contents and you'll get to see that, so I won't go into that now. Um, this, is what's going, this is what's currently in 17091. Um, so this is the base level of what's going to go into 22361 and this is the working point that we are starting from. The bit that's probably the most contentious in, in the, the presentation is the definition of a crisis. Um, we say in 17091 that it's an unprecedented or extraordinary event that threatens an organisation and requires a strategic, adaptive and timely response in order to preserve its viability and integrity. So it's actually quite a deep definition that one has to think about. Because, if, for example, the word timely doesn't mean that you have to respond swiftly. It means that you respond at an appropriate time frame. So for a slow burn crisis, actually time is usually available. But that doesn't mean that you just sit on your hands and do nothing. You still have to respond, but it has to be an appropriate response in that time frame. Um, we've already spoken about how cyber breaches have the potential to be... Um, become crises. And the one thing that, that I would say about all of this is actually a crisis is, is one of those words that people use interchangeably when they mean emergency, when they mean major incident. And, and that's one of the challenges that we will have to work through and, and build some understanding and shared vision on. So we've got about five minutes for questions. And we have Eugenie. And we have Stefan. And if you get really desperate, you still have me. And so if I, if I could invite you to, to ask some questions before we break the coffee. David. One of the themes over the, the last years. Oh, thank you. You've got, uh, you've got four to five minutes. Oh, yeah. long, oh sorry. What was it quarter to? How long have we got? You've got uh, about a half an hour. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, David, because I've got a long question. <laughs> in, in that Cheers. case, then. <laughs> you, oh, okay. All right. um, well, I mean, one of the themes over today has been the absolute change in the pace of development of crisis. We're at almost hyper-warp speed. 
in terms not only of the crisis out in the environment, but you know, cyber crisis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Given the the change, the nature of the change, the nature and scope of the change of the crisis environment we're operating in, is a six-year-plus time frame for developing standards an appropriate appropriate framework, or do we need to look at something else? Because that, I imagine, is really looking at the crisis as they were six, five, four, three, two years ago, rather than three, four, five, six into the future. So I'm just asking if that, that framework has something to bring to the table in terms of the genuinely mutational crisis we're looking at now. Um, I, I think, well, do, yeah, do you, you, you can first. I can go, oh, thank you. Go first. That's very kind. <laughs> so, I give the right answer later. Oh, thank you. And then, no, no pressure, I'll be graded on this then. Um, that, that's a great question. But... Uh, no, 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 no. That's not how I work. You know I'm very, I'm very, very consensus-driven. Um, in, in terms of a standard and the objective of that document, that document supposed, supposedly contains information and, and signposts to good practice. And it should be based on something that has already been proven to work. And so it's not a theoretical document, it's not an academic document. We can't sort of say to people, we want you to do X, Y, Z and then hope that it might function. There has to be some sort of validation of the process. So that in itself generates a time aspect because for a process to be proven to function, somebody has to do it first so that it then can be copied and replicated. And, and I have spoken before about the limitations of standards and how dangerous they are. Because actually the concept of standards from a, from a management perspective, as in the academic sense, is that it goes all the way back to the classical management theories of, of the, the late 19th century and early 20th century, and the mechanistic theories that you can slice and dice processes and that you can replicate them and yada, yada, yada. Now obviously when we're talking about cyber and you've got virtual organisations and all the challenges that come with that, actually that theory starts to get a little bit wobbly. But I do have to say that at the moment, as a, as a world, as society, we do not have a better solution. So it's a case of working with what we've got because it's better than nothing at all. And then as time goes on, the thinking will refine and attitudes will change and society will develop and new ideas will come along. So at the moment, we're making the best of what we've got to work with, but one has to be mindful of the limitations. And the one thing that Stefan didn't say, and it's one thing I would like to stress during this point, is that standards must not be confused with training. To actually apply a standard and use a standard, you should already have some understanding of the subject matter that you are engaging with. It's not a dummy's guide to crisis management. It's about signposting good practice and better outcomes. And so some people need to sort of understand that differentiate. And, and that's a quite an important one. But so overall, uh, there's limitations. I think that uh, an adaptive process is good. I'd like to see something that's more fluid, dynamic and agile, because that would fit in with crisis management requirements. But we're not at a place in the world yet where we have the capability to, to actually translate that knowledge sharing effectively. Does that answer your question? I, I would add a couple of things. Uh, uh, first, you can see that one standard as the only solution. It, it needs to be part of the solution, uh, uh, where you need to have, as, as you said, training, you need to have legislation, and you need to have different things working together toward, toward solution. And also, uh, the standardization process is usually, it, it takes very long time to do a global standard, but you also have national standards which you can develop uh, much quicker because there are less people involved. And in this case, let's, let's say is that you started off by doing a, a British standard quite quickly. And then once that was ready, you raised the bar to the European level and took that document and further developed it and became a European standard. And now you're entering the ISO, making sure that it becomes the global standard. But as soon as you do something on a global basis, you need to make sure that you have a consensus discussion between UK and Uganda 
and, and, and everybody needs to agree. So it is a slow process and, and, and also it's that usually when we do standards, there are standard, standard series, it's a series of standards. So many times we, we take one bit to make sure that it's standardized and it's tangible and so on. And once that piece is solved, we take the next one and next one and next one and then you get a, in the long run, you get a whole jigsaw puzzles of, of pieces that hopefully work together and then you have the solution in some way. And then one, once, once also when things change, we need to revise the standards because all standards are, after a few years, you ask them, say, uh, we ask, are they still relevant? Do we need to change them? Do they need to improve it? So, so that's also part of the process. But I don't see it's like one standard will be the only solution. It will be a part of some solution and then we need to add more to, to, to create that. I've Thank got you. probably a slightly different perspective on this, um, and I suspect it's 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 uh, just a function of, of the uh, the fact that I come from a corporate. Uh, it's interesting. We have these discussions with regulators often over a standard or a requirement they want to introduce, and sometimes the discussion we'll have is, I, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said around the consensus and the the fact that 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 takes time. But I'm going to come back to something that Kev said around you, you also need to test it. Yeah? And so sometimes some of the discussions we have with regulators are around well, why, don't, why don't you let us all test, us being the various insurers in this paradigm, um, let us all test the slightly different approaches that we're thinking of. Because then we can come back to you, the regulator, and tell you what we found. And that might just speed up that part of the process because we've essentially tested it internally a little bit first. Um, and then you're not releasing it as a standard until all that's been done. So you still follow your process, yeah? And you still go through that consensus discussion. But you maybe speed up the process by doing that testing, um, allowing companies to test those pieces, yeah? And I can just add one more thing is that uh, uh, ISO has, and, and also the other organisations has, has you don't need to develop a full standard from the beginning. You can develop other, other de li deliverables that, yeah. that uh, let's say for example, ISO has one process called workshop agreement, and that means that you need something really quickly. Then you just call, first get approval from, 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 from ISO, but then you call for a meeting where you actually develop something during a meeting because you have that pressure of, it ha doesn't have the same status as a full standard, but there are other de deliverables also, which, which the standardization organization can produce, which are much quicker if it is immediately needed on the market. Uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, the, the only, I wouldn't say challenge, because I don't challenge, I just reflect. Um, the only counterpoint I would say to that is that, that when certainly in the, when the BSI and ISO and SEND publish documents, um, some of the market recipients do not actually understand the differentiation between the labels that are attached to those documents. And so we will push out a document into, into the world and, and it'll go through the normal marketing and the, the, the usual information sharing because these are important, uh, important developments. Um, but but uh, as, a, as a purchaser, a purchaser may not understand that a PAS is a very limited view of the world that's been gathered by, by a handful of people as opposed to a, a full standard that's a consensus-driven, um, much more insightful, perhaps, development of a document. And I think that's one thing that, that we as standard producers and, and message deliverers need to sometimes bear in mind that people need to understand there is a hierarchy um, and that, that hierarchy is sometimes not perhaps well communicated. But David, good question. I like that one. Thank you very much. Um, so, come, come and have my mic. I'll share it with you. There you go. So, actually, two points. One concerning uh, standard. So, you, you, you ignore completely uh, harmonization of standard. You talk only about standard, standardization or something like this. One point. Two, second point concerning standard. Uh, uh, you mentioned for a couple of time the uh, quality in inside of standard. Does mean really standard quality or two things completely different? Concerning uh, crisis, is there some cycling of in uh, inside of definition of uh, crisis? Right, so if Stefan takes parts one and two first, 
and then I will talk specifically about the, the crisis management definition. Uh, for, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but you said something about quality, and, and, and of course, I mean, in order for us to, to work and have a high quality document and so on, it needs to be discussed, it needs to be vet and, and so on. It needs to be scrutinized by a lot of people. That, that's why it takes time. But then the level you set on, on, on the requirements or, or, or the guidance, what, what, what are, do you want quality like this or, or like that? That is always up to the, to, to the stakeholders that are involved in, in, in the standardization to decide. Let's, let's take the lashing uh, uh, example again where the Germans, and especially the lashing industry, they said, you know, we want to have an extremely high level of, of, of safety. That, that was their mission. While other, other countries said that we want to have an acceptable level of safety, because you can always aim for an enormous amount, but it will always cost you a lot of money. So where that will end up in, in, in the end, that's, that's uh, I mean, it's totally about the participants and, and, and where they want to, uh, want to have it in the end, so, so, so and that can vary. And also I can say that many times you have legislation working together with, with standards, and then it usually works like this, that the legislation say that, well, the level should be like this, and the standards explain how to reach to that level. That, that's usually the way that standardization works. I'm not sure if that was the answer of, of the questions, or I answered something completely different. As I, as I said earlier, each, with each iteration of this document, and, and it is the same document that's, that's sort of evolved over time, if I'm honest, um, that definition of crisis has changed and refined. I think that um, it will change and refine again this time. And I, I kind of hope that it does, because I'm not entirely convinced that the definition that we have at the moment entirely nails it. I think it's not a bad one. Uh, I think that actually it's, it's quite a reasonable one. Um, the, the difficulty with, with crises that, that I already spoke about earlier is that, that perception piece that Eugenie spoke about. And the, the same event, the same situation, can have different impacts upon different agents and players. And so I, all, I often use the, the, the factory fire metaphor. And so if one has a factory fire, the factory fire for the local blue light agencies is an incident. They're trained for it, assuming they, they are a trained brigade. They have the equipment for it. And, and they'll come along and they'll deal with that situation to, to the best of their ability using all their training skills and equipment. For, for the factory owner, if they do not have an alternative production facility or business continuity plan, it's quite clearly a crisis for them because they cannot meet their contractual obligations, they, they've lost their income streams, and all of those sorts of things that come out of that situation. So the same event has had two impacts depending on the role that one plays in the event. And then actually, for a competitor, the factory fire is an opportunity to increase their sales margin because the other company's in distress and they can perhaps steal market share as a consequence. And so actually the same event has all these different perspectives depending which lens one looks at the event through. So when one thinks about those complexities and then tries to translate them into a definition that works and addresses those complexities, one can see how these things get quite challenging and then obviously there is that situation where where I spoke about where response capabilities are exceeded so so for example for that would be the, the tragic the tragic incidents in Grenfell Tower in the United Kingdom where the fire brigade's response capabilities were overwhelmed and the situation evolved into a crisis because the response capabilities could not cope with the situation in front of them so this is all the same event has created all these various degrees of complexity and then we're going to try and produce a definition that 
actually covers all of those complexities, understands those nuances, and is still fit for purpose. Does, does that answer the question? If you want to join us, please feel free. <laughs> um, another question, please. Oh, Mr. David, right. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I've I've got a question uh, around standards, um, and particularly we move into uh, definitions and standards around crisis management, um, about for, say, people in this audience who are running organizations, whether they're international organizations, governments, uh, private corporations, and so on, and I fully agree about this dilemma of perception. Huh? Um, but because crises are potentially high impact events which may, may result in loss of life, for example, how, and I'd just like to understand the thinking behind then, how standards could then be used to hold people accountable. Politicians, um, managers, uh, and so on. Because for me, this is one of the critical pinch points when we move from, yeah, we get it for screws and windscreens and everything else, but moving into crisis, how is this considered within sort of general TC292 thinking? Maybe you could just give some thoughts and comments on that. I, I, I can, Stefan, would you like to go first? Uh, you, you, you can start. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, just very quickly. Yeah, team effort exactly. <laughs> just very quickly because I actually, obviously, with, within the so we have standards within the company. We have policies, and absolutely, if they're not followed, there are consequences for that internally. But I think that's a lot easier internally than once you're starting to talk cross border, and particularly in a scenario like this one, where probably the ultimate language will allow some flexibility because it probably by necessity needs to, which then opens the door for different interpretations in a multipolar world, which then means enforcement is actually a lot harder. It, it's interesting if you look at, for example, the standard, um, not the standard, the cooperation agreement um, uh, between authorities to respond to a financial crisis, if you look at that um, language, that agreement, it leaves a lot of doors open, yeah? Because it's voluntary, as these guys have said. So it's, so I, I think that's a lot easier for an individual organisation than more broadly, but over to you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, having been a crisis management leader and, and used the thought processes, I think the, the most honest answer that I can provide is that these documents help organisations to do the right thing. Mm. And actually, if you've done the right thing from an ethical perspective and from, a, uh, from, from all of a moral perspective and addressed your obligations appropriately and proportionally, if you then get to the situation where you do have to account for your activities, then actually you can say, well, we did the right thing as far as we were concerned. There is, there is guidance on it. We, we benchmark ourselves against this guidance. We put in place the solutions where there were gaps and, and things still went wrong. And I think that whenever we think about organisations, actually things will always go wrong because we're always dealing with the unexpected. Something will always come out that, that it was, was completely um, out, of, uh, out of the sort of radar of expectation. And I was quite interested about this morning's um, presentations. So, so I, I, my academic bent is human factors when things go wrong, and the, the parts that humans go play in processes. And if you show me any system or process, and any whatever it is, I can pretty much guarantee it'll break, because human beings are are inconsistent. They get divorced and distracted, or they get hung over. They sometimes do just dumb things. And then I'm very sorry to say from my cynical perspective, they sometimes do malicious things. 
And so actually, you can build all of your processes and structures, and you can still guarantee that something will go wrong. You just can't guarantee when that'll be, and you can't guarantee the magnitude of the impact. So, but again, if you've prepared, and you've been reasonable in your preparation, then your action should be defensible. And the one thing I'd say about these standards, it's about trying to reduce the loss of life. It's about trying to reduce the economic damage to organisations. And it's about trying, it's our small attempt to try and make the world a slightly better place and to try and share that, that shared understanding. Melissa, you have a question? I, was say, I think it's more about the organisations. I think it's more about the organisations that um, aren't being held accountable because they're not doing the ethical and the right and the moral thing. So they're not putting anything in place. They're not thinking about it. So. I can add a couple of things also. I mean, first we said, you know, there are volunteer documents. That, that, that's one thing. So, 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 so we have to separate uh, uh, the standards from, from, from the regulations. Sometimes a regulation can point to a voluntary document and say that that is a law in this country. I also know, let's say, for example, in various of countries, uh, standards has, has a different uh, uh, status. Let's say, for example, in Germany, I know that sometimes in Germany, standards are actually interpreted as law because they have a very strong status there. Uh, but it also depends on what kind of standards we're talking about. Many, mo most of the standards we do in this committee are guidance documents where we're trying to find consensus of, of best practice and, and provide guidance on various of topics. Uh, everything from how to do mass evacuations mm -hmm. and, and how to do crisis management and, and so on. But then there are other requirement standards. Let's say, for example, safety uh, standards on products. And if you are, are a manufacturer and you, in your contract, say that you will stay, you will fulfill the standard and you don't do it, then it will have legal uh, problems. But I don't think that we can create standards that will hold the uh, politicians uh, uh, accountable. You know, that, that's, that's probably we are, we are in the wrong arena then. Possibly. Um, our friend at the back, please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Reem Gunaim. I'm the executive director for the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. My question is, could uh, the declaration, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights be considered a standard? If not, could we think creatively about it to become a standard, to hold uh, companies that deal with AI um, accountable? Could we create a creative network, a global network for companies that opt in with higher standards so the consumer have power to purchase from these companies and trade with these companies rather than those who don't follow those standards. So this is just a question to think, um, to ask you to reflect on this. Is this a, a path forward? Would it be? Um, I'm just curious because there's obviously a lot of companies around the world who do field testing on oppressed people for data. Um, how would you address that? It's, if they're not part of a global pressure, I doubt they would self-correct. Um, so, thank you. So, Eugenie, would you like to, to roll off on that one, please? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, look, I thought, um, excellent question. And I actually think um, that is a possibility. I'm a, just generally in favour of leveraging existing um, tools or um, frameworks that are out there. But beyond that, if you think about something like the UN Global Compact, that was something that companies voluntarily signed up to. So you would essentially what you're saying is follow that same path. Similarly, the other example I often uh, I like and actually wish we were using in, in relation to climate change was, is the Black Empowerment Program in South Africa where companies got points for doing business with other companies which were more diverse. Um, and vice versa. And I always think that's a good incentive. And I, if I'm honest, it's a carrot and stick. You know, sometimes the standards can, sometimes, sorry, they're going to kill me now, be the, the stick. Um, and so, you know, to the extent we can develop some carrots, I think that would be great. I think you will see companies voluntarily adopt. Um, so I, I definitely think that's a possibility. Whether you could actually go the whole way through the system, I, I doubt it. Yep. Uh, 
two points. I mean, this is not my field, but, but I, I can say that uh, we had uh, one standard called ISO, I think it's 26,000 that was developed uh, a few years ago on social responsibility. Uh, that work was actually led by, by, by Sweden, uh, and it was a very special work. We had a working group with 500 participants in the working group. Uh, it was actually my former boss was, was secretary of, 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 of that work, and that was, uh, I think it's under revision now or, or so on, uh, but, but that is, is one of the things that when they are trying to develop things like that, but it's a guidance document with huge interest and so on. But also from a consumer point of view, ISO has a, a special or a part of the organization called Capolco, which is, 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 is for, for taking the consumer interest. Because those are really difficult to get, po get on board the, the standardization work because you have the government, you have the, the big companies and so on, but who will represent the consumer? And, and so they are trying to, in, in, to, to have that on board at least. Yeah. And and if I can just add from a, from a commercial perspective, speaking for, for one of the organisations that I worked for in the past, um, as, a, as part of our, our client negotiations and onboarding processes, we were getting lots of inquiries around our resilience and information security and things like that. And so we made the strategic decision to, to be fully accredited for all of the client data across our entire universe to 27,001. And so that then meant that when the clients came along and said, well, what are you doing about it to manage your expectations? We could actually physically prove that we were being responsible and dealing with the challenges appropriately. So I think actually where, where standards do exist, there is the power within corporates and consumers to actually set expectations and to hold providers to account. And I think that actually that's where the power potentially lies. And I think that's where these documents add value because where the expectation is set, then people can say that's a fair expectation and this is what we're doing to meet that expectation and concern. Does, does that answer the question? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we have about five more minutes, so just yeah. time. Oh, I'll say. Take you, yes, please. I'll take you back and then Roberto. Okay, thank you. Okay, my name is uh, Luca Tenzi. I work for the IA uh, in Vienna and I'm in charge of the resilience program that has been implemented or I'm trying to implement it. So we are using the standard that you're referring to. One of the challenges that I see on the standard is that you limit innovation and you limit fantasy on solution bringing. So one of the elements that we are bringing to the discussion to senior management is to say, yes, we have this standard, this guideline, but we will not become certified or we will not push to become certified, but we will be certifiable. So basically, we will follow a little bit the standard, but we need to have a fantasy and liberty. We cannot just be blocked to that. One of the negative side is that people say, okay, then, if you don't follow the standard, then why looking at the standard in, in the first place? It, I think that one of the challenges, and I want to understand if this is, is that standardization doesn't allow you to have fantasy in solution making. And I can tell you, I come not from the nuclear world, and the nuclear world is very standardized. So bringing fantasy to them to solve a problem like a kidnapping, it's actually very, very challenging to them. So can we think that standard can be followed just as a roadmap, but not to be certified? Thank you. Um, that's I, I definitely agree with what you're saying there. I mean, uh, there is always this question about certification and so on. And it's, uh, we know all during the 90s, when uh, 9001 becomes so popular, you know, all companies just needed to have that uh, signed certificate in, the, in, in their entrance. Uh, but I think we've moved on from that. I think uh, uh, certification is a good tool to use when you really want to comply with a standard, but you can take part of a standard, you can follow it in different ways, and it, it is a voluntary document. So, 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 of course, use the part that you, fi you find useful in your way. I, I was going to say, uh, you, you, you should have to add. Basically, ditto, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I was about to say, I, I think I made the point earlier, it's a strategic decision for the organisation. Mm. And there are, as with any decision in an organization, one has to do a benefit analysis 
and decide whether it's the right solution for your organisation. And I think actually following an alignment is not a bad compromise because it gives you the flexibility that you're talking about. Um, but it ha it's, it's not one size does not fit all. It's a case of actually, and, and actually interesting, uh, I find it very interesting when people talk about cyber risk and cyber resilience, and then they start talking about 27001 because actually that's an information security standard and there's a quite a subtle difference and doesn't really get into sort of some of the things that come out of cyber risk and cyber challenges and there is actually a little dedicated cyber standard than 27,000 series which I think is 27,032 but I may have misremembered. <laughs> so, so actually you have to choose the right vehicle that will meet your strategic objectives of what you're trying to achieve. Roberta, you had a question. Well, I would like to play a little bit devil's advocate for a second, no? as, as, as usual, and try and see. Uh, at a certain point at the beginning of the presentation, you said uh, that standards are not a dummy's guide of uh, how to, no? No. and they require training. Yeah. Now, uh, if it's a standard on products, they can also be immediately validated. If you decide to follow it, and you have to, otherwise you cannot sell your cell phone, the validation is automatic. Does the charger fit or not? So did you build it according to standard or not? It's a, it's a very clear thing. You don't need any, any strange thing to find out whether it works or not. When we're talking about standards on processes, on way of, of doing things, I can say that I follow the standard because I'm actually I'm doing exactly everything. But of course, I'm an idiot that has absolutely no clue at all, has no idea what security is, has no idea about crisis management and I follow it in a bad way. Mm. So I actually, I cannot validate it because I cannot create a crisis just to see whether my system is resilient or not. And I may fall in the trap of, uh, you know, the li a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So I may fall into the trap of false security when, because I think I'm doing the, all the right things without actually doing anything and perhaps even triggering a problem. So a standard is not a dummy's guide but it has one, one small little thing that the word standard and the fact that it's ISO gives it a, a power of credibility that maybe the organization may, you know, may misuse or mm. mis misinterpret or misunderstand. Sorry. Okay. Do you have a okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I know this sounds odd, but I actually have something in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here, and, 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 and um, you're particularly going to kill me. Um, <laughs> from my former career, yeah, what was interesting is I remember at one stage we were looking at the US tax standard versus the Italian tax standard. Yeah, we had to compare the two. And what was written in terms of the standard, the actual piece of paper, was basically identical. And yet the way it was applied couldn't have been more different if you'd tried. And I remember at one stage saying to my boss, oh, look, well, we're going to have to do an adjustment here. I don't understand why. It's exactly the same rule. Yes, but it's applied differently. So what I would say is I agree that on the face of the standard it might look the same. The only way you could then ever validate that is to go and have a look at how it's being applied. You know, so there we're talking sort of monitoring, yeah, evaluation. And it's uh, platform number as well. And I think, if I'm honest, that's a challenge for anyone running any organisation. Mm -hmm. It's about actually having the correct governance, doing the right thing, and sense checking that you understand the risks and challenges to your organisation, and you've put in place appropriate and proportional solutions. And so, yeah, you, you could be a complete buffoon and completely have misread the standard. That, that happens. Um, it's already come up in conversation in, in 22361, that we should have a, a maturity model for organisations. Now, I would be very disappointed if that translates into reality, because I think if an organisation thinks that they've got really high up the maturity model, there is a risk of complacency creeping in, and people also, because they've dealt with a series of manageable events previously, 
when something then comes along that's outside their, their remit of understanding, mm. that doesn't mean that they're well prepared to then deal with that new challenge. So I think that, you know, obviously we'll, as a panel, we'll have to talk about it and work through it. But at the moment, my own gut reaction is I'd be disappointed if we go down that route. Mm. But it's not my decision. I'm merely the chair and I just facilitate <coughs> the debate. But it's a great question. Thank you. Um, we have run out of time, I'm very sorry to say, correctly this time. And I, so I'd just like you to join me and, and thank my colleagues in the panel. Thank you very much. I Hello? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, <clears throat> we're going to, to move into the fourth and last session of the day before we wrap up and we will hit our closing um, as, uh, as uh, planned on the, on the schedule. So we're going to talk... Um, we're going to talk about something that doesn't have an international standard, leadership in crisis. But um, <clears throat> I just want to make a couple of other observations because I had a kind of thought as uh, listening to, to, to my colleagues speaking earlier on. Uh, one of the first thoughts I've had is, has redundancy become a lost art? You know? Um, both uh, Rafik talked about cash as a redundancy measure. Um, we heard about stocks uh, from Eugenie as needing to be um, uh, taken more into consideration. And the other one of, that I'm particularly keen on is the whole notion of telecommunications. So when we talk about crisis management, knowing what the hell's going on is vitally important. And if your telecoms GSM dominated systems are not working, you're going to be struggling. So <clears throat> some thoughts maybe for us in the ISRM to say, do we need to start thinking about um, putting back uh, redundancy into, uh, into some thoughts around crisis management? So we've talked about risk in depth. Um, we've been looking at some of the threats from cyber, hyper-urbanization, and are very interesting on standards. And, and I think perhaps you can imagine that uh, yesterday we, we had lots and lots of discussions about standards. And I thank very much the, the, the panel uh, for, for raising these issues on standards. From my perspective, I believe that with the backdrop of complexity, rapidity, 
uh, ambiguity that trying to get some standards together is one way of trying to help us navigate our way through more effective um, uh, crisis management. I also look very much like the discussion uh, and, and the thoughts that have been coming, ar coming around about the lenses, the different lenses of perceptions of risk, of crisis, uh, because it's depending on where you're sitting from. And uh, this is something here at GCSP um, we're quite keen on, um, on pursuing and developing further. The, the one thing that we haven't talked about too much, which is another central element to effective crisis management, is the notion of uh, trust. Uh, because without trust, either internally within your team, trying to navigate a crisis, or externally to the victims, the other stakeholders you may have, um, if you don't establish trust pretty effectively and rapidly, you're going to be, um, uh, going to be struggling. So, uh, I've not got a great voice at the moment because I'm a bit sick. Uh, so you'd be very pleased to hear I won't be doing a lot of talking. Um, but that will be ably taken up by my colleagues here, uh, Peter and Catherine. Um, Catherine is an uh, HR expert uh, whose envious job, enviable job, is to provide human resource police search capacity into conflict contexts, which you've been doing a lot of and know a lot about, and you're going to tell us the challenges that you have around that, uh, that topic, which I think will be very interesting to hear about. Peter is a colleague here at GCSP. He and I have been working very closely um, on leadership in crisis, and Peter will then um, close this session on sharing his uh, thoughts and wisdom around uh, leadership uh, in, uh, in, in crisis. I'd like just to show you um, a little video um, that we have here at GCSP. Um, so, Clementine, if you could just roll that. And if you could put um, my slides up. Um, just sort of illustrate that I think here at, at, at uh, GCSP is trying to look at this issue of crisis management and indeed crisis leadership from this different, uh, different uh, perspectives uh, that, that we have uh, uh, around the world today. And I think a lot of these have been touched on in the, in the, in the previous panels today. One of the questions I also get asked quite a lot um, is... You know, what makes a good crisis leader? Uh, um, 
have sometimes journalists ringing up and saying, oh, we want to write a piece about uh, you know, crisis leadership. You know, what are the characteristics of a good crisis leader? And we, we did a little exercise in Singapore a couple of weeks ago um, saying, well, um, and this was with a whole bunch of pretty experienced uh, crisis, uh, crisis managers, crisis leaders. And these were just some of the, uh, uh, some of the characteristics that they, uh, that they mentioned in their, in their kind of group work. And if you look at all of those, agility, empathy, being an enabler, visionary, assuming responsibility, comfortable in uncertainty, that's nice, a uh, good communicator, uh, communicator, highly experienced, being able to see the big picture, able to dig out, resilient, decisive, assuming self-awareness and setting trust and so on. Superman or woman. Um, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty challenging. Um, and uh, I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes now discussing together um, how maybe we can look to, to, to um, dig a little deeper into uh, how, can we, how can we develop these skills. We're talking about 2030. We, I think we've also heard from, from David and from others that, well, it's not really 2030, it's, it's here, or if it, if at least maybe not just round the corner. Um, <coughs> the, the, the other thing I would say is for the people in the room here coming from different organizations, as we're coming up to this sort of final session of the day, I think you need to ask yourselves four questions. Um, have, have I mapped the risks uh, that might impact me and my organization when we're talking about the crisis? Because there is no doubt that risk is central to, to everything that we try to do. We talked about potential standard, new standard in, uh, in crisis management, 22361. Uh, but ISO 31000, I think, if I got it right, Stefan, it's the biggest selling standard in ISO? Well, it's our second standard that uh, that we're published as uh, Right. And it's a fantastic standard. And it, it, you know, I've used it for most of my career. Um, and uh, it can be rather formulaic. I don't know, it's uh, several hundred pages of, uh, of, of document. But the fundamentals are extremely sound. And whilst I was asking the provocative question, you know, can we start holding people accountable um, in the future for effective crisis management? Maybe, maybe not, we'll see. I think there's work to be done on that. But we can already hold people accountable on risk. If they're not undertaking effective risk mapping, uh, a risk assessment, risk mitigation process, um, then people can be held accountable. A good judge, a good lawyer, a good coroner will say, you made a decision around a crisis. Great, um, something happened and it went wrong, but please justify your actions by presenting your, your risk. And that is, and I face that, that is a very common approach now. Um, so have you mapped those risks? And are you actually really prepared for a crisis? I think it's this kind of false sense of security we were talking about, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, you know, uh, yeah, we're ready. Um, but I wonder whether you are. Uh, and, and taking us into where we want to go now is, do I know who has the skills to lead during a crisis? And should this be me? Am I actually the right person, the most appropriate person uh, to do that? And finally, do I have the trust of my team and they in me if a crisis hits, because uh, you'll very quickly discover if that is, is not the case. Um, and very just quickly on, on, on trust in my kind of last thing. Um, I see this word used a lot. You know, well, yes, we need to have trust and uh, develop trust and so on. But I've, I've you know, because I come from an engineering background, I kind of say, well, I actually want to know what that means. I, I, want, the, I, want, I want the bits that make up this, this concept. I want to be able to measure it. I want to put some metrics to it. Um, <clears throat> and some of you may be aware of the, the no notion of the trust equation, work done by Professor Green and others, looking at how to develop trust in high, high impact situations. He did a lot of work with finance, you know, Black Swan and, and all of that, as well as surgical teams, uh, air crews, and so forth. And he came up with this notion of trust equation which we've kind of adapted a little bit for, for, for crisis management, around credibility, reliability, and intimacy as, uh, as factors that you can look to have in good crisis management and good crisis leaders. 
I think those, they're pretty self-expanding. You need to know what you're doing. You need to be reliable. You need to understand the environment of your team and the external stakeholders. But the common denominator, where all of that falls over, as it's an equation, is if it's about self-orientation. I'm going to prove that I'm the best boss and I'm going, I'm going to manage this situation because that is um, a very um, negative factor. Um, and if you are not very clear on the objective of the crisis you're trying to manage, what your objectives are within that crisis management, that, uh, uh, that self-orientation uh, will uh, very much weaken your, um, I, I believe, your ability to, to, to be an effective crisis leader. Um, so I'll just touch on that. It's one of the things that we explore in depth in, in the various courses that we run on crisis management. Um, but I just give that for uh, some food for thought. So I'm going to shut up now and um, I'm going to pass over to, to Catherine who's going to give her, her deep experience and observations around the real world of uh, deploying crisis managers. Thank you very much, David. Okay, so what I'll do today, uh, in a few minutes, um, just give you a little bit of uh, the background of the rapid deployment, uh, you know, mechanism in the UN. Today, we also saw a few videos and a lot of, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, propaganda and things like that. But it also means that you haven't tried yet, you know, the UN propaganda. So I wanted also, you know, to start with a, uh, you know, a short, a very, very short video. Toute notre raison d'être en tant que staff des Nations Unies est né de ce désir de réellement toujours être là pour maintenir la paix, pour construire la paix et pour préserver la paix. Como representante especial es fundamentalmente una función política. Entonces hay mucha interacción con los actores políticos, con el gobierno, como sociedad civil. Y es complejo porque la se hace en los territorios afectados por el conflicto. I had in mind having a second career and this opportunity arose for me a dream come true. You may think that your skills are not transferable to a UN context, but the main thing is to have management experience. In the past, I'd worked on various quite large humanitarian type of operations. I am using all of those sorts of skills. I understand the humanitarian side. I'm using my political skills. Je suis africaine, donc pour moi, ce qui se passe au Congo m'affecte, me touche. Pour la première fois, cette mission va être dirigée par une femme. Pendant les 20 ans où on est passé, c'était des hommes qui se sont succédés. Donc pour moi, c'était important. This is the first time that the Chinese government has been to the Chinese government. The Everybody comes in with their own vast amount of experience, but this is one of the most rewarding things you can possibly do in your life. You know, there is no more exalted than to return to a community and to see that this community, because you have impulsed a certain energy, Vous leur avez donné la chance de transformer leur vie. Et dans beaucoup de cas, vous leur avez juste donné le choix. OK, so I think you have seen a few words, you know, on which we, you know, we reflected a lot, you know, throughout the day. Um, I wanted to also then, you know, to go back to the topic, you know, of, uh, you know, this afternoon. Who remembers Yutan? That's the first question. Yeah? Tell me. Remind us who he was Yutan. He was the United Nations Secretary. I believe that he, when he retired, he went, became a monk. Did he, did he not? I think he left and then, and then went, but became a monk. Yes. He became a monk and uh, yeah. went up into the hills. And he was actually the longest, you know, one, uh, you know, beyond the ten years. Uh, he was the third, 
uh, Secretary General. And I would like you also really to remember the date when he stated, uh, you know, what is written there. In 1963, he said, I have no doubt that the world should eventually have an integrated police force which would be accepted as an integral and essential part of life in the same way as national police forces you know, are accepted. Um, so he was already back in 1963, he was thinking of what is are the premises of rapid you know, deployment mechanism in the UN. How you know this idea you know came up as you see in the UN and it's not specifically you know to the police. First of all, I want to say that you know I've never been uh, you know a UN police. I have never been you know a police officer, but since the year 2000, I am working you know with the UN police. So some of my uh, you know police bosses used to say, Catherine, for sure, in your previous life you have been a cop and at least with the rank of a general. So I take it that, I, I took it as a compliment, uh, you know, but want to say is that, you know, rapid deployment started with the standing police capacity that I'm part of, but we are not only police officers. So looking at, you know, in a mission, for example, it started like, uh, you know, in Monuk, like in the Congo, you know, from the 1960s up to what we are today, uh, before it was more of a you know monitoring you know of human rights and uh, you know humanitarian you know assistance mandate up to you know a lot of uh, you know mechanism to make like the uh, you know the, the uh, security council uh, resolutions to tackle extremely complex you know environment we're not only looking at the training we're looking at the advisory uh, you know support up to uh, going into reform and restructuring, you know, rebuilding, and even to have a SSR or rule of law approach. And then that is also very important, uh, tackling also, you know, the unforeseen. Um, more and more we see the unforeseen, you know, in the complex mission, in the complex mandated, uh, you know, mission that we are having. Who would think that sometimes, you know, you have to uh, look at um, a natural catastrophe, uh, such as, um, you know, hurricanes in Haiti or the earthquake, you know, in Haiti. Uh, when you work in Mali, not only you have to uh, deal with a very, very complex, you know, mandate, but on the top of that, in the northern part of the country, uh, the UN is viewed as, um, uh, you know, as a threat to some terrorist, uh, you know, group. So um, the complexity of task also have to encompass the unforeseen element. So when I was asking you to look at when Yutan had made, um, you know, the proposal of a rapid deployment, it was 1963. So 43 years after, well, one we can say that, you know, the UN is not always the most efficient, you know, organization to implement, uh, you know, a, a, an idea, uh, then the standing police capacity was created by the member states. Um, the idea really came out of the, you know, millennium, you know, uh, you know, symposium in the year 2000 and back in 2007, finally, you know, we were, uh, you know, we were built up. We were built up for three main um, uh, tasks. The first was, of course, the mission startup capability. Before I started with the, with the SPC, I was already a UN political affairs officer in UNMIC and UN office in Belgrade. It took the UN nine months to put me in the SPC. So you can imagine what it would be to set up like a team and uh, say, yeah, there is a crisis and the crisis is now. And nine months after, there are people on the ground, you know, to tackle the crisis. That, it is, that is completely, you know, it makes completely, you know, a nonsense. Um, so the SPC, you know, was created out of the idea of Utan, thinking that let us have a core of police, but multidisciplinary, and I'm, I'm, I'm political, HR, I have legal, I have budget officers as a core team and addresses you know, a lot of, you know, mission, you know, startup capabilities and, you know, envisaging also, you know, the unforeseen. 
We are also like a fire brigade. All understand that you know, there are no crises where the SPC you know, can be sent on a daily basis. Plus, we also face a lot of financial constraints. So like a fire brigade, they are not always you know, like an industry extin extinguishing fires. We are also you know, doing a lot of you know, mission support. So at the request of missions, and you will see you know, the uh, you know, diversity of the missions in a way, or, or assistance is also you know, being uh, sent, uh, that's where we do a lot of uh, prevention and capacity building. And then, of course, there are also operational audit and evaluations as being an external uh, you know, uh, factor from the, the missions. We do not belong to the missions. There's also like this character of uh, independence of uh, evaluation that we can also provide. We considered ourselves as a rule of law service provider for the entire UN. Uh, following the SPC, also, um, we also have the correction and ju justice standing capacity. And since last month, we also had the DDR you know, section. So that's a mechanism that the UN is more and more you know, looking at. Uh, have you ever thought also that maybe the UN had thought uh, you know, as a, you know, a community of 193 uh, member states to have um, on a roster uh, you know, some, uh, you know, such mechanism? Well, they tried. They tried to have, you know, X quantity of experts from all over, you know, the 193 members to respond to crisis. But then when it happened, no one was actually available anymore. You know, they all had, like, more Im important things to do. Second, you keep a roster and for ad vitam aeternam, and so it means it's a very, very costly, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, adventure. So what they decided to do was to create um, an embryonic, maybe a, a modest little force that, you know, that we are, but we are indeed, uh, you know, a deployment mechanism. So uh, from this, uh, you know, one rule of law, you know, service, I wanted just to, you know, to, to show you a little bit uh, what are, what we consider as our, if you are a service provider, so it means that you also then consider others as clients. So, of course, uh, that's our field, uh, you know, mission. So these are like the uh, department, uh, uh, you know, peace, uh, uh, or or peace operations, you know, department. Uh, previously, uh, I mean, since 1st January of this year, we are called the Department of Peace Operation, but maybe you are more familiar with the with the word peacekeeping, you know, operation. That used to be, you know, the term of our department. Um, the same thing with, uh, you know, the uh, political missions. So that was really our traditional way of, uh, you know, of our intervention. Until then, um, the funds and programs, the UN agencies' funds and program, also came in demand. Of our, of our expertise. The second one was, uh, you know, the research and academies, and, and perhaps I am also like the example where, for example, you know, this organization asked me, you know, to do, you know, a small, you know, lecture, you know, for you and to share, you know, our experience. And then we also have um, directly, you know, with regional partners with the European Union, OSCE, or the African Union, and directly, you know, with the member states. So, um, what have we done, and then what is the perception of the SPC, you know, since our inception in 2007? And uh, there was, of course, like we are always constantly, you know, being evaluated uh, by, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, sections of the organization. And one of the report of the panel of the experts stated that the establishment of the SPC has been one of the most innovative and concrete initiatives of the United Nations in recent history. Sorry, I'm a little bit doing a little bit of propaganda here, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, what are we in a, in a nutshell? Uh, we are actually 30, 37, you know, members, but I must say it plus because that slide, you know, does not encompass also the justice and corrections and DDR. So we are basically 45 non-stop dedicated UN members to respond to, you know, all those, you know, type of, uh, you know, missions 
and um, you know environments that I was just telling you about. What is also very important you know, to say, I'm a civilian uh, you know, UN staff, uh, but most of my colleagues are seconded officers. So they come from you know, member states and they come uh, you know, constantly you know, on a rotation. So what is it like uh, you know, that really we do? Uh, we have to be you know, operational. And so that's, you know, the thing is that you look in terms of, you know, the crisis, you know, management. So crisis management, when you are in a crisis management, you cannot say, oh, let us talk about your capacity building and your development for the future. No, you have extremely, you know, operational. But uh, since I, 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 I uh, put the similarity uh, and the analogy with the fire brigade, we are not always you know, doing operational things. And so we are really looking at the development and uh, you know, the capacity you know, building in order to do a lot of uh, prevention. Part of the UN, uh, the Secretary General you know, Guterres uh, agenda and vision is really you know, to look at the prevention. So the more you can do on the prevention is also, you know, to prevent, you know, from crisis. And actually, uh, you know, my, my unit is currently in um, Burkina Faso. There's a lot of things, a lot of trends and, and, and indicators that the country is not really doing very well, you know, this time. So we set up you know, like a team also coming from rapid deployment mechanism and looking at what is it like really that they need to prevent a crisis or um, they have, uh, is the gentleman from Sierra Leone, you know, here still? No? Yeah, you there. So my team has been in your country for nine months working with UNDP on everything what pertain to the security elections. So also then they trained yeah, and they give, um, you know, a lot of a capacity building, you know, to your uh, law enforcement, you know, agencies. And they just did it now recently in Malawi. So just to give you in a nutshell a little bit from 2007 until 2019 gives you the spots you know where we have been. Some of them have been crisis uh, you know uh, environments. Others are more like assistance uh, mission. So that's for the political missions. And that one is for what I, we call other clients. As you can see there is this rapid ex expansion. Once you get out a little bit of your box of the UN, then immediately you know, you have more, you know, clients, you know, coming up as well. What are the operating, uh, you know, challenges? And that's what I see on a daily basis. At the beginning, I was telling you that we deal mainly with secondment. Do you know what it is? Actually, you know, secondment is that we rely on the detachment, the release of, uh, you know, the experts from the member states. So it means that, you know, you then, uh, you know, dispatch those experts and they have, we, we've been talking about standards, et cetera, et cetera. They have their own way of doing, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, operation. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have leaders also, you know, coming, so 190. I always say, you come from, you are um, an organization made up of 193 member states. It means that you can have the possibility of having 193 leadership, uh, you know, styles, right? So, uh, you know, and that is sometimes, you know, the, um, uh, a little bit, you know, the challenge is that you really rely on the detachment of those, uh, you know, experts. Of course, the, sometimes the very best, you know, are, are not really, you know, that easy, uh, you know, to be sent to the UN for a certain period. We are asking at least, you know, like to have a dedicated period of two to three years. And sometimes it is a lot for a certain country to detach the expert for, for that long. So that's really, you know, an evolving, you know, limitation, you know, on that. The changing operating environment, you saw it from the slide on the complexity, it's not only a cop, it's not only a police officer who's doing like, you know, regulations on the street. It's a person who needs to be a negotiator, it's a person who has to be able, you know, to do a strategic plan, uh, you know, for security. It is a person who, uh, you know, has to have a look at the whole transformation of a police and looking at the strategic level. 
and um, see you have also like expert you know on, on you know uh, the, the quality and uh, the readiness to deliver various UN standards and services so you know here we go again uh, you know like in all way of uh, doing uh, standards um, and that's perhaps maybe an easier thing than with your organization sir with ISO for us maybe we are more restricted to uh, when there whenever there is an invitation to work work on, uh, for example, uh, next week I'm going to Stockholm and we're going to look at the standards of the UN, the United Nations, of looking at how do you mentor and advise, okay? So uh, it means that uh, the, so here is the procedure and maybe that's how you get the buy-in and it's not the ISO certification, but as the UN, you invite all the 193 members. You all go to Stockholm and we reflect on mentoring and advising, uh, you know, curriculum, training, the, uh, you know, design. Somehow 50 of them, you know, appear. So it means it's not 193, but there is a common understanding that the invitation has been sent. So if you don't come, it means that you would go along with the group, the 50, who would reflect on that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, complex, you know, nature of mentor, you know, and advising. So you have then a training, you know, curriculum, you have a standard, mm? and that's then now, you know, I'm kind of, you know, tackling the capacity building. And how we then, you know, apply standards in, for example, you know, Mali, uh, or it can be in the DRC, or it can be in where our current, uh, you know, peace operations, you know, are. For us, we don't see it as a compulsory or as a something, uh, you know, that really needs to be, you know, established as such. It gives you a guideline, a guideline or a baseline against which maybe, you know, law enforcement, you know, agencies, can then build up to maybe, you know, obtain, you know, that type of, you know, of standards. So that is, that is what we do in terms of, uh, you know, if we wanted to have a little bit of a, yeah, I think it is, yeah. Okay, so um, what is the, indeed, the evaluation, you know, on the ground? I, I told you, you know, before it used to take ages, you know, to have someone on the ground because it takes ages for an organization, not only to recruit staff, but, I mean, you, maybe you have not forgotten what I told you, it only took like 40, 43 years for all you need to be, uh, to be efficient on the ground. So, um, it's really, you know, shaking up, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, the status quo. So, you know, we are there ready, you know, to, to deliver almost kind of a standardized, you know, team and we are ready, you know, to deliver. Um, it infused in innova innovation, you know, and time, you know, and demanded, you know, assistance. Um, I was telling you also, you know, that our team is, uh, you know, mainly based on, on, you know, a high, you know, rotation of staff. So it means that every time it brings new perspective, new angles, new vision and new expertise from our, from, from our mem uh, member states. And, uh, you know, when, who brings, you know, the diversity, the geographical, you know, diversity, uh, gender uh, parity, and as well as, um, you know, the multidisciplinarity, as I told you, I'm not, uh, you know, a UN police officer. It actually, you know, gives you a lot of a pragmatic, you know, solution. It shows you how you, when you do your mapping, you actually, you know, have it in a very, you know, holistic way on how you look at the root causes, for example, of a, of a conflict. If you ask me, I would give you my political mind of the root causes of a conflict. But maybe a law enforcement, you know, personnel, uh, you know, would give you, you know, something else. So the member states are very happy, you know, with this rapid, you know, deployment mechanism because for them, you know, in the end, it's a cost, uh, you know, benefit, uh, you know, investment. They know that we exist and we can, within 72 hours, we can, you know, basically deploy en masse. And that we are not only looking at peacekeeping, you know, in a silo, but really it goes beyond. Uh, uh, remember, I, I was telling you about all the variety of various clients, you know, we have. And of course, we look at how to enhance always, you know, the national capacity and work on the prevention of conflicts. 
It's not always easy because like in a UN, in a UN mission and in a UN setting, there are people coming from the military, from the police or civilian, like I am in that, in that section. And you see the arrows. So meaning that the police cannot function you know, without the military or the civilian. And the civilians, we cannot be there either, you know, without, you know, the military and the police. So it's a very, very, you know, integrated and holistic, you know, approach on how, you know, you go, you know, to, uh, you know, to missions. So a few maybe impact, um, the late uh, police, uh, you know, advisor Andrew Hugh from Australia used to say the SPC brought back the missions from the brink of total catastrophe. That's where sometimes, you know, you have been in, in uh, mission settings where, uh, you know, things were not really, you know, working, you know, very well. And then we reshift it, uh, you know, in terms of the strategic guidance, uh, you know, like the, the vision and the leadership of the mission. Or we actually, you have, say, you have seen Leila, but now Leila, you know, uh, was, used to be the deputy uh, special representative of the Secretary General. She's now the special representative of the Secretary General in, in the DRC. She said that she was fully, uh, you know, impressed by the leadership and dedication and the professionalism of the entire team. What I wanted also, you know, to say is that, uh, um, and I think we have been discussing that a lot together with uh, David and, and, and Peter. All this is not happening, you know, like that, just like overnight. Um, like a fire brigade, you know, the SPC, when they, when they are not deployed, uh, you know, en masse, and when we come back, we spend a lot of time, you know, in investing in each other. Not only we do it on the professional side, you know, we do a lot of debriefing, isn't that true that when you, you say like you learn more from your mistakes than whenever, when everything is rosy? So, you know, it's very important to establish that trust to say, nah, we didn't do too well there. But then like the, the, the following question is why? And what is it that you can do to remedy, you know, what really, you know, what did not really, you know, go well, right? But then it's also, you know, on the individual side. I would say that, you know, uh, you know, before I would never really spend a lot of time in, um, you know, like taking, you know, little coffees with the staff and uh, getting to know them better. And it was, I was completely wrong because, you know, the time you spend with your staff is actually, you know, an investment, you know, for the future. Because then, you know, when the crisis, you know, really happens and you have to take like very, very tough decisions that are sometimes not really that popular within your team or within even your unit and then organization. It's actually when you invest your time, you know, better then they understand and when we understand, you know, better, you know, each other. So I think that establishing, you know, that trust, confidence and what I always say, caring, you know, for each other is actually, you know, then more, um, I would say something that is a yield results, especially, you know, in crisis, uh, you know, situation. It's not only, uh, you know, looking in how you, you feel, but the body language, uh, you know, if you are not feeling, you know, very well and you, you see it and you say, okay, just take a break, you know, just go out, you know, for five minutes and take a big, big breath and then, you know, we'll come back. So um, I think that, you know, crisis management is not only looking at the crisis, but it's also to invest a lot of time in getting to know really, you know, the people you are working with in order then, you know, to have this, uh, you know, vice versa, uh, you know, trust with each other. So thank you very much. Is that on? Is that on? I get the, uh, the enviable task of being the last speaker of the day. Um, uh, just, just as a, as a, as a, a, a useful segue, Catherine, thank you for sharing uh, uh, some, some insights that uh, I find very, uh, very interesting to learn a bit about. Um, uh, on one of the leadership courses that we ran here, I think it was last year, um, it's a very diverse group of participants. There were some diplomats on there. There were some people from the UN community. Uh, there were some journalists, people from various NGOs, uh, various analysts. Uh, uh, um, so a very diverse group of people. Um, uh, and we're all there to learn about leadership. And, and there was a French colonel. 
in the group. And he stood up at the beginning and he very genuinely and very honestly said, um, look, Peter, I've had 20 years, you know, being a colonel, 20 years in, in the French military. Um, I don't expect to learn a lot more about leadership, but I'm very happy to share my experience. Um, and that was wonderful. That was great. And, and, and so off we went. Um, but he also very genuinely stood up at the end of that course and said, do you know, I've realized I've just transitioned into a UN mission environment. Um, and what I've recognized is now, what I've just hit me what's happening, right? So for 20 years, I've delegated. And the response I get is, can you imagine, right? Yes, sir. Off we go. Um, he said, now I ask someone to do something. Um, and do you know what the response is? Why? Why should I do that? So to your point about the integration and the three cogs, that sort of brought that story to life for me. And he was very honest and kind of recognizing that, do you know what, I've been learning about this, I've been thinking about this, I've been practicing this thing called leadership for 20 years, um, and I need to rethink it because things are different. Um, and I just think it's a wonderful illustration and his willingness to be a little bit vulnerable and honest, uh, uh, I've asked his permission to be able to, to use because it illustrates, I think, something that, that I'd like to share a little bit with you. Um, and hopefully I can keep you a little bit engaged for another 20 minutes or so uh, and impart something that is of use to you and of use to this crisis management conversation. Because I'm not a crisis manager. Um, I don't have a background in working in crisis management. My work has been focused on, on leadership and strategy uh, from the private sector through to the uh, non-profit environment and public sector. Um, and in the last two years with, we sat there, David, um, and also with my colleague Patrick, who I don't think is in the room, uh, from a partnership I'll share more about in a minute. I've been looking at what's the leadership lens on crisis management. Is there anything we can bring to the, to the preparation, uh, to the education, to help people uh, and their readiness around dealing and responding to crisis? So in that 18-month or 18-month, nearly two-year journey so far, uh, we've learned some things. Uh, we've got a lot more to learn, uh, but I'd like to share with you a little bit of what we think we've learned so far and test it out with you. That's kind of the plan. So, um, first thing, uh, I guess I want to say three things. I think we need to reimagine what we talk about when we say leadership. I'll come back to that. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I think in general, but in this space in particular, we need to get a little better at recognizing what are problems to solve and what are recurring issues that require us to navigate. They will never go away. Um, they will always come back. Um, but they do require a different response than a problem-solving response. And I think in uh, many organizations, in the traditional sense, we become exceptional at problem-solving. Everything is a challenge to overcome. Um, and that's great when it's a problem to solve. But when it's not a problem to solve, that can sometimes be problematic. Um, so I'll allude a little bit and unpack that a little bit with you. Um, uh, and maybe just to finish off with, if, what do we mean by readiness? Um, and maybe offer a few suggestions that be, can be taken into account in, in some of the great work that many of you are doing already. So uh, I want to start with a question, um, because before we go into stuff and content, um, it may be behove us to step back uh, and what we even mean by leadership. Because I don't know if you have recognized today as well, every time we've used the word, uh, we've re referred to different things, different phenomena. Um, things that happen at different levels. So uh, we're going to do a little experiment because it's the end of the day, humor me. I'm going to go around. I'm going to just pick on a few people. And all I'd like you to do is when I say the word leadership, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? Service above self. Service above self. Influence. Influence. Sir. So, what's the first thing you think when you say leadership? Integrity, thank you. How about you? Absolute about DHC. About DHC. <laughs> DHC, oh, that's just cruel. <laughs> um, so, leadership, what's the first thing you think of? Motivation. Motivation. Lord Harris. Too bad. <laughs> you only know how good it is once it gets into hot water. Ah, oh. nice. Oh, there's a few people going, oh, I like that one. <laughs> Um, inspiration. 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 Thank you. What else? Adam, in the middle here. Motivation. Motivation. Responsibility. Responsibility. 
high ethical standards. Communication. Communication. Charismatic. 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 Firm. Firm. Anything that hasn't been said that should be said. Yes, something you talked about earlier as well. Mentor, thank you. Emotionally attuned. Emotionally in tuned. Decisions. Decisions. Mindset. Mindset. Okay. Steering a path. Okay. Thank you. Networking capacity. Purpose driven action. Self-confidence. Powerful. Yeah. A vision for all. A vision for all. I feel like I could use the 20 minutes and we could create quite the list, right? Um, uh, I didn't expect it to take a, a life of its own, but that's wonderful. Um, and it also illustrates a few things about what we think about leadership, about we, what we even think it is, um, and the implications of that thinking. And one of the things I'll unpack a little bit in, in, in terms of preparedness and helping people get ready to, to act uh, or respond to a crisis is, is um, recognizing that what they're responding with. We talk a lot about skills, we talk a lot about tools and structures, um, uh, but we don't necessarily talk a lot about the mindsets, to use your word, um, that we bring to those and the implications of those mindsets. Um, a lot of things we've also talked about is very individual, right? We expect every single person um, uh, who is a leader to be able to do all those things all the time perfectly. And the second that one of those drops off, um, you've got a target on your chest. Right? So, so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's something about it being an, an individual uh, set of characteristics or phenomena. Um, and that's often how we talk about this thing called leadership. And what I'd like to do a little bit, I guess, is, is expand that um, a bit further. Um, in English, when we use the word leadership, we use the word poorly because we mean different things. And there's three that, that I think are worth pointing out. The first time you'll hear someone say the word leadership, um, and we've heard it here used at some point today, we're talking about the leadership. You know, there's a group of people or there's an individual that sits somewhere above us, usually it's upstairs, uh, and that's where decision making happens. That's where power is. So sometimes we use in English the word leadership and we're talking about a level, right? A cadre. Sometimes we use the word leadership, but we're talking about a function, a role, a position of leadership in crisis management. It may be up there, but it may not be. So sometimes we say the word leadership, we're talking about a level. Um, and sometimes we say the word leadership in English um, and we're talking about ways of thinking and ways of behaving that um, make someone stand out or people stand out because they achieve some kind of impact that others just don't seem to have. Now, they can, you can do that at a certain level. You can do that with a, a certain function and a title. Um, or you can just do that. And I think in today's world of, of, of where, where so much is visible, uh, we're starting to see many examples of people who are exercising what we might describe as leadership, um, but they don't have the title or the function or necessarily the authority or the power given to them, um, but they're still exercising leadership. So there's something about practices, something about ways of thinking and ways of acting, um, and they don't necessarily go hand in hand with the function and the level, although they might well do. We can all think of examples, I suspect, in our professional life where someone has a function of leadership but doesn't necessarily back it up with the thoughts and practices that we might like to see. So what I want to do is I only have one slide to keep things simple is maybe suggest that we, we, when we talk about leadership, we, we, we think about four different levels. Um, there's something that happens at the individual level. You talked about training and, and mentoring and there are individual skills and there are things we can learn as individuals that are absolutely worth paying attention to, right? But there's also things happening at a group dynamic level. So when we're in the room together and we're in a crisis team and we're working together, um, we're a group of individuals, but there are some other things happening as well. 
So it behoves us in crisis response, crisis management, to look at um, how crisis teams function and what can be learnt. What's the difference between some teams being able to achieve outcomes that other teams can't, right? Um, the third level we'll lift it to is um, more of an organisation, a systems, a strategic, sometimes we use that language, way of thinking about leadership. So what does leadership look like when you're looking to influence a system that you don't have day-to-day -day personal contact with? How does that work? Um, and then obviously we lift it up to sort of ecosystems and societies. What does leadership mean uh, when it comes to um, the issue of climate change or the issue of migration or the issue of uh, terrorism or the issue uh, of corruption, etc., etc., etc.? So what I'd like to do is maybe highlight a couple of different things that we've picked up on the way across these different levels because um, uh, from an applied point of view, it's useful to recognise when we're talking about um, skills or practices or approaches, you know, which level are we referring to. So it's a useful way maybe to unpack um, this concept. Um, so at the individual level, a lot of you highlighted characteristics, skills, things you would like to see or expect from yourself or from others as leaders. Um, but it's not just necessarily um, uh, a defined pursuit. There was a, a reference to Hurricane Katrina this morning, I think, that you made. Um, CCL, who we partner with, the Centre for Creative Leadership, and a lot of our uh, research and training uh, activities, did a, an interesting project after Katrina. They brought together a range of actors who had responded in some way to the Hurricane Katrina event. Uh, some of those were official actors, response actors, um, but also uh, individuals who had just stepped up and made things happen uh, in their community. And there was a great story about uh, two ladies who um, described themselves as kind of regular housewives, as in, you know, we live next door to each other uh, and we just happen to live in an affected area. Uh, one of the things they did is they commandeered their local church uh, and in about two weeks they'd create a, a, a support mechanism for hundreds of people. Access to baby food and product, access to shelter, access to water and food. Um, they weren't part of the system um, and they didn't have any predetermined skills or they weren't trained, um, but they did decide just to do something. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that would be interesting to see is, is if we can create a greater space for these emergent leaders right what does that look like what is it, is it possible to to in uh, the structures and the, the preparation work um, create uh, opportunities to recognize when things like this are happening and how can we empower and encourage that um, so there's something about the emergency uh, of, of actions in a in a crisis situation uh, um, how can we spot that in advance how can we respond to that how can we um, enable that as quickly as possible um, Another um, uh, more specific, uh, maybe, point. Uh, there's a bit of research that tells us that as an individual in a leadership position, um, in a crisis response team, the amount of time you spend <coughs> asking questions and telling people what to do has a direct impact on your team's collective ability to diagnose what's going on um, and also creates a bit of a, something I'd describe as a speak-up culture. And that can make a big difference in the crisis team. One of the things we've seen in the training uh, we've been doing with David together is uh, at that team level, so one of the simple dynamics you can ask yourself is, in a position of leadership, how do I engage with my team, those around me? What, how, a simple question, how much time do I spend asking questions versus telling? What is the implication of that? I'll come back to the speak up culture in a minute because I think it um, is illustrative of something else that we should consider. Uh, in this context. Another thing we often see at the team level is when we, we use a lot of simulations, I'm sure those of you who are involved in, in sort of training and preparing people in crisis response will recognise the value of exercises and simulations. Um, uh, and one of the things we, we often see is the, um, the information uh, and the way forward is in the room. Um, but people with it do not give themselves permission or authority to put it out there. Um, and you'll often see that the people who do have authority uh, in the room uh, don't create the space uh, for that information to manifest. 
So you'll often see, and, it's, and you don't see it until you watch it happen. Uh, and when you get groups to look back at themselves and how they work in a crisis response context, um, they'll often see it uh, and, and be quite confronted by it. But in the moment, uh, it's, it's a work that is, um, maybe you could say this for leadership always, but it's a work that is very much above the neck and below the neck. Um, it's something that uh, when you're practicing, and we're in a, an above the neck context here, we're talking sort of conceptually and intellectually about this, this topic, but in the moment, uh, things are different. For so those of you who have had to respond, I, I suspect you know that all too well. Um, what sounds like a common sense uh, when you talk about it can be quite very quickly go out the window uh, when you're exposed to having to deal with something. Even, uh, as David would, would, would say as well, some quite experienced crisis management put in a situation that is not the one they're used to um, will be quite surprised at how they respond and uh, how they use that authority uh, and some of the consequences of that. So another thing we often see. Um, the other piece I, I would like to refer to is this, going back to this idea of technical problems uh, and recurring tensions. Um, uh, very early on, we recognized that one of the differentiators in crisis teams was that um, some people were better able to recognize uh, when uh, a problem-solving approach was needed and when something was not necessarily a problem to solve. Um, let me give you a, uh, an uncomfortable example for me. Brexit. Um, as a question, actually, for those who are, are kind of on the crisis field, would we consider Brexit to be a crisis? Where does it sit on the... What would you say? Well, it's definitely been a, it's a, a crisis for, for UK politics. Mm -hmm. It's actually brought into question how the UK's political structure is mm -hmm. at its present time. And then conversely, the idea of geopolitics <coughs> is also a crisis, crisis that has to be managed. And so we can talk about the perhaps the problem of sort of climate change that's happening in the UK. Mm. Okay, so at a very level. So why do I use that as an example? I, to me, it's a wonderful illustration of taking a technical problem-solving approach to something that is recurring tension. This idea of um, uh, the UK, Britain's uh, role uh, as being part of Europe and the EU and being an independent entity. Um, it, this is not a new question that my country has, has, has struggled with. It's always been there as a question. Um, but it's been put into a technical problem to solve. Do we stay within the EU or do we leave? It's an either or option. Now, I reject that choice. I don't think it is an either or choice. Um, I think it's a, a, a polarity, a tension to leverage. This idea that as a, as a country, um, we uh, can consider ourselves to be part of a larger system and independent rather than either or. The problem with you creating an either-or dialogue is that then it becomes a, a conversation as to there is a winner and a loser, rather than a how do we, as a system, uh, and how do we have dialogue with our population, because I think that's where the, the gap is, that we are both part of something larger and there is benefit of that, and we are independent uh, and there is value in that too. So um, there, this is an illustration that, that brings up uh, all sorts of uh, uh, reactions uh, uh, because it matters to people, certainly in Europe and certainly to me and, and others. Um, but there are many others like that. The, the tensions we've heard talk about today, this idea of short-term and long-term thinking in crisis response. It's not an either-or. You might spend more time on one than the other, but you can't neglect one because if you neglect one for long enough, it will come back and bite you. Um, Another example is um, process and people. I think um, Eugenie, who's, who's not here now, but we're speaking earlier, we illustrated, illustrated that um, there is a, a risk in, in or there has traditionally been a risk of over-focusing on um, structures and process to prepare for crisis management um, and an under-focus on the people side of it, the human side of it, the behavioral side of it. Um, it's not an either-or question but it is recognizing how much attention do we need to give on both sides of the equation. Um, another one I noted, uh, standardization and creativity. Right? It was positioned as an either-or question. Which is better? And it was rejected because actually it's not an either-or question. You need to look at how do we do enough of both. Both have downsides, by the way. If you were to over-focus on one, neglect the other, you'll probably find yourself in a downward spiral. 
So some of these things, if we look at them as a recurring issues that we need to recognize which way we're tipping on and, 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 and take action accordingly, rather than giving ourselves false choices, um, which we then ha have to find ourselves going back on. Eugenie talked about confirmation bias. Right? Once you've made a decision, it's very hard to decide against your earlier decision. And I think that the crisis response, it would uh, help us navigate and recognize that a decision today uh, can be reversed because if it's a tension to navigate, that it's okay for tomorrow for the, for the entirely opposite decision to, to hold and, and take priority rather than be seen as a failure on something that was right or wrong the day before. So it's a new answer, but I think it might help uh, with some of the biases that Eugenie talked about, uh, and I think it might help with um, uh, some of the polarizing conversations that we're having on some of these issues today in conflict. Um, and the last thing I just, just wanted to mention is a couple of points on preparedness. Uh, having worked across quite a few sectors, I, I still can't quite contain my amazement um, at how little is invested in preparedness uh, where there is such high consequences. I started my career working in financial services. Um, new staff into that organization where I worked were trained for 12 weeks before they were allowed to speak to a customer. I mean, the consequences there were an unhappy customer. Uh, and yet in this space, and certainly in the non-uniformed organizations, um, the, the expectation that we will send people into decision-making situations with little to no preparation, and that's okay, really baffles me. Um, and it's a, it's a prevalent thing in a lot of the, the NGO organizations, for example, uh, where the funding systems don't allow for preparedness and for preparation uh, in the way that they do in uh, other organizations maybe, but I think it's a problem. And I think it's a bit of a barrier. Um, the other thing is to recognize the culture of our organizations better. Um, the idea that if you have a, an organization that has formed its culture, you know, how conflict is dealt with, how people are rewarded, uh, how people are punished, um, how feedback happens, uh, how decisions are made. Um, and they would then be expected to, I think Christian talked about the, this morning, the shift from an ambassador to a crisis responder. Um, one of the real challenges in that, I think, is that as a diplomat, you, you work within a certain culture. Um, a crisis response culture is very different. You can have all the skills you want, um, but uh, um, to be asked to suddenly step out and behave, and behave entirely outside the norm of the culture that you're part of uh, is a big ask. And, and I think if we're going to ask that of people um, to wear those two hats, we need to understand a little bit more about what is the culture that they're working in, as well as the, what are the skills that they need. Because if we misjudge that, uh, then you can prepare people as long as you want, but the system will prevent them uh, from enacting the kind of behaviors that we want to see. Um, I'm not sure where I am in time, but I think it's a, a good place to, to come to a final point that I'd like to make. Um, who has ever heard of James Le Mesurier? Uh, there isn't, yeah, sorry, there's two. Um, white hats. Um, there was some really sad news in, uh, in, in uh, this week. Uh, James was uh, uh, someone who's been involved in peace and conflict and peace building for, for a long time. Uh, he was one of the people that helped found the White Helmets in Syria. Uh, and he died this week. Uh, we're running a peace, senior level peace building, uh, so a, a course for senior level mission leaders downstairs at this week, the same week which I was lucky enough to contribute to. Uh, and one of the senior mentors there knew James really well uh, and, and, and was quite affected. Uh, uh, and, and it would seem that this was a suicide. And, and I want to make this point um, fairly starkly. Um, if we're going to put people in these kind of situations, we need to do a better job of caring for these people. Um, because... We work in a culture, uh, particularly when it comes to the peace and security environment, but crisis further beyond that, I think, where there is a high level of care for others. Many people are in this business because there is a, a care for others. And here's another polarity. But there's a strong neglect of care for self. Now, I don't mean always just the self. I mean us as a system, as a profession, as a discipline. Um, and I think if we're really going to make uh, a difference as well as the skills and the mindsets and, and understanding the cultures uh, and preparing people technically 
for what they need to do. I think we also have quite a lot of work to, uh, beyond duty of care, build a culture of care for self. Because not only is it the right thing to do, I think, for a lot of people in this sector to build some systems and support around that, but also the beneficiaries in the long term get hit anyway. So while the intention might be good, uh, I think there's a little way to go in this space uh, before we can uh, look ourselves in the mirror and say that we're truly preparing people um, above the neck and below the neck uh, to engage in crisis response in the way that some of my colleagues today have suggested we're going to have to. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to share a little bit about the training and leadership side of things. I hope it was useful. Thank you. Okay, um, anybody got any questions or observations or comments on, uh, uh, yes, over here, gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, I just, <clears throat> I manage crisis and I leave the burnout following crisis, but um, one of the elements, <clears throat> that I think that uh, didn't come across on the leadership is that there is two types of crisis. The crisis that you manage remotely and therefore you are dis distant from the crisis itself. <clears throat> For example, a kidnapping is a business transaction. So you are there and you say, okay, somebody will call in and say how much uh, he wants and we will say we will not pay and things like that absolutely distant. I managed a couple of those and people were saying, why is that simple? It's like, because I don't know the person, I don't, I'm not even in Latin America, so I'm here and I'm ad giving advices. This is easy in a certain sense, until you don't know the person on the other side. If he's not your wife, but then there is a Brazilian joke saying that somebody called in and they say, keep the wife. The reverse is true, keep the husband if you want. But, so, but if you are in the pilot of an airplane, the crisis is your crisis. You are in charge of the pilot. There is no leadership discussion. Either you are good and you save everybody and there are examples. Either you are bad and you have done everything, but there are examples as well in that sense. So I think when you talk about leadership, this, this element has to come out a little bit more. I've been in crisis where I was um, emotionally involved and I was a disaster. And people told me, but you know, you, you are in the middle of a crisis and you don't really care. Uh, and the other hand is, you are in crisis where you are not emotionally involved and there, because you are not fighting the fire. You are not facing the fire of the crisis or you are not involved in the crisis itself. So when you talk of leadership, I, uh, I've been in a situation where I had to ask a CEO to leave the meeting rooms to say, sorry, this is a transaction. You are the best transaction for what you do, but in the kidnapping, you are a disaster. Because he expected that the deal was done within two hours, because that's how he did it. He didn't understand that that lasted two months. And the phone call was not, I call you, you call me back. It is you call me when you want to call me. So this thing, I think, is important to understand on leadership is, the UN, I know the UN, I have friends that work on the police unit and they had a very funny reception from different country where you show up and say, I am the UN and I'm here to help you. And then your car or your, in a good friend of my Swiss show up in a very fantastic country in Africa and the first thing he heard, he was an AK-47 shooting to his armored vehicle. Welcome to Africa and thank you, we are helping you. So, you know, this is one of the elements. So I, just to conclude, I think the one element that I missed here is really this um, element of is the crisis touching you or you are managing the crisis so far away that you are not emotionally involved. Thank you. Mm. I, but th there are several types of kidnapping. They don't all have to be transactional. You can have non-transactional uh, kidnapping and, and there's many, many different forms of kidnap and they all require perhaps slightly different approaches. But uh, that's not necessarily, I don't think that's the point you wanted to, to make. Um, 
I, I think, I, I think, I mean, I, and I mean, to touch you on kidnapping. They, they are one of the most difficult types of crisis for any individual, or indeed any organisation to 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 face. And um, I, I don't think, I, and I've been involved in quite a few, and I don't think I've ever seen any team, whether remotely or directly, never be emotionally engaged and involved and impacted by a kidnapping so that uh, and that is part that's part of the that's part of the uh, risk within an effective crisis management that you need to uh, assess pretty quickly because it's not very sustainable either and of course kidnapping could be a couple of hours a kidnapping could be many years um, so uh, I, I think you're I think you're right and, and I think in in the sense that um, that degree of emotional involvement I think is 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 very um, is going to be there and, and 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 very important but I think you have to you have to identify it uh, your uh, what do you call it, emotional intelligence uh, around that I think plays a plays an important role role but for me that's part of in, in terms of effective crisis management is trying to be aware of when that's happening and whether it's a crisis management team close on the ground and an incident management team or a CMT in a headquarters for example I'm not so sure that there's really I mean that the emotions are different but it's not to say it doesn't exist because it does because you may be dealing with family members and, and other stakeholders and internals and so forth but it may be coming at you from a slightly different angle I think it was Kev that made this point earlier on, which is one person's crisis, another person's incident, right? So it's about recognizing where you are in that and that your tolerance is not someone else's tolerance. Um, and can you pick up on, on early signals of when that's starting to get out of whack? Uh, uh, and I think your example of the CEO was probably an example where there, was, there were clearly signals that, that, that you paid attention to and acted, and I think that's what we're talking about from a preparedness point of view, is can you, can you learn to get better at recognizing those signals and then making the decisions that you make as a result of that uh, um, by uh, practice and training? And I think the answer is yes, as well as going through unfortunate real-life scenarios, clearly. Um, but simulations can also get you so far in that journey. Yeah. And going back to your friend, uh, you know, uh, with the beautiful Toyota and so forth, I always go back to the level of attitude. Um, you know, when I work in a mission, um, I have to be able to also to provide, you know, guidance or, you know, training, as I always say, under a tree, you know, without any electricity or any artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you know, sponsor or support. So you have always, what I say is, uh, you know, always go back to the basics. I think that we have been discussing, you know, that also in the morning. So I said never to be afraid, you know, to go back to the basics and being simple, okay? And, but the question of attitude is so important. And I've been doing that for the last 25 years in working in, in various, you know, mission settings. It's not that, yes, I'm Catherine, you know, I know it all. I'm going to tell you, you know, how things work here. No, it's really, you know, to, you know, you have to have a lot of, uh, you know, understanding, uh, you know, of the person that sits in front of you. Yes, gentlemen over here from the Federation, yeah. Thank you uh, so much for um, that, the thoughts there. Um, I was struck by something you said early on, Catherine, around concept of failure and having that space for failure, right? And we know that leadership nowadays is actually devoid of acknowledging that failure. And in many of where we work in terms of humanitarian response, where we're in the midst of crisis in the UN, the Red Cross, it's difficult to think of having a space for failure and to learn. So how do we balance that tension between the fact that we learn from our failures, we have to acknowledge failure but when we but we are bound by the public by government who do not like failure and and hold us accountable when we fail and often of course you know part of the reason why we would not acknowledge failure is that human lives are at stake right it's not a case of 
where uh, a product going wrong and then we, we test it, but often it's a case of, of human lives. So I'm struck by how, how, how is that balance done and how do we then um, discuss this? Okay, I'll be very blunt here. I'm usually known for someone who is not very, um, you know, like maybe honest. Uh, you know, I'm very, very straightforward. So let me be blunt here. Have you ever read um, Secretary General's report about the situation in you know, one of the peace operations where they say we completely failed? Tell me. Yeah, that was maybe like, you know, like, uh, you know, afterwards, right? But, you know, in most of the cases, everything is so rosy. We do absolutely, you know, the best work. We are absolutely, you know, like, you know, like, we are doing really the best. Okay. So that's what you were saying. It's more of a, you know, an organization, you know, accountability. It's very hard, you know, the Secretary General, you know, would brief the Security Council and say, I'm very sorry, I failed, you know? Okay. But then there is the other level. It's what I've been talking about, you know, my unit is standing police capacity, and then we've been talking about trust and, you know, and the caring. And then when you have that type of environment, then you can, you feel more secure to say, yes, my, you know, Catherine, you haven't really been doing great, you know, on that aspect of your, you know, of your work. And then I accept it more. And then we all feel like more accountable because, you know, we say we have a certain, you know, freedom and trust, but we know that we're not going to be retaliated against if I say, look, well, you don't do it well, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, what I wanted to say is that if then, you know, then you were talking about Rwanda, right? And actually, um, I've been also uh, been part of an evaluation, uh, you know, for Srebrenica. I've been like one of the witness of the Srebrenica, you know, massacre when I was working for Médecins Sans Frontières. And there was a UN evaluation as to, you know, what did the UN do wrong by not protecting, you know, this safe haven of, uh, you know, Srebrenica. So there are some reports that shows you know, that yes, the UN maybe, you know, can do better. But I think that if we really start also at the root level, at the unit levels, so somehow, you know, maybe one day, you know, we can actually maybe, you know, go a little bit higher. I don't know if I have answered a little bit, uh, you know, your question. 80% of crisis as a result of stupid, you know. Uh, I think there's some quite pieces of work that said, you know, that 80% of the crisis are a result of bad decisions, bad management and so forth. Maybe uh, Federation or Red Cross, UN World, maybe it's slightly different, but uh, I think some of the people from Volkswagen are paying the price. Huh? The lessons learned in terms of either being in prison or losing their job. So, yeah, I think it, I think it depends a little bit where the perspective comes from too. Um, use institutions like ours. Um, uh, uh, that French colonel story I told earlier, he probably wouldn't have said what he said if it was in his own home organization. Um, but going out into a place where you can actually step out of your normal environment, uh, where Chatham House rules and confidentiality apply, it would be great if we could uh, change the cultures of these organizations to have those discussions. I don't think it's overly realistic. Um, but what we can do is, is use institutions and other places uh, to have the conversations uh, and, and hopefully take the lessons learned back. I think there's a constructive kind of suggestion uh, because that's a lot of the, uh, in the work we're doing, that's kind of what happens. Um, we can go there, yeah. It, the accountability back into the system is always going to be a bigger challenge, but, but at least the learning is happening, right? Gentleman here. Thank you. Um, first is a uh, is response to what you said about uh, security, sorry, Secretary General's report. I think Secretary General's report is mostly in line with the mandate of the mission. And uh, in most cases, it's never completely a failure. They must achieve some of the goals or most of the goals. That does not mean the mandate is always enough for the situation. It might not be enough. But most cases, they try to keep to the mandate and fulfill the mandate. That's just a comment. My question is, um, 
you build police you say, uh, standing police capacity. How do you go about this? Do you assess the capacity gap in the police in a particular state and try to fill it, or you respond according to available resources? Thank you. No, so then you know to go back. I mean, to the term. I mean, you know, it's uh, standing police capacity. Maybe is the best you know word that the UN you know could come up with, uh, right? But you know, it is a rapid you know deployment you know mechanism. We are certainly you know not there you know to judge uh, you know the host you know nations uh, you know capability you know to deliver. Uh, you know, law enforcement. Uh, um, I think that what, uh, you know, from the slides maybe you have seen, uh, you know, it comes really, you know, in terms of when we are not in a, you know, in a crisis or in a startup, uh, you know, type of, uh, you know, missions, we also do a lot of assistance. Assistance is meant by building, you know, the capacities, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, the host, you know, nations. It can be, for example, you know, we've been talking a lot of, uh, you know, cyber, you know, security. Uh, so if for example, you know, your state, you know, is saying, oh, you know, Catherine, it would be great to have the standing police capacity, you know, to come and, you know, train us on what is really that the police also needs in terms of, you know, the leadership skills. Oh, yeah, but cyber community, uh, cyber, uh, you know, security or organized crime is really, you know, an issue, you know, in my country. And that these are like, you know, some of the, uh, you know, policing, you know, expertise you know, that we have that, that can then, you know, support, you know, at the member states, uh, you know, level, okay. Yes, Roberto. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting uh, panel in, uh, in general. Now, over the whole uh, day, there is uh, an issue that uh, somehow we've, we've touched in some indirect way, but it has never actually been taken out uh, uh, clearly, which is intelligence. Um, it's very difficult to lead without knowing what is going on. So the, the building up uh, of uh, an intelligence capability seems to me uh, almost a prerequisite uh, for crisis management. Um, perhaps uh, the building up of an early warning system uh, which was sort, sort of touched at, at some point in the analysis of big data, perhaps. And there were another area where artificial intelligence may, may perhaps uh, help. But also an intelligence capability on the ground uh, monitoring during the crisis, uh, perhaps even to identify the emergent, uh, the emergent leaders uh, or the emergent um, resolution capabilities that, uh, that uh, we've also been talking. So in, in your experience in, um, in different situations, different countries, different places, different times, uh, have you been able to rely on some form of intelligence capability or have you been able to create some kind of intelligence capability considering also maybe the collapse of telecommunication, the collapse, of, it, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Or have you been able to uh, only wing it basically, uh, or almost blind? Uh, which is a complete different issue all of a sudden and which would rely on a leadership based on, uh, on, uh, on blind trust as opposed to, uh, to, to be able to explain what, what, what is going on because it's uh, no and gut feeling almost. It's, it's a um, <clears throat> I, think, I, I think that um, often, often when you look at when you look at the kind of crisis management structures, whether you want your bronze, silver, gold, whether you want your strategic, uh, operational, tactical, uh, that piece which is closest to where the action is, in the sense of where the where the where the event is, is often the weakest link in the chain. Um, and uh, because you have all the big minds at headquarters uh, who maybe have more experience. Um, maybe have more authority, uh, have more powerful positions, kind of want to run the engine room and kind of run things with a big screwdriver maybe from the headquarters. I think that's a big trap. And I think that trying to make sure that your, um, your uh, capability closest to the ground uh, where this event is, um, if it is one or maybe several, um, is generally a, a, a big priority. 
A. Uh, B. I think that sometimes it's not necessarily maybe about uh, in, in intelligence because you know the information can come in fast and furious. I think today the problem is you know what is relevant uh, to try and sort out the the stuff that is going to help me make a reasonable decision um, from the rest. Um, you know collection, collation, dissemination, uh, analysis, uh, uh, dissemination. That kind of basic steps. I think are, are, are much more challenging now than they used to be in the past, simply because there's a lot. You will get, you know, Facebook groups. You'll get, you know, action groups. You'll get, you know, a lot of drive coming from um, that closest uh, to the ground. So I would perhaps, you know, perhaps less say intelligence. I would perhaps say it's more about trying to get sense making uh, from, uh, uh, from 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 the ground as quickly as possible. But it needs to be driven upwards uh, and to avoid that uh, as I say that uh, misalignment in that the 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 the, the in intelligence if you wish or the sense making is happening too much at the headquarters or at the at the CMT level but really around that and, and that's about capability capacity skills knowledge resources uh, at, at that closest level I mean I'm being very general um, but that would be a little bit my, uh, my my point of view. But it's today, it's so fast. I might remember just a few years ago, we used to talk about the golden hours of crisis management. You know, well, you've got to, we've got a few hours to put a press statement together. Or oh, we've got a few hours to make sure the family are involved. As well. No, you, you're lucky you've got five minutes um, because it, it's out there. Uh, and, I, and I think that makes it really, really challenging. So you just have to anticipate that, and you have to build that into your into your resilience building through through simulations, through training, and and, and so forth. Yeah. Perhaps instead of you know talking about intelligence, first of all, intelligence is something that uh, you know, like uh, you know, a few decades ago, the United Nations really hated that word, right? So there was no even a clear definition of uh, you know what is intelligence. Uh, I was working in Bosnia Herzegovina as a political affairs officer, but more as a what to say intelligence officer, like collecting you know, a lot of information, but sometimes sensitive one. But we would never say that you know, we were collecting you know uh, you know intelligence. What I would say is that you know like in your to answer you know one part of your question is actually you know to do your homework, right, and uh, you know to do a lot of mapping. So first, you have to look at uh, you know the root causes of uh, you know why you know something has emerged, and then looking at also as your stakeholder mapping, really looking at uh, who are your partners, uh, but your partners can also at, at any time become also your spoilers, right? And so you have to be able you know to analyze you know all that trends. In, in, in current peace operations, uh, you know you have what it is called the JOC. It's the Joint Operation Cells. And what they do is that, uh, you know, coming from either, you know, open sources, but also coming like from information gathered from, you know, from various sources in the field, from, you, you saw like my, my slide, right? You know, the military, the police, the civilians, the civilians doing, you know, civil affairs job, the police, you know, doing their community oriented, you know, policing, or the military, you know, also, you know, safeguarding, you know, some very, you know, tough area and providing security. Um, is uh, you know is all like a collaboration of uh, you know information, but I think that uh, you know David had a very 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 good terms of you know it's like the sense making you know of information. It's amazing now that you know any little thing that is you know transpired even from an open so source can actually you know uh, you know erupt into a significant crisis that even it didn't have to be a significant crisis because you didn't corroborate, you didn't verify, you know, your sources, where it came from. So I think the sense making, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, of that, you know, part of the work is, is really essential. And so you got, but you got to do your homework first. We need to come to a conclusion. Um, so we take one last question and then we'll, I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Christina to close off. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that leaders emerge from different parts of an, an organization or a team or in a society. So how can we maintain uh, leadership while it's positive to not become conflicting 
and lead to a coherent uh, um, drive, driving of the mission um, forward uh, without really hindering the mission. Like if you have multiple voices of leadership, how can that work within a coherent system instead of really conflicting, especially in crisis? Emotions get heated and visions get conflicted. So how do you deal with that? There's a big question to end on. Um, very concretely, very quickly, uh, uh, there are some things that if you're talking about it, I'll take it within, I'll respond to it as if we're talking about a crisis team, because if we talk about it more broadly, I'd, that's a longer conversation. Um, um, but there are some things you, you can do. The longer uh, a team works together and trains together, the better we'll be able to do to deal with conflict. Um, uh, there's a, a really interesting piece of work done by a lady called Amy Emerson on psychological safety. Why is it certain teams uh, are better at picking up uh, and adjusting uh, mistakes before they become uh, enacted? Um, and one of the reasons in her research, one of the findings, is, is that they're willing to talk about mistakes amongst themselves. They're willing to challenge each other. Uh, and they're willing to question. So when I said earlier, and I don't think actually did come back, I said at some point that the speak up culture is helpful. Um, that's when that will play out. Uh, when someone else in the team who doesn't have the position of leader or manager or boss um, speaks up and says, hang on a minute, I see something. I'll put it on the table. Uh, whether it then influences or not is another matter. But um, the more you can foster that in, a, in, a, in an existing team, uh, the higher the likelihood is you will prevent some of those stupid decisions to, to use the term that's been uh, landed on today, uh, um, you'll never avoid it, I'm sure, but it will certainly go a good way to, um, I think she did a really interesting 15 minute YouTube video, uh, a lady called Amy Edmondson, uh, uh, um, and it's about psychological safety as one way. No, I mean, I, I agree entirely, that's a big, big question. Um, uh, practice, trust, work together, understand people's foibles, Maybe one thing is just agree how you're going to make a decision. Are we going to vote? Are you going to say, I'm going to go away and make a decision, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, make, I'm, going to give you, I'm going to tell you what it is when I come back, am I going to sleep on it if you have the time? Because just how decisions are made when everything's moving very fast can be, uh, can, can be frustrating for people. And that's a cultural issue too. This is exactly what I have said, you know, during my intervention. Take the time, you know, to know, you know, each other, right? So you, when then you actually even do, because we've been talking about mapping, where you even do like your own mapping, you know, as a leader of what are the strengths, but also, you know, the weaknesses of your, some of your members. And so then when you do have to take like very, very fast, you know, decisions, even if they are in, unpopular, you know, they got to be like, you know, more like easily, you know, accepted by the group, you know, because then, you know, they understand, you know, like why you have taken, you know, such decision, right? So always like, uh, you know, my, my own advice is if you work for you in a team and then someone really insists, like, can we have a coffee, you know, together? I say, no, I don't have the time. No, take the time. Because, you know, you, it's amazing sometimes, you know, what you can learn, uh, you know, about that person. Caring is also, you know, very important part of a leadership, uh, you know, management skills, caring, you know, for each other. And so, uh, you know, whatever then, you know, comes next when really the big crisis, you know, comes, then you are all, you know, equally and adequately prepared. Take a deep breath. Okay. document that was published uh, by their government earlier this year on leadership in a crisis and actually addresses group think uh, speaking out which is which is particularly relevant when you're dealing with Asian cultures yes. and I will ping you that document so you that's can that's disseminate good. it it's quite a good it's quite a good document yeah. Thanks, Ken. okay um, thank you very much for that thanks to my colleagues for that uh, for that uh, for that panel um, we're coming to the end of uh, a day I know uh, we've had a, a lot of stuff um, I, I, and I'd like to ask um, uh, the GCSB deputy director Christina Orosic is maybe she should just draw some uh, conclusions from uh, from her perspective as being an observer for most of the day uh, before I finally uh, close off the day
So what a day. I think it's been really extremely intense. We set out this morning to say that this has been the first conference ever on emerging threats um, between now and uh, 2030. And are we ready? So what would you say after this whole day? Are we ready? Say again? We haven't even begun. Well, I think that um, David really was right this morning to say that actually the, the crisis has already started, is already here and it actually will evolve. When we look at the news, you just need to look at uh, Venice um, and the unprecedented challenges they are um, facing. When we're looking at the fires in the rest of the um, world, when we look at the latest um, snow um, of weather forecasts and what's happening in some of the areas around uh, the Alps, we can see that at long, in different areas we're already in the, the crisis. But this is just a few ex examples. I would like to take this opportunity to really thank um, all the speakers of uh, today who've really had very pertinent uh, contributions uh, to make, which led to very interesting um, discussions that um, have happened in all four uh, themes that we have um, covered. Um, one of the things that uh, struck me a lot is that the challenges that we're facing are very uh, complex, interdependent, um, interconnected and um, also progressing at a huge speed. So it's not one crisis that we're talking about, it's several. And while we're maybe tackling a few, there are new ones emerging at a really very difficult, quickly uh, rapid speed. And the word unprecedented is really also, I think, one word that we need to um, take with us because all the um, um, crises that we are currently facing, not only are they unprecedented, but we also at times don't even have the um, possibility now to even think what is uh, coming down um, in, in the future. There are a lot of strategic anticipation, we're trying to do what we can, but again, the mindset and um, also the capacity that we have is based a lot on uh, the past, whereas some of the crises that are coming ahead are coming from areas that are new to um, us, and you will see that um, in the different um, paradoxes, we talked about paradoxes, we talked about dichotomies, we talked about polarities, and I think Peter's done a fantastic job at showing some of the polarities we have to manage in terms of crisis. But all throughout the day, there were many different um, polarities, dichotomies, paradoxes that we um, have raised, to name just um, a few. There were, you know, the um, uh, city level thinking versus local action. There were exponential growth of threats in different areas and at the same time we have a very linear development of human preparedness and um, response. There, we talked about global standards and at the same time also a delivery of um, uh, crisis management at a very community um, level. So these are just a few examples that I've picked up but there were many more throughout the day and that makes it also so difficult because it's not that we have a simple solution. Um, or resolution for the uh, crisis. And so uh, I think that um, this lack of investment in preparedness that has been also shared all throughout the days at different levels is really something that is uh, very uh, pressing. Um, and I think that the ISRM as a community of experts and a networking opportunity can really play a key role to raise the awareness across the organizations, across the different um, uh, continents of the importance to actually um, prepare as much as you can and invest heavily in crisis management and risk uh, management. Um, we see it also in our some of our courses. Um, the participants, you know, they think they are prepared. I don't think that they need to come to um, uh, courses. And I'm not saying that our courses are maybe, you know, the non plus ultra and giving answers to everything, but it is something um, to start with. And when there's no one person or one organization or one country that can solve that, we all um, need to work together. It's a 360 approach, it's a 360 view. We've heard that from um, 
David a few times uh, today. And this is really something, although we are interconnected in many ways and we see the polarizations in the world, but I think these crises that we're uh, having a front in front of us are crises that we can only tackle um, all together. So I won't really continue very much uh, longer. I just wanted to um, really reiterate um, this, this partnership also that we have with the Institute of Strategic Risk um, Management. And I think that looking forward, um, this networking um, body that you are representing and have this expertise from uh, different um, areas is something that we need to all together think of about how can we leverage that? How can we use that? Um, I know that you're now going to go all over the, the world. You're going to Singapore, to London, to Sarajevo. Um, so this is really just the, the start, but I think it's our collective responsibility to actually see what we can do and how can we leverage what we um, have. I understand also that yesterday one of the outcomes of the council meeting has also been to explore the idea of maybe having a fellow uh, financed uh, that would be based at the GCSB to look for a certain period of time at some of these um, issues and then share it with the rest of the um, uh, community. And we've seen how important leadership um, is and that here again, it's something that we're um, still a lot to, to learn uh, from. And so from the GCSP side, we're definitely committed to continue the journey and exploring how we can contribute to prepare leaders uh, to face all the crises and challenges that um, are going to come our way in the next um, decades because it won't stop at 2030. I think that um, the crisis and all these changes are here to stay. So um, the better we prepare ourselves uh, to um, tackle them and to, to lead through them, the more um, successful it can uh, be. So with that, I would like to thank everybody uh, for their time, for staying on so uh, late and um, wishing you all a very nice uh, stay in Geneva for those who've come from um, abroad and for the rest, um, a very nice um, rest of the week. Thank you so much. Okay, th thanks very much, Christina. So um, I'd just like to, on behalf of the GCSP, uh, thank all my colleagues Clementine, uh, Ashley, uh, Christine, who's all been working on the live streaming that we've been doing as well, and hello to anybody who's still uh, online. Uh, thank you for, uh, for being there all day. Um, uh, to also my colleagues, uh, 